Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri's peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. I advise senators that Senator Stirl uh, is to be sworn in as a senator for Western Australia. When you're ready, Senator Stirl. Order. 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 As Senator Stirl was absent from the Senate on 26 July 2022, I would now administer the affirmation of allegiance as required by section 42 of the Constitution. Senator Stirl, please come to the table to make and subscribe to the affirmation of allegiance. Clerk. Senator Stirl, please recite the affirmation on the card handed to you. I do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. The test roll and the senators roll. Thank you. I call the clerk. 
Government and Business Order of the Day No. 1, Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. And I believe I'm. Oh, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, so just, just be. Order. Oh, sorry. Order. No, you... Did you want the call? Senator Rustin. Um, I just, uh, just to um, seek some clarification. Obviously, the speaker's list is. Um, you, you've amended it. Uh, okay. Um, well, look. Thank you very much um, to the to the chamber, and I stand to speak um, on uh, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Royal Commission uh, Response Bill 2022. Uh, and at the start of my um, contribution, uh, can I foreshadow uh, that I intend to move a second reading amendment uh, to this uh, to this bill? Uh, so I will move that now, um, Madam. President, uh, and uh, my second reading amendment uh, will add uh, that uh, the Senate is of the opinion that the government has disrespected older Australians, their families and aged care providers due to their political restriction of the passage of similar legislation in the last parliament when they were in exactly. opposition. Um, so thank you very much, um, Madam President. Uh, the opposition will support this bill. The reason that we will support this bill is because we believe that the continuing work that was started by the previous coalition government is absolutely fundamental, absolutely fundamental uh, and generational in its reform of the aged care system to ensure it meets the needs of older Australians both now and into the future. Uh, and we're not just going to support this bill because it mirrors the Royal Commission response that we introduced last parliament, but also because it delivers a very critical second stage of our reform package, which was commenced by our government in response to the Royal Commission's final report. Um, and in uh, in the, the introduction um, and debate on this particular bill that we had put forward in the last parliament, um, the provisions that were contained in the bill uh, were absolutely essential in terms of the speedy response to the Royal Commission recommendations and the ability of the aged care sector to be able to move forward as quickly as possible to address many of the concerns that were raised by the Royal Commission. But at the time, uh, Senator Rex Patrick, who is no longer in this place, moved an amendment in relation to the requirement for aged care facilities to have nurses on site at all times. They moved an amendment that required nurses to be on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, by 2022. Now, we know, we know very, very clearly that the ability for access to nurses um, in all of our um, care settings has been extremely difficult. And, um, at the time, uh, the now Prime Minister of Australia, and I will quote from his comments at the time, uh, when was asked uh, by a journalist, it does take a long time to train people as nurses. Mr Albanese then responded, of course it does, but that is why you need planning and commitment to do it. The journalist then said, that, but that sounds like a long-term thing, not something you can solve tomorrow, doesn't it? Mr Albanese responded, you cannot find a nurse tomorrow. That is the truth. Mr Albanese said this in February 2022. And yet in April 2022, he and those opposite voted to force aged care facilities to have 24-7 nurses by 2022 against the recommendation of the Royal Commission and in doing so allowed the bill that was so important to address the reforms that were in the Royal, uh, the Royal Commission uh, bill um, so that aged care providers and older Australians were left in limbo for six months for a political game by those that are now in government. It is absolutely disgusting to consider that Mr Albanese and Labor would have played politics with older Australians for the last six months by not facilitating the passage of this bill in the 46th parliament when they could have. So by delaying this critical legislation solely for the purpose of political gain, I can see no other reason because they have absolutely no intention and never did because they know they can't to have 24-7 nurses uh, in aged care facilities by 2022. They then made a commitment sometime later to do it by 2023, and we'll see when they bring their next bill into this place whether they're actually going to be uh, honouring that commitment because, sadly, we, I believe, and I think most Australians believe that there is absolutely no chance that that particular provision is able to be delivered 
uh, for Australia. So, um, the government's treatment um, of older Australians of, since the election has actually been nothing short of disappointing. Um, the fact that we've ceased the provision of rapid antigen tests into aged care facilities uh, that are experiencing outbreaks. Uh, and then the embarrassing backflip that we had to see uh, around the decision of extending ADF personnel to support our frontline workers in aged care facilities um, that, uh, that they were intending to no longer continue with. Um, Mr Albanese and the government uh, has promised and continue to promise during the election campaign more support for aged care providers. And so far, I'd have to say, we haven't seen a lot for it apart from rhetorical flourish. But it's disappointing also that in this particular piece of legislation uh, that is before us, the government has chosen to remove the worker screening regulations contained in the coalition's bill, which was before this place in the 46th parliament, because they were such important regulations um, and they supported the sector and were, uh, and in consultation with the sector, were supported by the sector. Um, this is one of the few differences, I might say, in terms of uh, this bill and the coalition uh, as uh, legislation in the 46th Parliament, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the exclusion of the change of dates, which obviously had to occur because of the six-month delay in putting these really important reforms into this place. Our worker screening schedule responded to Recommendation 77 of the Royal Commission and it established an authority for nationally consistent pre-employment screening for aged care workers. You would think that seems like a pretty sensible thing to do. Our legislation sought uh, to establish a code of conduct would have, which would have ensured that poor behaviour of approved providers, workers and governing persons was held to account. So I'm glad the government uh, has adopted our code of conduct. Uh, and the subsequent amendments in this piece of legislation. But as I said, it's disappointing that the government has capitulated, one would suggest probably to the unions, by removing our specific schedule on worker screening. It's absolutely essential that this government stands up to the unions and implements important policies to protect the rights of our aged care sector workers and allow nationally consistent database to be established for the care workers in all interests of ensuring the interests of all Australians and making sure older Australians have confidence in our aged care sector. Our plan was to have one database to simplify processes for employers, including aged care providers, making it easier for NDIS carers, aged carers and veteran carers to move between their caring roles. This would have protected residents and allowed providers to know their employers are fit and proper to be caring for older Australians. So, instead, Labor is delaying the commencement of this particular reform by excluding the schedule um, just to, I would imagine, to fulfil an election commitment on what appears to be, on the face of it, a carbon copy of our regulations anyway. Put simply, this delays protections for older Australians. Uh, they are trying to redo what has already been done. Um, we'll be keeping a very close eye on further um, upcoming aged care reforms uh, that are going to be introduced by the Albanese government to ensure that legislation and regulations are introduced and implemented so poor conduct in the sector is held to account and ultimately stopped. Overall, this bill has nine schedules which directly relate to the Australian government's response to the Royal Commission. This bill, like the Coalition's bill, replaces the outdated aged care funding instrument with the national, uh, Australian National Aged Care Classification, or ANAC, uh, residential aged care funding model from 1 October this year. Uh, this responds to the Royal Commission's recommendation 120 and represents a significant funding reform for residential aged care by completing the final step in the implementation of the ANAC model. Um, along with the introduction of the ANAC funding model, the bill permits the Secretary of the Department of Health and Aged Care to publish information relating to the new star rating system for all aged care services providers. And this will allow families and future aged care residents to make an informed decision about which aged care provider will be the best fit for their needs. Um, the bill also will extend the serious incidents response scheme from residential home care uh, to home care and flexible care delivered in home and community settings in line with the Royal Commission recommendation 100. Under the scheme, providers of in-home care uh, services will be required to identify, record, manage and resolve all incidents that occur. This will provide further transparency and protection for aged care. 
Schedule 6 of the bill aims to provide consistent quality and safety protections for consumers and reduce regulatory burden for cross-sector providers and workers in line with existing regulations in the disability sector. And additionally, the bill implements the second of a three-phase reform process established by our government to create a new financial and prudential monitoring compliance and intervention framework for the aged care sector. And finally, the bill expands the functions of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority, responding um, to recommendations 6, 11, 115 and 135 of the, 139 of the Royal Commission. Um, the opposition is absolutely committed to supporting the health, the safety and the well-being of older Australians. That is why we have made, uh, we made, whilst we were in government, a massive commitment to the implementation of the recommendations of the Royal Com Commission, with $19.1 billion committed by our government at the time to support the implementation of these recommendations. Um, we were extremely disappointed. Um, when in government that the opposition sought to play politics with this time critical legislation that is before the chamber today. Um, I think it shows extraordinary disrespect and the extent to which the Labor Party is prepared to go um, to, and, uh, to get itself into office uh, and that it would use older Australians um, as a pawn in that particular play. Um, so the opposition absolutely implores those opposite absolutely implores you um, to continue our generational reform that we have put forward, um, but we also implore those opposite to please put the interests of our aged care sector and particularly our older Australians who rely so heavily on it at the centre of what you do going forward, because clearly you did not do that in the past. Um, so make sure that everything that you do, and we will support you in your endeavours to improve uh, and to continue our reforms to improve our aged care sector as long as you do it in a way that supports older Australians and not yourselves. But we will support this bill, uh, but in the process of doing so we will seek to amend it to make sure that the interests of older Australians um, are fulfilled in the process of doing so. Thank you, Mr Deputy. Senator, I have Senator Polly on Thank the Thank you, uh, Deputy President, and congratulations on your elevation to the position. I rise to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill. And I have to say I've been waiting 10 long years for this moment. To be on the government benches with a bill that we as Labor senators and as a Labor government, this is a really proud moment. I've stood in this place and watched nine failed aged care ministers stand in this place and argue on many occasions that the sector was not in need of reform. So yet again, already we have the opposition is trying to rewrite the history. It was Minister, the Minister Butler who started these reforms with living longer, living better. That was the foundations for reforming the aged care sector in this country. But it was interrupted by the election of the Abbott Turnbull and Morrison governments, who stalled on every occasion until they finally had to call a royal commission into their own failings. So to have already in this debate the shadow minister trying to rewrite history, we will put the facts on the table. Because we know on this side of the chamber who started this reform and those who tried to block it for 10 long years. In fact, many of those ministers oversaw this crisis in aged care and they had report after report gathering dust in those nine ministers' offices while this sector was deteriorating. In opposition, I put question after question to the countless ministers, including the former minister, Richie Colbeck, from my home state who was an absolute failure in this responsibility that he had. He let down older Australians. He always had the view that there's nothing to see, nothing to hear here. That was his uh, attitude to reform. I, want, I don't want anyone to forget that it was the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, that broke the hearts of older Australians when he oversaw this ongoing crisis in this important sector. He made a solemn commitment to fix the sector, but he didn't. Another election failure. 
I, as others, called for a royal commission into this sector, but it was the former government that waited and waited and denied and denied the necessity to have a royal commission when they finally had to cave in because of their own failings. During the royal commission, Australians were devastated at the evidence provided and the government's response. So yesterday, in the other place, and now today, the Albanese government puts aged care reform on the agenda of the Australian government. This is a momentous moment in our nation's history. The Albanese Labor government does this with an absolute commitment to older Australians living within residential aged care and those who are receiving care in their own homes. Every older Australian deserves love and care in their older years. They deserve quality care in aged care or their own home. So it really doesn't matter whether you're in a residential aged care home or whether you're receiving care in your own home. You deserve time with your carers. You deserve to have someone to be able to sit and engage with you, hold your hand and deserve to feel wanted, needed and, most importantly, you need to be respected. Labor took to the election a commitment of 24-7 access to registered nurses in the aged care sector homes in this country, and we will implement this. We stand by this. It already happens in my home state of Tasmania, so ultimately we can deliver on this commitment. Ultimately, this bill is about respect for older Australians and what they have contributed to our country. This is a bill which will return security, dignity, quality and humanity back to the aged care sector. I acknowledge all the work that has gone into this bill. It is, as I said, years in the making, and I note Minister Wells and I congratulate her on her appointment and Minister Butler for their efforts to bring this bill to the parliament during this first week of the 47th parliament. And as the former shadow minister, Shane Newman, and I would like to acknowledge the Prime Minister for showing such leadership in this area. I would also like to make some comments in relation to the former shadow minister uh, in Shane Newman. His commitment, I love the time I spent um, working with him to listen and learn from the sector and from older Australians of what sort of reform that we needed going forward. But as Minister Wells said yesterday in the other place, reforming aged care starts by listening. Australians have been listening for far too long about the horror stories overseen by the former government. But Labor has always been listening and advocating. But too many parliaments have overseen this and done nothing. As I said, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments almost 10 years of neglect. Labor understands this. We understand the concerns by older Australians and their families, because older Australians have been crying out for action and for reform. Well, no longer will they have to be ignored by a federal government, because we hear you, and most importantly, we see you, and we, as the Australian government, will take the action that is necessary to reform this sector. And so today shows what a high order priority aged care reform has within the Albanese government. I note that there has also been extensive consultation with unions, with aged care workers, providers and residents to ensure their experiences are considered in the implementation of this bill. The sector is informed and they have also been listening and they must continue to listen to ensure that we get it right. It is beholden not only on this government, but also the sector, uh, the unions, uh, the workers, who I must say, having walked in the shoes of aged care workers on many occasions during uh, my time in this place, there is no more committed workforce in this country than those who work in the aged care sector. And I take my hat off to them each and every day that they front up to care for some of the most vulnerable and frail Australians. But they do it with respect, 
but they in turn need to have that respect. They need to be paid an appropriate salary. They need to know that their work is respected by the government and by the community. Now we know during the Royal Commission the amount of extensive consultation that was undertaken. The department has also undertaken significant consultation on each of the measures in this bill and the recommendations from the Royal Commission. This includes consultation with older Australians and their families, advocates, peak bodies, state and territory governments, providers and the general public. Furthermore, the measures in this bill, aside from Schedule 2, were previously considered by the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee and a number of stakeholders made submissions to that inquiry. As the Assistant Shadow Minister for Aged Care several years ago, I was in the privileged position to see firsthand all the wonderful people living and working in this sector. I visited countless residential aged care homes across the country. I worked in the sh walked in the shoes of the aged care workers. I know what these people do each and every day, and I witnessed the best of aged care, and at times I witnessed the worst. So I believe that this bill will be the start of genuine reform into this sector. And I want to acknowledge all the hardworking people who work in this sector, as I said, those workers who need our respect, they need our support, and they need to be remunerated appropriately so that we can keep the very best people working in this sector, because our older Australians deserve nothing less. Every Australian deserves dignity and care, and in particular during their final years they deserve the best care a rich nation such as ours can give them. So this is the beginning. This is the beginning of a long journey to reform the aged care sector. Now, the Albanese government's amendments to aged care law and other legislation to be implemented as a series of urgent funding, quality and safety reforms, including in response to several recommendations of the Royal Commission into the Aged Care Quality and Safety Royal Commission's final report, Care, Dignity and Respect. The bill implements the nine time critical aged care measures, including a series of reforms that respond to several recommendations of the final report of the Royal Commission. The measures will introduce a new aged care subsidy calculation, providing a legislative basis for the star rating system, introduce a code of conduct, and banning order scheme extends the serious incident response scheme to aged care delivered in home settings strengthens the governance of approved providers, enhance information sharing across related sectors, increase financial and prudential oversight, broaden the functions of the renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority, and address issues with the informed consent arrangements in respect to the use of restrictive practices in residential aged care and a new comprehensive workers' registration, registration scheme will be developed with criminal history checks continuing to apply in the meantime. The last element I must mention is something which I campaigned for in opposition for many, many years. If we are to improve the quality of care within the sector, we must ensure the best people with the best intentions work in this sector. There is no point introducing this bill without such an intention and that this element will ensure an aged care worker that is not up to the job cannot leave one aged care home and start working in another aged care home in a neighbouring suburb. Mr Deputy President, I am firmly of the view that this element in this bill will work well to ensure the right people are attracted to the sector. Now, the bill replaces the outdated Aged Care Funding Instrument, ACFI, with a new model for calculating aged care subsidies called the Australian National Aged Care Classification Model, which has been developed in consultation with the aged care sector and consumer groups. Since April 2021, residential aged care residents have been progressively assessed and classified under the ANACC, and the funding under the new model will commence on 1 October 2022. Importantly, the bill includes several measures that will provide additional protection directly to older Australians. These protections cannot be delayed any longer. 
For far too long, a lack of protection for residents has allowed much of the reported abuse. Consequently, the Serious Incident Response Scheme will be expanded to establish obligations on approved uh, providers of home care and flexible care in a community setting to report and to respond to incidents and to take actions to prevent in incidents from reoccurring. For far too long, too many aged care homes have not been adequately monitored. A new code of conduct will set high standards of behaviour for aged care workers, approved providers and governing persons of approved providers to ensure that they are delivering aged care in a way that is safe competent and respectful. All of these matters addressed in this uh, bill will go a long way, as I said from the outset, to start the real reform in this sector. But what we have to do is support those people, the workers in aged care. We have to support the providers and, most importantly, we have to return to the days when we respected older Australians in this country and we ensure that they get the care that they so desperately need and that they deserve. You can't allow a sector to not put the care and the interest of older Australians first and foremost. Now, this is going to take a lot of money, but what it's really going to take is a will to reform this sector a will to support the workers, to give them the opportunity to keep the best possible people in aged care. We have to attract nurses back to the aged care. Now, those nurses who work in aged care, they know that the work that they do is so important. So we have to find a way to provide additional nurses, not only for our uh, aged care sector, but right across this country. We have to ensure that we have access to very best general practitioners in our communities in residential care. Now, I commend Minister Wells and Minister Butler and, of course, the Prime Minister for taking the first step to re-establishing the best aged care sector in the world because we deserve nothing less and older Australians deserve nothing less and they have the support of this government. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. The health, the well-being and the rights of older Australians are absolutely critical and our aged care systems so often in recent years have failed them and that's been an indictment upon Australian society. And it's no surprise that the state of aged care has been a focus of government for a number of years now, which is reflected in the attention rightly given to the Royal Commission, in fact, the circumstances that led to the Royal Commission to come into being, and its recommendation, and the focus that both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party and us as Greens and the Crossbench put on aged care during the election, because it's very clear that something needs to change. The system is broken. The Australian Greens believe that the federal government has to play an absolutely central role in the provision, the regulation and the support of aged care services. And we believe that older Australians, their carers and their families should have the right to choose appropriate and affordable care services that meet their needs and maintain their dignity, their independence and their quality of life. So, of course, we want to see a high quality aged care system characterised by quality support quality nursing and personal care, safe and comfortable surroundings for older people, whether in residential, home or hospital care, and for this to be what everybody gets, to not have people falling through the cracks, to not have providers that aren't meeting these standards. Older Australians have got a right to freedom from discrimination, freedom from violence, a right to social security, a right to work and a right to health. And we want to see and enable a paradigm shift towards seeing older people as rights holders and as active contributors to society. We need a human rights approach to aged care. And we feel that the regulatory framework underpinning aged care must be based on the human rights of older Australians and acknowledge the interdependence and the interconnectedness of those rights. And under a, a, a rights-based approach, older people would be guaranteed access to the level of care and support that they are assessed as needing. Now, of course, we are hoping that the complete right of the Aged Care Act 
that is going to begin this year um, is going to reflect this human rights-based approach and is going to have this total reconsideration of the paradigm that we hold older Australians and aged care in. Clearly what we are debating today is not that. It's an interim measure. It's a bill that is implementing some urgent recommendation from the Royal Commission, but it is just an interim measure. And it, we also know that it is largely the same bill that the previous government brought to the, um, the previous parliament. And it was interesting to hear Senator Rustin sort of talking about the de delay of that bill. It's a bit of a rewriting of history, because I remember that that bill actually got through the Senate. It had been through the House, it got through the Senate with an amendment, an amendment that said required 24-7 nurses in aged care homes because the majority of the Senate felt that that was an important provision to be in place. And then the government chose to not take that amendment through in the House. So it was the previous government that blocked the adoption of aged care legislation at the end of the previous parliament. So the bill that we're looking at today is pretty much the same as the, of the previous government's um, approach. We are really grateful that there have been some amendments to it. I'm very grateful to the previous government that they adopted most of the Greens' amendment in the final version that went before the last parliament. And we have also, after discussions and negotiations with the aged care minister in, over the last month, um, had some other measures that the Greens were very concerned about that have been um, adopted in this new legislation. So, so our, we're pleased that the government um, adopted many of our amendments, particularly pleased that the, the government has removed the previous Schedule 2 on screening checks because there were clearly a lot more work that needed to be done on the issue of screening checks for aged care workers. I think it's a very important measure to make sure that the people who are providing aged care services are able to be relied upon to be you know, the, the most quality people possible. But there were some big issues with the, with the screening checks as they were previously outlined in Schedule 2. And, and, and there are other areas in particular that we feel that this bill need, should, have, should go further, but we recognise that it is an interim approach. We also know that it's in the context of further legislation that the government is going to be bringing before the parliament um, yeah, that is also being introduced. It's going to go off to committee to implement the um, measures that were in their, in their uh, election commitments, particularly around workforce and particularly a, a, around making sure that the, the care being provided is of the highest quality and with transparency of information for where aged care providers are spending their money. And we really look forward to really having a thorough um, interrogation of that bill and to see that bill pass through the parliament as well. But similarly, both of those are just going to be interim measures before the full rewrite of the Aged Care Act that is required. A, a, a critical um, change, of course, in this bill compared with our current aged care legislation is the introduction of the Australian National Aged Care Classification, classification or ANAC. And my predecessor, um, Rachel Seawitt, she worked really closely with the sector, highlighting the problems with the previous instrument, the aged care funding instrument, which is no longer fit for purpose. So overall, we are broadly supporting this bill, but we have two major concerns with it as it stands. And one is the lack of mandatory requirements for the provision of allied health services under the new ANAC funding model. Allied health services like physiotherapy play a vital role in maintaining the well-being of older Australians. And without adequate access to allied health services, many residents of aged care and many people receiving home support would not be able to adequately manage pain or reduce their risk of falls. And physiotherapy, for example, has been shown to decrease falls by 55 per cent. In the previous funding model, it was the provision of those allied health services, of a certain amount of allied health services, was mandatory. It is now no longer mandatory under the ANAC. And the allied health professionals that I have spoken to are extremely con concerned. I mean, we know that it is so important 
for older people to get those services as they require them. And physio, for example, is critical. And I know at the moment I've just been having messaging with, messaging with my family as to how we can manage the care of my mother when she, um, she's currently in respite care after a fall at home three weeks ago. She broke two ribs. She spent a week in hospital. She's now had a week in respite care. She's hopefully going to be able to come home after that second week in respite care. So my sisters and my brother and I are trying to manage who can stay overnight with her over the coming months and what, what the long-term future for mum living at home by herself is. She was receiving physiotherapy, but not enough. And, and clearly there is, there is a problem with the system and it's incredibly complex to be accessing care as well, even if it's theoretically available. Even when you've got a family of, like we have, of five siblings who are all sort of doing our bits to sort out the bits of care that mum is entitled to, actually making it happen can be incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I really I think about the people who haven't got that level of support, of the family support, who are trying to manage their care packages you know, pretty much on their own and not getting the support they need. I mean, the importance of allied health service to older people's quality of life, it was recognised by the Royal Commission, which recommended that residential aged care should include a level of allied health appropriate to each person, person's needs. But of course, not only is it people access to it that we're concerned about, but we know that there's a widespread shortage of allied health workers in aged care. There's a shortage of 6,000 physiotherapists, according, according to the Australian Physio Council, and that's even before the pandemic. And without the provision of, fund, of guaranteed funding for allied health services in aged care, this shortage of essential services could substantially increase. Now, I've heard from the allied health professionals and their representatives who fear the worst for their industry and for the older people who need their services. And one physiotherapist expressed to me that the lack of guaranteed funding for allied health in the ANAC model would be the death of allied health. So, I mean, if we want to improve the quality of services for old Australians in earnest, we must ensure that they've got adequate access to critical services like allied health, and, the gov and we have to make sure that allied health is funded properly. In my discussions with the minister over the last um, weeks, it was clear that uh, changes are needed. But in terms of how, what's going to happen and what the best model for ensuring that those allied health services are provided, that there is further consultation with the sector that is required. We acknowledge that there were problems with the previous funding model. We also think there are problems with this current funding model. So we will be supporting the, 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 this um, legislation with this problem with allied health on the basis that there is still more work to be done on the guaranteeing allied health services for older Australians. The other really big concern that we have got, and which is reflected in the second reading amendment I'm going to be moving, and also in a substantive uh, amendment, is relation to Schedule 9 of this bill regarding restrictive practice. I mean, let me start by revisiting the important work of the Royal Commission on this issue. And in their final report, they noted that restrictive practices are activities or interventions, either physical or pharmacological, which restrict a person's free movement or ability to make decisions. And where this occurs without clear justification and clinical indication, we consider this to be abuse. Not only do restrictive practices have questionable success in minimising change behaviours, they can result in serious physical and psychological harm, potentially increasing health complications and in some cases cause death. And they also set out a clear pathway in Recommendation 17. And they said that the use of restrictive practices in aged care must be based on an independent expert assessment and subject to ongoing reporting and monitoring. The amendment should reflect the overall principle that people receiving aged care should be equally protected from restrictive practices as other members of the community. And when the previous Liberal government introduced changes through the previous bill, we welcomed the, the amendments but would reduce restrictive practices, but were concerned that they didn't go far enough as they should towards implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission. And as my former colleague Senator Seawitt wrote in her additional comments to that legislation. However, we believe the new regulations do not go far enough and do not fully implement the Royal Commission's recommendations on restrictive practices. 
and that while the regulations require approved health practitioners to improve the use of restrictive practices, it is unclear whether these health practitioners will need to be independent of the aged care facility and provider. And as a result, aged care providers will be able to use the in-house health practitioners to approve the use of restrictive practices. Now, in this legislation, we are assured that there are going to be some changes in terms of, um, sort of a hierarchy um, of, of a substitute decision maker, and we understand that the substitute decision makers, for if the older person is not able to, to give consent, which in these cases they would not be able to, and we understand the concerns uh, that the, the government is grappling with that state and territory legislation does, which is overall responsible for determining who uh, alternative decision making would be. That in some states and territories that hierarchy, that um, framework, does not exist. So we understand that in um, subordinate legislation we are going to get sort of a hierarchy of decision makers. We understand that we're going to get that it has to be done in accord with the behavioural care plan. But this is all in subordinate legislation. We're basically having to take it all on trust. And it's easy to talk about principles, laws, regulations as though they're abstract frameworks, but they're not. They matter for people's lives. And, I mean, the use of antipsychotic medication in aged care facilities was identified by the Royal Commission as a significant problem. Um, and then, post the Royal Commission, the statistics say that, we, that it is still continuing. I mean, I'm running out of time because I wanted to share some, uh, some um, case studies with you about people who have you know, died because of the use of chemical restraints. And according to the March 2022 residential aged care quality indicators, as many as one in five aged care residents are still receiving antipsychotics in 2022. So we are still really concerned. Look, um, in terms of Schedule 9, we are willing to take on trust that, yep, OK, the subordinate legislation is going to better outline who the alternative decision makers to be, you know, setting up that hierarchy. But the bit that we are particularly concerned about is that, also in Schedule 9, is that following this framework, that any aged care provider doing that, that they would have immunity from prosecution if anyone wanted to take action against them about inappropriate use of restrictive practices. This is totally inappropriate. It is totally using a sledgehammer for a problem that I have not been able to get any justification as to why immunity from prosecution is required. So I will be moving an amendment um, to address this, to remove that part of Schedule 9, because I think it's a really important issue Otherwise, in a bill that otherwise I think is making steps forward to improve the quality of aged care for our older Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I listened closely to Senator Rice then, and I think what uh, is apparent looking around the chamber, and, and certainly I'm in exactly the same boat as Senator Rice with elderly parents, and lots of us are struggling with this in our daily lives and dealing with it remotely from here. I've got a mother who's been in high needs aged care for over three years with, after eight years of dementia and a father that unfortunately is following. And uh, to, nego to navigate and negotiate your way through this is difficult, it is devastating and is fraught at the best of times and with the best of intentions and supportive families. So I'm, I am pleased that we are seeing as much reform as we can to the aged care sector coming through uh, and that we do make it easier for families who quite often have to deal with this as at times it is the elderly parents uh, that, that aren't really actually that attuned to what is actually happening around them and it is the children, adult children, that are left then to negotiate this system for them. Uh, I guess in one way it's, it's good that Labor's first aged care bill is almost a mirror image of what was put forward under the former government in the last parliament and does directly relate to our response to the Royal Commission. But again, what's incredibly uh, devastating for families like those of us that are going through this is that Mr Albanese was prepared to play politics with this issue. He was prepared to sit on his hands. He was prepared to block this legislation being implemented, and he was prepared to look at Senator Patrick, former Senator Patrick, uh, 
his amendment that was, that was requiring 24-7 nurses uh, with, an, with an exemption for rural and regional centres. And, you know, for those of us that have an interest in rural and regional Australia, what, what was being proposed would have seen nurses leave aged care facilities in rural and regional areas because they would have been required to be staffing metropolitan uh, facilities. Now, on this side of the House, we actually respect rural and regional Australians and believe that they have equal rights to those that live in metropolitan areas. But again, we know that uh, those opposite who are now the government do not see rural and regional Australia in the same light. Uh, there are two things, though, that no longer will be part of this reform that were recommended by the Royal Commission. And that would be uh, workers' screening regulations, because we actually believe that people that go to work in these facilities should be working them correctly. They should go with the right intent. They should be qualified, and they should be able to deliver the services that elderly Australians require. And the other thing that's going to be missing would be a legislated star rating system. And as we've talked about, those of us that are facing the challenges, looking for facilities, looking at options for our parents, uh, being able to see how a facility performs in a very simple way would actually be a benefit to a lot of families. But again, this isn't about making it easier for families looking at aged care options. This is about appeasing union mates, making sure the unions are all, all up to speed, all happy that the, the paymasters are being served. So we will be keeping a very, very close eye on what sort of reforms this government is now looking to put in place, because it should always be about the people going into these facilities and not about the politics, not about the unions and not about appeasing those that demand the most from you because they pay for you. So what we've seen is a delay to this significant legislation. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful to all Australians. It's disrespectful to older Australians. And it is absolutely disgraceful that you sat on your hands, that you refused to support this bill in opposition, but now your first bill is almost a direct mirror and I guess the funny thing is, though, and we saw yesterday in question time, the complete lack of ability to be across a brief, the complete lack of understanding of government is hard, people. You actually have to do things now. Now, lucky for you, there was actually legislation drafted. You've just made a couple of changes here and there, watered it down a bit where it suited you. but, but you know, you know, thankfully someone had written something. But what's going to happen, I think, as we see when time goes on, and we saw from Senator Watt's performance yesterday in question time and absolutely no comprehension, couldn't even give a number. Uh, what we, uh, what we, I think we'll continue to see is a reaching back to the coalition government, looking at legislation and saying, well, how did they do it? Because we don't know what we're doing. We don't, we're not across our brief. We don't understand how to actually govern. And uh, it's a little bit interesting when you see those that were very, very good when they sat on this side of the chamber. When they sat on this side of the chamber, had lots to say, lots and lots of things to say, lots of interjections, lots of commentary. But once we go to the other side of the chamber and we're actually supposed to do work, we're actually supposed to govern for Australians, all Australians, including elderly Australians, including for farmers, when, we're actually, when those opposite now in government are supposed to actually work for Australians, make sure that this country is running, to keep Australians safe, whether it's from foot and mouth, whether it's elderly Australians in aged care. You actually have to make decisions. You actually have to be across your brief. You actually have to understand the detail. You have to understand that there are impacts to everyday Australians when you go and legislate emissions reduction targets, create a lawyer's picnic, remove any responsibility from you and tie Australians' economy up in more and more red tape, green tape and any other padlock you can manage to find to ensure that Australia is put at an economic disadvantage internationally because you know, it makes you feel good shutting down every coal-fired power station in this country. 
I mean, we've got the Greens here. They need to ring their mates in Germany. They understand how things work. They understand that what people in their countries want to see is the lights on. They want to put their dishwashers on. They want to make sure their fridge is still running. But not those opposite. Those opposite are more interested in virtue signalling, in shrouding themselves in wokeness, which is really just an opportunity to be mean, to be rude. And I, I think we saw that last night after the outstanding speech by Senator Price. When those opposite, those that deemed it worthy to even attend the chamber, couldn't bring themselves to even stand up if they noticed the courtesy prior to Senator Stewart's speech, those of us on this side of the chamber gave it the recognition it deserved. Not those opposite. And in fact, we saw. Uh, order, Senator Hughes. Senator Urquhart. Point of order, um, Madam Deputy Chair. I would draw the attention uh, to the speaker currently that we're actually on the aged care and other legislation amendment bill, and I would ask you to draw her back to that point. Yes, thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Hughes, uh, on the point of order. Or, or I, I can rule on the point of order, which is um, I think Senator Urquhart is correct. We are here debating the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Bill, and if you could focus your comments on that, that would be appreciated. Well, we would like to see you know, focus on aged care, because that actually does include aged care in Indigenous communities. We have Senator Price here who understands the importance of proper legislation around Indigenous communities. Not virtue signalling, not the paternalistic Greens looking at Jacinta Price, Senator Price last night like she didn't know what she was talking about and couldn't even bring themselves to stand up. Because Senator Price understands that Indigenous aged care facilities would not be included in some of these regulations because of all these different little exemptions that are required. Because those opposites seem to think that they know what's best because they'll tell them what's best. They'll tell them what they need to be doing and how they need to perform. They don't take advice from those on the ground, whether it's aged care reform, where they've just looked taking our legislation, but then they go turn around and remove the cashless debit card where we're going to see the humbugging come back, where we're going to see domestic violence, access to alcohol, all of these things come back because they don't know how to govern. They don't know how to make decisions for the benefit of Australians. What they know is how to virtue signal. What they know is how to completely drag down everyday Australians, to upset the family budget, to make it harder for families to get into aged care, to make it harder for families to navigate the system. That's all those opposite want to do. But why are we surprised? And if we do want to you know, look at some of the things that they could have done, they could have done to continue to support the aged care uh, sector, but have chosen not to, those opposite now in government who purport and have always purported that they are the bastions of care, they are the bastions of supporting people and looking after people. At the first available opportunity, they ceased access to the rapid antigen tests for aged care homes. So, whilst on this side of the chamber, they were happy to squawk about the requirements for rapid antigen tests, hilariously at a time when the, Prime, the Premier of WA actually had made them illegal, but you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good screech across the chamber, as Senator Watt only knows too well. But at the first opportunity, they removed access to free rapid antigen tests for aged care homes as outbreaks were occurring. Now, the other thing that they did as soon as they could get in, because we know those opposite now in government, they, they actually really don't and never have supported our defence forces or the work that they do. At every opportunity, they look to cut defence spending. And the defence force have actually provided critical support to those in the aged care sector throughout the COVID pandemic. But of course, those opposite, of course, get into government, first thing they do, remove that support. Get rid of the Australian Defence Force assisting in aged care. So where we are is it a situation where they don't know how to write legislation, so they've just pretty much picked up what we put forward before, gone out to the union mates and asked them, how can we help you? Not how can we help older Australians, not how we can help families. Hey, union mates, how can we help you? So the first thing they do, remove the schedule that requires worker screening. So to every Australian out there whose parents are subjected to workers that are not up to speed, that don't have good intent, who don't have the ability to look after your elderly parents, 
You only need to look to those now sitting on the government benches, over those on the Treasury benches, that it was never about you and your family. It was never about you and your parents. It was always and always will be about their union mates. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Order. Um, Madam Deputy President, I was uh, told a story recently about the elderly mother of a friend who was moved into the secure ward of an aged care facility with a fast developing dementia. Her family chose the facility because it had a good program of activities tailored to the needs of dementia sufferers. They stretched the family finances as far as they could to do this because they wanted their mother to have the best possible care. Like so many people in their position, they had to clean out and sell the family home, the only significant asset that her mother owned, to pay for that care. Their mother's dementia first manifested in a loss of language. Over time, she completely lost all her words. Communication of any kind became a constant struggle, except when the music therapist came to visit the aged care home and played her guitar. Then she could sing songs from the war years, songs from her childhood songs ingrained in her memory many years earlier. That clearly gave her great pleasure. There is increasing scientific evidence that music seems to be the robust and to withstand the effects of neurodegenerative decline and other acquired brain injuries. Neuropsychologist Catherine Loveday wrote back in 2016, and I quote, one key finding is that music is, particularly, is a particularly good cue for autobiographical memories. These are memories that reinforce our sense of identity and play a hugely significant role in how we connect socially and emotionally with those that are cl close to us. Tunes that we first encountered between early adolescence and our late twenties seem to be particularly evocative. For this woman's family to discover that they could hear this their mum's voice again and to clearly see how much joy the singing brought her was an incredible revelation. But soon after, the aged care home had a massive round of cost cutting and the contract with the mu music therapist was not renewed. And with no one to play the tunes and encourage her, their mother fell silent. Her physical needs continued to be met. She was cared for by a dedicated staff who did their absolute best to ensure that she was clean, she was fed and comfortable, but her voice was no longer heard. On a new roster after the cost cutting, the staff were far too time poor to even put on a CD for her to listen to or to regularly take the dirty plates and cups out of her room after the meals. Then, in what were clearly further savings measures, the menus were changed and the meals presented to residents became far less appetising. Residents' dietary preferences went completely out the window. Despite all the notes and the records, on the file of my friend's mother was regularly served meals of fish. She had always hated fish, and when she had a voice had always made that very clear. That night, my, the night that my friend's mother passed away, there was a nurse on duty who could deliver the medication and particularly the pain relief that their mother needed. As my friend said, that was so important. I shuddered to think of what that night would have been like if that nurse had not been there. Surely there should be a nurse on every shift, was the question. That all happened over 10 years ago, but the warning signs were clearly there. Over that decade, the problems in our aged care system has continued to mount to the point of crisis. Over the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has served to emphasise and to highlight the weaknesses and flaws in the system and actually worsen the crisis, a crisis that is crying out to be addressed. And so this government, the Albanese Labor government, has taken on the task of restoring dignity, care, accountability and humanity to aged care. And it's because we must. The passage of this bill before us, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, is a critical step in reforming the aged care sector. The urgency to do this is not simply based on people like me hearing stories from friends with parents in care, as devastatingly sad as they may be. A Royal Commission was formally heard, has formally heard the testimony and seen the evidence that reform is desperately needed. 
This is the evidence the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety has enshrined in its reports. The Royal Commission hearings presented mounting, mounting evidence of systematic flaws and inadequate care. The commissioners absolutely nailed it when they gave their interim report released in 2019, the title Neglect. Just one word which summed up the terrible state of the system. The Australian people were shocked and at times horrified by the evidence the interim report presented. Neglect. That's what it presented. Then, when the final report titled Care, Dignity and Respect was released in March 2021, the Royal Commissioners called for a fundamental reform of the aged care system. They said, and I quote, the extent of substandard care in Australia's aged care system reflects both poor quality on the part of some aged care providers and fundamental systematic flaws with the way the Australian aged care system is designed and governed. People receiving aged care deserve better. The Australian community is, is entitled to expect better. And the, the Australian community is absolutely entitled to expect better. Well, this government has listened closely, and the bill before us starts us on the road to better. This reform can't come quickly enough. As the Minister for Aged Care, the Honourable Annika Wells MP, has said in the other place, too many parliaments, too many governments have shunned the hard work needed to support our aged care system. Over the last decade, there have been 23 reports, inquiries, studies, committee reports and a royal commission telling us the same story, a story of neglect and of government ignoring aged care concerns. They represent many, many missed opportunities. And the previous speaker spoke about how we had picked up the previous government's bill, but those neglect, those 23 reports, those inquiries, those studies, all were under the watch of the previous government. We must not miss this opportunity, and there is a lot of work to do before we get to this effect meaningful change. This bill begins that work. It amends aged care law and other legislation to implement a series of urgent funding, quality and safety measures, several of which were recommended by the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety. Schedule 1 of the bill relates to the new Australian National Aged Care Classification, ANAWC, the model for calculating aged care subsidies that was endorsed by the Royal Commission. Schedule 2 of the bill is a new measure that will facilitate the publication of star ratings. Schedule 3 introduces a code of conduct for the aged care sector as recommended by the Royal Commission. Schedule 4 of the bill extends the serious incident response scheme to home care and flexible care. Schedule 5 of this bill strengthens the government governance of approved providers. Schedule 6 facilitates increased information sharing. Schedule 7 of the bill will increase government oversight of how refundable accommodation, deposits and bonds. And Schedule 8 of the bill expands the functions of a renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority. Schedule 9 of the bill will enable the implementation of an interim solution with respect to the requirement to obtain informed consent for the re, uh, use of restrictive practices. And Schedule 9 to the bill also provides a limited immunity from civil or criminal li liability that may arise in relation to the use of restrictive practice, where someone follows all of the requirements under Commonwealth law in relation to the use of a restrictive practice. This provision does not provide a broad immunity to negligence in respect of the use of a restrictive practice. The bill replaces the outdated aged care funding instrument with a new model for calculating aged care subsidies called the Australian National Aged Care Classification Model, which has been developed in consultation with the aged care sector and consumer groups. Since April 2021, residential aged care recipients have been progressively assessed and classified under the ANAWC, 
and funding under the new model will commence this year on 1 October. Importantly, the bill includes several measures that will provide additional protections directly to older Australians, protections which cannot be delayed any longer. The Serious Incident Response Scheme SERS, will be expanded to establish obligations on approved providers of home care and flexible care in a community setting to report and respond to incidents and take action to prevent incidents from reoccurring. A new code of conduct will set high standards of behaviour for aged care workers, approved providers and governing persons of approved providers to ensure they are delivering aged care in a way that is safe, competent and respectful. Improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators will enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm. An interim solution for the provision of consent to the use of restrictive practices will also be established while state and territory consent arrangements are reconsidered. The bill also includes a series of measures that provide greater transparency and accountability for providers. Star ratings will be published for all residential age services on My Age Care by the end of 2022. Star ratings will enable senior Australians, their families and carers to make informed decisions about their aged care. From 1 December 2022, age approved providers and their governing bodies will be required to meet new responsibilities that will improve governance. Approved providers will be required to notify the Aged Care and Quality Safety Commission of changes to key personnel and the current disqualified individual arrangements will be uh, replaced with a broader suitability test. Amendments will also be made to increase financial and prudential oversight in respect of refundable accommodation deposits and bonds. The functions of a renamed health, independent health and aged care pricing authority will be expanded to include the provision of advice on health care and aged care pricing and costing. This bill makes a series of important changes that will improve the health, safety and wellbeing of older Australians and will assist older Australians and their families to understand the quality of care and the operations of, of providers. As I said, there is a long road of reform and there is much more to do. Regularly, uh, I have a husband of a local aged care worker who calls my office in Devonport. He's incredibly worried about his wife, who is on the brink of burnout. Every week she is pressured a lot, uh, to work a lot of extra shifts, often on her days off. She often arrives at work to find there aren't enough staff, other, th uh, other, other staff to work with her to safely provide the care that is needed in a timely fashion. She loves her job, she loves caring for vulnerable older Australians, but is seriously considering leaving the industry. It is a story that I'm sure all of us have heard, and I hear it constantly from workers in the aged care sector. Coupled with that, an intense concern about the family finances as they struggle every week to make ends meet on her uh, low wage. There are thousands of families and thousands of workers in this country in this same situation, and that should not be the case. Above all, we must ensure that the voices of those in aged care are heard, and that is the residents, the people working in the aged care system, the voices of our elders who deserve dignity and respect in their later years. And when those voices fall silent, we must do everything we can do to support them to sing again. I commend this bill to the members of this chamber and I hope that all the members in this chamber will join us on the road to reform the aged care sector. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech, but I would like to take this opportunity to talk about aged care. There are a few policy areas that are as heartbreaking as aged care. We've all seen the stories of older Australians suffering in our nation's aged care facilities. Over the past few years, there have been many reports of people being neglected, receiving in inadequate care, inadequate nutrition, and in some cases, left to die in the very places 
charged with caring for them. The people of the ACT speak to me frequently about their concerns for aged care and their hopes for creating a high standard of care for older Australians. The 148 recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety are the roadmap for creating this higher standard. That's why my community has asked that I do all I can to ensure the recommendations are implemented as quickly as possible so that we can build an aged care system that puts people and their well-being and safety first. It is great to see that this is the first bill that we're being charged to consider, and I'm glad to play my part in seeing it become law. While this bill is for transitional arrangements, the changes are urgent and desperately needed. However, this bill should not be, should not be beyond a measure of sim simple scrutiny. While I thank the Minister, her staff and her department for engaging early and providing high-level briefings, a single day to get across the detail contained within these 147 pages is not enough. We cannot appropriately do our work here in the House of Review if we are not given the time to view the details, consult with our communities and reach out to experts. I hope the timelines placed on this bill are an exception and not the rule. And where fast timeframes are needed, I would encourage the government to do us the courtesy of releasing an exposure draft. However, I do recognise how important it is to pass this bill and the reforms within it and to put in place codes of conduct and clean up the governance arrangements of aged care providers. I will not slow down this bill's consideration, but I do want to briefly touch on a few points. I have heard concerns about how the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority will work. After the bill is passed, the Pricing Authority will have the dual responsibility for setting the price for health care services delivered in public hospitals and for services delivered in the aged care, care system. However, unlike for healthcare services, when the pricing authority determines a price for delivering services in aged care, it will not be binding. They will only be able to advise the minister on pricing matters. Stakeholders have raised with me that they feel uncomfortable that the government could potentially veto the prices determined by the pricing agency, pricing authority rather. I would encourage the government to provide assurances to the sector that this won't be the case and that the prices set will cover the actual costs of delivering aged care services. Secondly, I would like to touch on the workforce. All of our systems of care are built on people. There is a hefty task ahead in creating both a funding model and a care workforce needed to ensure older Australians receive the highest standard of care we so desperately need. I'm pleased to see the government is moving ahead and quickly with new laws that will require a registered nurse on site at every aged care facility. 24-7. But I'm concerned about our nation's ability to, to find the workforce and attract them into the aged care sector. I've seen in the news just this morning that hundreds of aged care providers are likely to seek exemptions from the 24-7 requirement as they predict difficulties in being able to fill the shifts. I've recently spoken with the Australian College of Nursing, who reminded me that the nursing workforce across the country is burnt out. The ANMF has echoed this sentiment. Across back-to-back -back disasters, from Black Summer to the recent floods to the multi-year global pandemic, nurses have been on our front line, there to care for us in our times of need. It's my understanding that some nurses haven't been able to take their annual leave for over a year and a half. The most recent modelling that I could find shows a projected shortfall of 85,000 nurses by 2025 and 123,000 by 2030. Nurses are leaving the workforce, limiting the pool of talent we have to supply the aged care sector. But more importantly, why would nurses leave any role to work in the aged care sector, which is notoriously poorly paid? We need to ensure there is at least parity for nurses working in aged care with their colleagues in other parts of our health system. I know many work in aged care for the love of it, but we should not rely on this grace to ensure the sector is appropriately staffed. These reforms are a great first step. However, I would encourage all of us to remain vigilant and to keep inquiring over, the t over this term of parliament on the state of our aged care system. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, uh, and I too rise to speak on the aged care and other legislation 
Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill of 2022. Uh, and firstly, I would like to point out the contrast between those opposite uh, and the Albanese Labor government, uh, because the contrast could not be clearer on the aged care crisis. The former Liberal National Government neglected our aged care system, and they did that for almost a decade, a system that was already in crisis before the pandemic started. A crisis that those opposite, when they were in government, chose to ignore until and unless it was politically convenient for them to finally address it. Uh, and they claimed that their response to the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety was a once in a generation change to the sector, but actually it was a once in a generation disgrace a once-in-a-generation kick in the guts to the dedicated aged care workers who deserved so much better, so much more from their government. Now, we on the government benches, we know that good, secure jobs need to be at the heart of any response to the aged care crisis. But the only thing at the heart of the response from those opposite when they were in government was delay. The only thing at the heart of their response when they were in government was neglect. And their bill to address some of the very critical areas of the aged care system, which this bill also seeks to address, was introduced to the parliament in September uh, 2021. Uh, but it wasn't until the final hours before the election that those opposite remembered it even existed. Uh, that was the level of priority that those opposite put on fixing the aged care crisis. It wasn't until the final hours before the election that they remembered that their homework was due on the Aged Care Royal Commission. And they didn't even get it done. They didn't get it done. What a disgrace. But what more did Australians expect from this government? Because when it comes to aged care, those opposite have never taken any responsibility. They've never acted with any sense of urgency. And this stands in stark comparison to the Albanese Labor government, who in our first week of the new 47th parliament are taking action that this government failed to take to protect the aged care system. We have wasted absolutely no time when it comes to fixing the aged care crisis. On our very first week in this new parliament, we have introduced two bills to fix the crisis in this sector and deliver on our commitment to the Australian people, our commitment that we will put the care back into aged care, our commitment that we'll put the care, the dignity and respect back into the aged care system. So this bill before the chamber implements a number of urgent reforms to funding, to quality and safety in our aged care sector. It introduces a new aged care subsidy calculation, uh, as well as a code of conduct uh, and uh, banning order scheme. Um, what this bill does is it extends the serious incident response scheme to aged care delivered in home settings, uh, and it addresses issues with the informed consent arrangements in respect to the use of restrictive practices in aged care. <clears throat> this bill strengthens the governance of approved providers uh, and increases financial and prudential oversight. It enhances information sharing across related sectors to enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks. Uh, and all of this is about better protecting consumers and participants from harm. Uh, and this bill broadens the functions of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority to include the provision of advice on health care and aged care pricing and costing. Um, this very um, important legislation uh, that we are introducing uh, in our first week as the Albanese government, in the first week of the 47th parliament, um, will also improve transparency and accountability of providers by introducing a star ratings system, 
and that will be published for all residential aged care services on My Aged Care by the end of 2022. Uh, and that is a commitment that we made uh, when we were in opposition that we are getting on, hitting the ground running and implementing in government because people want to see greater transparency, they want to see greater accountability amongst providers um, who are tasked with caring for our nation's most vulnerable elders, um, providers who receive federal funding to do that critical work. What the Australian people want to see is greater accountability and transparency when it comes to their actions with federal funding, when it comes to their actions caring for our most vulnerable elders. So, As I say, that information on the star rating system will be published for everyone to see um, by the end of 2022. And that will allow senior Australians, their families uh, and their carers to make informed decisions about their aged care. Um, it will allow them to see how providers are performing uh, and how they're using federal funds to provide quality care. Now, a number of these measures were included uh, in the previous government's lapsed legislations, uh, measures that we agreed with uh, and we recognise needed to be delivered. But unlike the delayed and half-baked legislation that those opposite put forward uh, that ignored the recommendations from the Royal Commission uh, and ignored the real experts, our aged care workers, our legislation will make serious improvements to the quality of care in the aged care sector. Our legislation will ensure workers have their skills recognised and are given the opportunity to develop their careers. Uh, and we'll do that by implementing a national registration scheme. Um, that national registration scheme uh, is part of the professionalisation of the aged care workforce, and it's a recommendation that I know aged care workers around the country welcomed. Uh, it's a recommendation um, that was made uh, in the Royal Commission's final report, Recommendation 77. Uh, and Lauren Hutchins from the Health Services Union has told us that workers want this registration scheme. She said, and I quote, a registration scheme that actually invests in workers, in their professional development and in ongoing training, and that it's understood it's an ongoing requirement of the job and acknowledged by government as such. Um, Ms Hutchins went on to say that workers want their skills recognised and they want the opportunity to develop and participate in training. The Albanese government recognises the skill required to provide high quality care in aged care. Uh, and with this bill, we will deliver the ongoing training and professional development that these workers deserve. Um, because we know that it is the aged care workforce who really are at the heart of our aged care system. Uh, and we know that there is no solution to the aged care crisis without good, secure jobs for workers. You cannot provide quality aged care services in this country without dealing with the workforce crisis that is at the core of our care crisis. Our aged care workers have been telling us for too long that they want to do a good job, that they value the residents who are in their care, but they just don't have the time that they need to care for the residents with the level of professionalism that they want. Uh, and we have a revolving door of aged care workers in this country because the job is so undervalued. This is a job that needs to be professionalised. Aged care workers need to be valued and recognised for their work. They need to be paid more. They need better training. Uh, and this bill starts to recognise the value that we need to put on aged care workers with this registration scheme. So we know that there is no solution to the aged care crisis without valuing the workforce uh, and our work here on fixing the aged care crisis really is just beginning this week. Now, in the last parliament, the Senate Select Committee on Job Security heard 
absolutely damning evidence of the prevalence and impact of insecure work in the aged care sector. Um, we heard that job insecurity and chronic low pay are the primary reasons that the sector is unable to meet its workforce and quality of care needs. Um, and we heard that right from the coalface of the aged care sector, from aged care worker to aged care worker who came and gave evidence about the conditions that they faced uh, in aged care in Australia. Um, we heard that over-reliance on insecure work practices has become an absolute business model in aged care. And it's a business model which means that workers are left desperate with little choice but to accept work across multiple employers to make ends meet. Uh, and it's a business model which detrimentally impacts the quality of care for vulnerable people in the aged care sector. Uh, and we heard from Ray Collins um, from the Health Workers Union who um, told the committee um, at hearings in, in Victoria, uh, and I quote, it suits the business model to keep me as a worker lean and mean. You give me the minimal hours you can give me. You manipulate the hours and the workers to suit your dollar needs, not your care needs. And this is not how aged care should be run in Australia today. Yeah. Aged care should be run on the basis of good, secure jobs for the incredibly important aged care workers who are the heart and the soul of our aged care system. But insecure work is way too prevalent in aged care, uh, and it takes the form of low pay and low hour part-time contracts. This is a system that provides flexibility for employers at the expense of the aged care workforce. Um, we've heard too many stories from aged care workers who are hired on part-time contracts with guaranteed hours as low as one or two hours per week, uh, and any hours over that are just not guaranteed. Any extra hours that the workers are given don't attract overtime or penalty rates. Uh, and then there's the issue of chronic low pay. Low pay, which we heard is a result of systematic undervaluation of care work as unskilled women's work. We heard from Professor Charlesworth from RMIT University who explained how gender discrimination has led to the undervaluation um, and work insecurity in aged care. She said um, this gendered nature of job insecurity is underpinned by a lack of value accorded to the work and the workers who perform it, which draws on a view of aged care as something women do for free uh, and uh, are therefore unskilled uh, and that it's not quite work. So this system of chronic low pay and low hour contracts leaves workers desperate in a constant limbo not knowing how many hours they will work each week, not knowing whether they'll be able to afford to pay their bills and unable to properly plan their lives. And we also heard from workers across the sector about the impacts of insecure work on their health and on their families. Anu Singh, an aged care worker and member of the United Workers Union, told the committee, and I quote, apprehension, self-doubt, stress, unscheduled instability. For me, these words altogether define the job insecurity that we actually go through all the time. So taking jobs with low wages and a lack of stable hours is not a choice that workers are making because it isn't a choice in aged care today. Insecure jobs are all too often all that's on offer for these workers. Uh, and without good secure jobs, we aren't able to attract new workers to this critical sector. Um, there is a lot of work to do to fix the crisis in aged care. Uh, and what we know is that the workforce is front and centre in the aged care crisis. Um, one of the aspects of this legislation before the chamber is a very important registration system, um, Recommendation 77 of the Royal Commission into Aged Care. It's one step that we can take to start aged care workers on the journey to professionalisation. Uh, and that's what the workers need uh, and it's what the residents in their care need. This is a job that is providing um, the most important care in our society, care to our most vulnerable elders. Uh, and what aged care workers need uh, is the support of their government and that is absolutely what they will get from the Albanese Labor government. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise with um, pleasure to make a contribution to the Aged Care other and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. Um, as has been indicated by other speakers in the chamber, an important piece of legislation uh, <coughs> that uh, as has been noted on a number of occasions, is essentially the same legislation that came to this chamber prior to the election uh, and, as Senator Rice quite rightly pointed out, was amended in this place, but with one amendment which the then government uh, didn't feel was responsible, which was a, an amendment moved by Senator Patrick for immediate 24-7 nurses in aged care. The reason that we didn't accept that recommendation because, was because it wasn't feasible, it wasn't responsible, not that we didn't support the concept of 24-7 nurses in aged care, because we said that we did in our response to the Royal Commission, uh, but it wasn't possible to um, make that occur straight away. That's why this legislation didn't complete in the last parliament. It should have completed in the last parliament, and the effect of the politics that was played by the previous um, government, previous opposition, the now, now government, is that important reforms to the aged care sector, important reforms to the aged care sector have been delayed. That is the effect of the actions of the now government uh, with respect to this legislation. It is important legislation. Aged care providers have been delayed in having uh, legislated certainty with respect to ANAC. ANAC is a game changer with respect to the funding of the aged care se sector in this country. It is the mechanism by which the resources can and will be made available to, in to ensure that senior Australians, as we all want, can be cared with, res with respect, care and dignity, which is the title of the final report of the Royal Commission. Many speakers, De Acting Deputy President, have indicated the various elements of the bill, so I'm not going to concentrate on them all, but there are a couple of things that are, I, th I think, extremely important, so I'll focus on those. There are nine schedules in the legislation, <coughs> uh, and there, there, are, there was one schedule that was removed from the previous bill, which went to workforce screening and registration. Can I say I find it really difficult to accept and understand why the schedule has been removed? Because the design of the workforce registration program was to make it as easy as possible to prevent duplication, to make it as cost effective as possible, to have a regist workforce registration scheme that worked across the entire care sector. The workforce registration scheme that the previous government wanted to put in place was the one that was being used for NDIS. It's already there. Why do we need to design a new workforce registration scheme? It's already being used across the country for workers in NDIS. I go to Bernie, family based care in Burnie. They are providers of home care, they are providers of NDIS. They are providers of veterans care. Why should they have more than one workforce registration scheme within their business? They incur additional cost, and as the principal funders of aged care in this country, the taxpayers bear that additional cost. So when the government is looking at their systems and where they might have efficiencies in the way that they operate, perhaps they could look at what the previous government was trying to achieve with the workforce registration program. It's something that's already there. Why do we need to build a new one? We don't. And in fact, it will provide efficiency in the operation of our aged care sector. There are about 4,000 senior Australians in residential aged care. Those providers that have, uh, that, that qualify for NDIs, those, that pro those providers that have those residents that qualify for NDS already have to have their workforce registered under the NDIS workforce registration scheme. Why should they have two? Why should we impose that cost, that duplication of effort, of administration and that cost on the Australian taxpayer by designing another one? Why would we do that? 
It doesn't make sense. The government should reintroduce the previous provisions that we had in this bill to ensure efficiency, ease of operation of business, so that this sector, the whole care sector, can operate so much more efficiently and cost-effectively in the interests of senior Australians, but more importantly the Australian community, who are paying for this. Who are paying for this? Uh, Madam Deputy President, one of the, one of the new uh, measures in the bill is the star rating system. Now that, that was um, slated to occur by the same time frame that's in the legislation now, and so I welcome the, the uh, inclusion of the star rating system within the legislation. It was set to occur anyway, and so it should happen. Uh, this does progress the legislation. The other change that's been made, Acting Deputy President, and this one genuinely concerns me, is in relation uh, to governance. In Schedule 5, Schedule 5 introduces new government responsibilities for approved providers regarding membership of their governing bodies the establishment of new advisory bodies and measures to improve leadership and culture. This is something that's not often talked about with respect to the reform of the aged care sector. But can I tell you, it is one of the most important. If the corporate governance of an organisation isn't right, if the culture within an organisation isn't right, it has a direct impact a direct impact on the quality of care that's been provided. We learned some very, very hard lessons over the last two or three years through COVID. But can I say to you quite honestly and earnestly, one of the major lessons that we learned was if the clinical leadership and the corporate governance in an aged care service wasn't good, the outcomes with respect to managing a COVID outbreak and managing the quality of care were bad for residents. So the element of this particular measure that concerns me the most is the exemption that has been put into this schedule for all archos. My question, President, my question is why do the residents of an archo deserve a lower level? a lower level of corporate governance than every other Australian in aged care in this country. It is a disgrace. It is a disgrace that this government is proposing to impose a lower level of corporate governance on Archos than they will for every other aged care provider. We heard in this place yesterday two powerful speeches from two proud Indigenous Australians, both who care for their communities. I think a historical day. I think it was probably the first time that we've seen two first speeches from two proud First Nations women. It is a historical day. And yet the next day, this government takes backwards the protection of Indigenous Australians in residential aged care by providing an exemption on governance. For, it's actually true if you were prepared. It's not in your talking points, I know. I know it's not in your talking points. But, you, but, but, but you, you, you're not prepared to tell Australians that this is the case. It is a disgrace that you believe, it's a disgrace that you believe that Indigenous Australians deserve a lower level of corporate governance over their care than everybody else. That provision. I would urge you all to go back to your minister. I would urge you all to go back to your minister and request that that provision be put back into the legislation. It should be. This is not a political point, but this is a point with respect to the care of Indigenous Australians in residential aged care. They deserve the same governance. As I've said, the quality of corporate governance, the quality of clinical governance in residential aged care has a direct correlation to the quality of care that is delivered 
to the people within those facilities. That is why we're all here. That is why we are debating this. We can argue over the politics of what happened before and after the election, and we will do that. And we will do that. But let's not forget that it was the coalition that called the Royal Commission with all of the pain that it brought us as a government at the time. We called the Royal Commission with all of the pain that it caused us. We have responded to every single recommendation from that Royal Commission. Every single recommendation the, gov the then government responded to over 12 months ago in the budget last year. Mr. Order. The, new Order. Government, the new government has not yet responded to one of them. Where is the government's response to the Royal Commission? There is none. There is none. They had a five-point plan announced in their address and reply. A five-point plan that started unwinding within 24 hours. Within 24 hours. It was supposed to include 24-7 nurses. We hear in the media this morning that there's now exemptions from that because the government has come to the realisation that we already knew that the implementation of that was an issue because of the supply of workforce. It included a promise, it included a promise for a pay rise which wasn't within the budgeted amount that they said it was. They don't know where the nurses are coming from, they don't know how many they need, and they haven't yet told us how much they're going to cost. I'll be interested to see whether it's in the state economic statement this afternoon. We, we certainly expect to see it in the budget, Mr. President. But this piece of legislation is the second tranche of legislation in support of reforms out of the Royal Commission. It's not the first, as the government would like you to believe. It is the second piece of legislation that supports that. It is an important piece of legislation. Uh, it should pass this place. It should pass this place. But for the very reasons that I've mentioned in my contribution today, government members should go back and talk to their minister about protecting Indigenous Australians in ARCHO managed aged care facilities around this country. And they ought to go back and talk about a workforce registration program that already exists rather than kowtowing to their union leaders uh, and save the sector some money and also save the taxpayers some money in the process, because it was a sensible and smart reform. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. The time for this debate has now expired. You will be in continuation when the matter comes back. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. Um, sorry, um, President, I have a um, leave of absence, which um, I, I can do now. Uh, a little yeah. later? Okay. A little oh, later. No worries. So we'll do Selection of Bills. Thank Senator you. Um, I present the second report of the 2022 uh, Selection of Bills Committee and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So I move that the report be adopted. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry, I seek leave. Do I just seek leave to move an amendment? I don't, do I? No. no. Um, I would like to move an amendment to the report um, and at the end of the motion add and in respect of the provisions of the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and the Jobs and Skills Australia National Skills Commission Repeal Bill 2022, the Education and Employment Legislation Committee report by the 23rd of September 2022. And has that amendment been circulated? Yep. I'll come to you. Uh, Senator McKim, were you seeking the call? Uh, yes, I, I was, President. Yes. I have the call. I just wanted to um, make a few observations about uh, that amendment in the debate. Um, from the Australian Greens' uh, point of view, uh, we're not too sure um, what the fuss is about here in terms of Labor's position, and we will be supporting uh, the Liberals' amendment, uh, the opposition's amendment. Um, eight, years is, uh, eight weeks I'm sorry, is not a particularly long period for an inquiry. These bills create an important agency, and it's important that we get this agency right, and the Senate absolutely needs to do its job here. Now, we make 
uh, the very reasonable observation that the government has a jobs summit coming up on the 1st and 2nd of September. And obviously, that's a really important summit. And we want to understand what the outcomes are from that really important jobs summit. Um, in time for those outcomes to be fed in to the committee's considerations and ultimately the deliberations of the Senate around this legislation. So we believe that the, the outcomes of uh, the job summit should um, have the capacity to be able to help to shape Jobs and Skills Australia, the agency established by this legislation. I want to make a couple of um, very quick and very preliminary observations on Jobs and Skills Australia as proposed in this legislation. There is no mechanism beyond a consultation mechanism for stakeholders' voices to be heard and acted on. And we do note this is a big step backwards from uh, previous Australian Labor Party machinery that has actually empowered and resourced diverse sectoral voices at the table. And we also note that the advice parameters appear on a preliminary um, uh, 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 as a preliminary assessment to be very narrowly focused around data and analysis. So we want this inquiry to have the capacity um, to consider and explore those issues and any other issues which stakeholders bring up. Uh, Jobs and Skills Australia will be a critical agency and the Senate has to get it right. And the Greens believe that uh, an inquiry that reports as is proposed by the opposition on the 23rd of September strikes the right balance between getting it done and making sure it's done right. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. And um, this was an issue um, that we discussed last night that we weren't able uh, to reach agreement on. The government's preferred position is that um, we refer but with a reporting date so that we can start considering this bill um, during the September sittings. Um, we, of course, would facilitate briefings and opportunities for crossbenchers uh, and the opposition to be, uh, you know, to discuss that legislation with ministers. But our preference is to have this legislation ready to debate. Uh, in September. We don't think it is that complex, actually, to establish Jobs and Skills Australia. Um, you know, it is a key election commitment of ours uh, that we took, and we want to get cracking on it. And if we don't um, have a, a report, or a report, the report does, the committee doesn't report until the end of September, um, then potentially we won't be able to program this in. Um, you know, in the October sittings where we have budget and then budget estimates. And so then we're leaving this right until the end of the year before we're able to establish this agency when we have a range of other priorities. Um, I think if the committee wants the referral, then you know, get to work over that, over the, between now and the, the next sitting. It's a month. Um, you can conduct a pretty reasonable inquiry in a month's time. Um, that is certainly the government's preference. I, I, I can see from contributions from others, though, that um, we, we don't have the numbers um, to stop that referral to the 28th. Um, but um, you know, our strong preference would be that people consider dealing with this as soon as possible so the legislation is available for debate in this chamber in the September sittings. Have you finished? Sorry, There's yes. no more speakers. So the question is, the amendment as moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. I'll now put the amended um, report from the Selection of Bills Committee. So the um, motion as moved by Senator Urquhart with the amendment agreed to by the Senate, put forward by Senator Rustin, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I need some voices, people. <laughs> right, let's just try it again. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it des desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Dodson. 
Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Dodson for today for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Askew. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence also. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators, Senators Canavan, Hume and Liddell, for the 28th of July 2020 for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, general business notice of motion number nine be considered during general business today, and b the following bills be considered at the time for private senators' bills on Monday, 1 August 2022. Uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Regional Forest Agreements Bill 2020, and United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Bill 2022. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. And I believe there are no postponements uh, and we're still in the process of establishing committees. So I think that takes us to formal business. Oh, Senator Ciccone? Uh, yes, under formal business, Chair. All right, just yep. let me finish my spiel. Um, so we now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I call Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. I seek leave to amend business of the Senate, notice of motion number one to change the committee to the References Committee before asking that, that it be taken as a formal motion. And before asking that it is a motion to be taken as formal, I inform the Chamber that Senator Steele will also be co-sponsoring the motion. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted to amend. Yes, Senator Chikoni. Thank you. Uh, I amend the motion by changing the committee from the Legislation Committee to the References Committee. I ask that the business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. So the question is, uh, is leave granted? Um, Senator Roberts, are you seeking the call? Statement of no more than one minute. Right. Right. Let me just get to leave being granted and then moving, then I'll come to you. I'm assuming leave's been granted. So, uh, Senator Ciccone, if you put the motion and then I'll go to Senator Roberts. Thank you very much, President. I move the motion. Uh, Senator Roberts. You're Thank seeking, you. Hang on, you're seeking leave to, uh, make, seek a leave to make a short is statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Foot and mouth disease entering Australia is a clear and present threat to Australia's livestock industry, family farms and the world's protein supply. I do not believe Minister Watt is handling FMD well. One Nation wants an inquiry, not a cover-up. We, we acknowledge Senator Wish Wilson and others who have worked with Senator Ciccone to, to modify this. We would not support the original motion but we will support this motion amended. Why would you refer FMD to a government-controlled legislation committee unless the intent was to cover up? Minister Watt is out of his depth. Yesterday in question time, Senator Watt replied to my uh, foot and mouth disease questions with responses that may have misled the public and the Senate. When admitting to having one million FMD vaccines produced and stored in the UK, Minister Watt said vaccines could not be produced until we know the strain involved. What are the vaccines in the UK? And he said he knows the Indonesian strain. I look forward to a proper inquiry to get to the bottom of this. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Labor Party. Um, Senator McKenzie, what are you seeking? I'm seeking leave Do you seek to, make to make a short, a short statement? statement. Is leave granted? <laughs> leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, look, in recognition of foot and mouth disease uh, impact on our rural and regional communities, uh, particularly on our livestock industry and supply chains. I'd like to thank the Chamber for the collaborative work that's gone on with the crossbench, uh, with the Greens and with the Labor Party to send uh, this inquiry to the appropriate Senate in, uh, committee, which is uh, Rural and Regional Affairs Reference Committee. Uh, we note that the terms of reference are not as broad. Uh, as we would have uh, liked in the references moved by Senator Canavan and other uh, rural and regional senators in this place. Um, but we do note in the reference from uh, Senator Ciccone that uh, part three states any related manners. And so just flagging to Senator Ciccone uh, and Stirl that uh, the matters raised in Senator Canavan's terms of reference will be pursued in the committee uh, under that part of the Senate. Um, Motion. 
Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wish Wilson. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Please leave granted. Uh, leave President, granted for one minute. Um, I just the, the, green, the Greens Senator also... Wish Wilson, just wait oh, until right. I finish. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, the Greens would also like to uh, put on record uh, our thanks for a collaborative approach to this uh, and also for the inclusion of varroa mite, uh, the infestation which, of course, has got a lot of uh, beekeepers and the honey industry very concerned right around the country. It's also, we believe, a matter of national significance and that can be examined as part of a broader biosecurity uh, references committee uh, through, uh, through rural and regional affairs. So we'd like to thank the Chamber. This is what the Australian people voted for, a collaborative, constructive approach to uh, dealing with the major challenges that we face in this country. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKenzie? Rising on... No. Uh, OK. So. Right. Everyone's very keen. I'm just, I, I'm just going to make a statement before I put the motion. Um, I advise senators that due to an error in the notice paper, Senator Ciccone's notice was not shown in full. The correct notice has been circulated in the chamber and included on the dynamic red. So the question now is that the motion is moved by Senator Ciccone be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. S uh, and I'm Senator McKenzie. <laughs> well, on behalf of uh, Senator Canavan, I seek leave to withdraw um, his reference uh, to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee around uh, foot and mouth varroa mite and obviously lumpy skin disease, recognising that the committee will be uh, investigating those matters as a result of the previous motion. And, and on this occasion, you didn't need leave. <laughs> Noted. Uh, we'll now move to uh, general business and uh, we'll deal with general business notice of motion number eight, standing in the name of Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I ask that general business notice of motion number eight relating to the restoration of the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Regional Forest Agreements Bill 2020 to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rustin. Motion. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So that's the end of formal business. We do have some committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint a senator to committees. Are you not varying the membership of committees? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that Senator Babbitt be appointed. Move the motion as circulated in the chamber. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now return to government business. Senator Colbeck, you had about two minutes left, I think. I'll oh, beg your pardon, I'll just call the clerk first. We're all jumping ahead. Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. Uh, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. As I indicated previously during my presentation, this is an important piece of legislation. It's the second tranche of legislation in support of the reforms proposed by the Royal, Commun Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. We will hear Labor senators pop up, rewrite history about the way that they were um, progressing reform of the aged care sector. but. As we've discussed, this legislation is essentially the same except for a couple of points as to legislation that should have been passed prior to the election. The only thing that Labor has done at this point in time is delay the reform process, unfortunately, because there is no disagreement on either side of the chamber here that this is important. That's why we called the Royal Commission. That's why we put up this piece of legislation. That's why I've made the comments that I've made. My comments are not about politics. It's about ensuring that senior Australians and residential aged care in this country get the care that they deserve. 
as proposed by the Royal Commission. So they need to put back the workforce registration scheme, that is which, is, which is the NDIS workforce registration system. They need to make sure that Indigenous Australians in aged care are protected in the same way that every other Australian in residential aged care is protected. They deserve no less. They deserve no less. It's a very unfortunate omission. I don't understand why the government has made it. Maybe the Archos asked for it. But this reform is about the people receiving care. The providers will ask for a lot of things. We should be looking through the providers to the residents of residential aged care. They're the ones that this is about. They are the ones who are important. And unfortunately, President, the government are actually even winding back their own election commitments. Because now with the responsibility of government, they're realising the logistics and the realities of having to deliver those things. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. And uh, before I get to my prepared remarks, I want to go to the commentary that we've just received from the former Minister for Aged Care, who seeks in his speech today to absolve himself and three terms of Liberal government from an abomination that manifests itself in Australian aged care. That weak contribution was an excuse. It was as good as a letter, the dog ate my homework, to a teacher. No responsibility was taken by the government. He says, I don't understand. We knew he didn't understand. He couldn't answer questions here in the chamber. Performances by that minister and the department under his, uh, that was supposed to be supporting him failed the Australian people year after year. He admitted that this is a second bit of legislation. Well, we're getting to this legislation in a new government because the former government failed to do the, do the job of government. They failed to do what Australians need us to do. And I see people here in this chamber. If we're all lucky, we're going to get to be aged. If we're all lucky, we love people who are aged. There is no other government responsible for aged care other than the federal government. And for nine long, long years, Australians buried their families, members. They buried people who died in aged care. They suffered watching the struggle of people in aged care because this government didn't do what Australians expected them to do. They didn't care. They didn't pay attention properly. They didn't consult. You heard Senator Colbeck there saying something about the Aboriginal population. And it's well that we celebrate contributions by two amazing women who have been elected to the parliament. It's a privilege. Whether you sit on that side in opposition, whether you sit on the crossbench, whether you sit here in government, as my colleague uh, Senator Jana Stewart is going to, it's a privilege to sit here. But the privilege gives you the opportunity and the responsibility to consult properly with groups. And in a throwaway line, the minister says, "Well, maybe the Archos called for it. That may be the Aboriginal people called for this change," and he dismisses it. And that's what we saw from them in government for nine years. A litany of excuses. He wants to play politics with this because the truth is report after report after report after report from the moment that Tony Abbott was elected through the prime ministership of uh, who was the next one? Got to remember the three in a row. Who was the second one? Turnbull. And then we had Mr Morrison. All three of them. All three of them have to take responsibility for failing to respond to any of those reports. And then he says, we instituted the Royal Commission because he had no choice. It became so apparent how disgraceful the situation was that they actually had to go ahead with a Royal Commission. 
but they already had 20 reports before that. Talk to anybody, talk to any Australian who's had any interaction with aged care in the last 10 to 15 years, and certainly in the last nine, and they will tell you it was a disaster. So I want to say to the Australian people who, in the most recent election, voted for a range of reasons to bring to bear this Albanese Labor government, thank you for the trust that you place in us. Now, there were many people, millions of you, who voted for all sorts of reasons. But for those who voted primarily for, from their experience of aged care or for the change that they know is needed for this country for aged care, I say thank you for giving us your vote. Thank you for supporting the delivery of an Albanese Labor government. Thank you for enabling us to change the ministry to get on with the proper job of delivering for this country. And can I say we are here doing our job so that Australians can get on with their lives. That's what they expect of us. That's what you expect of us, to show up, take it seriously, listen to the truth about what's really happening in our country and respond wisely and carefully with the taxpayers' dollars that come here to look after not just the loud and strong, whose voices echo through these chambers, but the weak and vulnerable who are desperate, desperate for a government that will give them the essential care that they need. And we're doing it by bringing this bill to this place. There's been so much delay. There can be no further delay. And the sort of tinkering that you just heard from Senator Colbeck gives you a bit of a hint of some of the gains that they might want to play. Look, it's over. For those who are sitting there in opposition, you had nine years to sort it out. Don't muck around. Don't get in the way, and even in the, the consideration of business, we've got delay in attending to other matters. Australians deserve better than delay and game playing. We need to get on with the job of fixing the messes that this government is leaving behind. And there is indeed a crisis in our aged care system. Many of you would have seen the Who Cares Four Corners investigation. That was aired in 2018. 2018. Think about the suffering. Think about the grief, the loss, the suffering, the hurt, the mental health challenges, the despair of people working in aged care, of families engaged in aged care. Four years since that report on the telly that opened the eyes of all Australians to the horrifying picture that, lie, that lay behind the doors of aged care centres in Australia, where profit-taking, profit-making took precedence over care. It's hard to actually say, uh, in, at speaking to the record, the descriptions of what we saw there. Ants and maggots crawling over weeping wounds, dirty bandages that hadn't been changed in days, disgusting and putrid food being served, mistreatment, assaults, abuse. That was what was described. And because we saw it, and I congratulate the Fourth Estate, and Four Corners for putting that on the television, as confronting as it was, because this government hid the truth. This government, or the previous government, the Liberal National Party government, under those three leaders, misled the Australian people. They hid from the Australian people what their agencies knew, and they did nothing about it. And that's why this is a late clean-up of a mess, but it's the first opportunity that Labor's had to do anything about it. 
Four Corners report itself pointed out. In the responses we receive from across the country, it's clear that hurt comes in many forms, not just the horrific tales that have captured headlines, but everyday stories of neglect and inattention, of poor quality food, of a lack of personal care, boredom and heartbreaking loneliness. Now, the Royal Commission went on to even further expose the disgraceful state of the reality lived by some of our finest Australians who found themselves in aged care. Now, the interim report of the Royal Commission was a single word title, and it describes the reality that this government, this new Albanese government, it will, it will make the effort to correct. And that title of the report was Neglect. And that's what happens when a government doesn't do its job. So here we are with the legislation. We're up for the task. You trusted us. You gave us your vote. We are doing what we said we would with multiple pieces of legislation to fulfil the commitments that Labor made to the Australian people that were put into the House yesterday. And this is the first one that we're getting to debate here. And I'm very proud that it's about aged care. Because if we don't care for the aged who have given so much to our country, what sort of country are we? Not the country I know we can be, not the country that you want us to be, not the country we need to be for the people we love and care about. So this bill is going to do a range of things. And if you were here when Senator Colbeck was making his contribution, he talked about different schedules. And you know, it all sounds a bit gobbledygooky sometimes when you don't actually sit in the Senate all day and listen to it. But schedules are the bits of the bill that are going to do things. And this is what this bill is going to do. It's going to introduce a new aged care subsidy calculation because that's about money. And money is not working properly in this sector. We have to make Australian taxpayers' work, money work properly and deliver the care that is required. Currently, it's not working. We need to provide a legislative basis for a star rating system, and I'd like to say some more about that if time allows me. We are going to introduce a code of conduct because some people don't seem to know what to do. And we will have a banning order scheme. We are going to extend the serious incident response scheme to aged care delivered in home settings. And we are going to strengthen the governance of approved providers. Because too many dodgy operators got away with doing the wrong thing for way, way too long. We are going to enhance information sharing across related sectors so that information moves properly with people particularly between the health and the aged care sector. We're going to increase financial and prudential oversight. And it makes me livid when I hear uh, Liberal National Party uh, members in particular talk as if they've got everything economic sorted. They definitely haven't. The economics of this haven't worked. We need to make this system work so much better and deliver. And we're going to broaden the function of the renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority. We will also address issues with the informed consent um, arrangements in respect to the use of restrictive practices in residential aged care. And I just want to speak in the time remaining to me on a couple of these critical elements of what these schedules in the bill are going to do. Now, I've talked about the, the terrible circumstances in which too many Australians found themselves in aged care. Um, so I want to speak particularly to the establishment of a safer and more accountable system for our elderly re residents. We will not delay in doing this. That's why we've made it a first order of business, and the bill must not, must not lapse. And I urge all senators from all parties who've been elected here to get on board with Labor and get this done. It's appropriate that this bill pass as soon as possible. We're going to change um, the existing but outdated aged care funding instrument. And this will need to, this will 
create a new model of calculating how aged care subsidy is called the um, ANIC, the AANAACC, the Australian National Aged Care Classification Model, and that is set to commence on the 1st of October 2022. We're doing this as fast as we possibly can, responsibly but quickly. And with regard to some of those appalling images that still that will be with us forever for those who saw the Four Corners report. The Serious Incident Response Scheme is going to be expanded, and it will be expanded in a way that it will establish obligations for providers of home care and flexible care in community settings to report and respond to incidents and to take action to prevent those events from recurring. Now, this isn't rocket science, but the government delayed in bringing these things in. We have to close the gaps that existed previously in the system. And I'm sure, like me, you agree that accountability through all aspects of our aged care system have to be fundamental, enforced, observed and determined to bring the care back to aged care. Thank you, Thank Senator O'Neill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, President. Today, as we speak to the government's proposed uh, response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care legislation, we have before us a great opportunity to get on with fixing the problems created by the former government in aged care. We're here to amend aged care law to implement a series of urgent funding, quality and safety reforms. This includes, as we know, a number of really important recommendations made by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. That commission can only be described as an absolute picture of a national disgrace. An absolute disgrace that the former government allowed aged care in our nation to, to become, to absolutely deteriorate to the enormous detriment of the lives of thousands of older Australians depending on care, their carers, uh, both family and paid uh, in the aged care sector, and uh, the broader families and communities. I think all Australians have, over the last year or so, come into contact, in one way or another, with the significant atrocities that older Australians have been suffering at the neglectful hand of the Morrison government. So much so that the Royal Commission itself saw fit to name their final report neglect. This comes after many years of the former government's attacks and budget-to-budget -budget cuts in our aged care system. It is an approach by the Morrison government and those now in opposition. And this is part of the reason you were sent there. It was a pattern of behaviour and policy approach and lack of attention that systematically endangered and harmed older Australians. Older Australians who are the grit of building our nation. They've paid their taxes, worked hard and raised their families. The least we can do is a nation, as a nation is to offer dignity and respect in the care that people receive uh, as they move into frailer years where they need that care. No one wants to be in aged care. It's an absolute last resort. So the pressures and tensions on families to keep their loved ones at home, for partners who are also ageing to keep their partners at home, for, um, as in the case of my own family, for people who have retired and in their retirement are now caring for their very elderly parents, parents who don't want to be in aged care uh, because of this systemic neglect. 
It's worth remembering, as we discuss this legislation before us today, uh, that this Royal Commission began, began as far back as 2018 and it delivered an interim report in 2019. What you can see from this between 2019 and the final report, and it was evident in the last few years in this place, all of the horrors that were exposed by the report in 2019, which is the purpose of issuing an interim report so that governments, aged care providers, community can get on and respond and start to take action, none of those issues in the 2019 report had been addressed in the final report of the Royal Commission. It's a, a really telling reflection on the title of the final report, which was abandonment and neglect being its major themes. And so let's not forget that those over the aisle from us now presided over this neglect and abandonment. And they presided over it during the course of the COVID pandemic, when, of course, the vulnerabilities of people in aged care became even more profound. Had action been taken back in 18 and 19, when the Royal Commission was started, you know, normally governments recognise that when they're under so much attack and pressure that they need to call a Royal Commission into something, that that's the time to start actually getting on and fixing it. When things are so bad you need a Royal Commission to do something, it shouldn't be the case that you then say, well, we can't possibly act now on these very urgent issues because we need to see what the Royal Commission says. Honestly, in the case of something, uh, an issue that is live, where people are suffering harm and damage every day, the important thing to do is to get on with reforms and put a stop to them, put a stop to that harm as quickly as possible. You know, it's kind of why we here now in government, in the very first week uh, of convening ourselves under a Labor government in this parliament, have this legislation before us, because we recognise that it's urgent. The abandonment of the last government led to, be, led to people being put in really difficult situations, worse situations than they had to be. Our former Prime Minister seemed to have been banking on an exhausted collective national amnesia for his failings uh, to act on these issues in yet another term post-2019 of ignoring vulnerable Australians. The former PM, as we know, was in fact the Minister for Social Services and the Treasurer who cut $2 billion from aged care leading to this disaster. In so many areas of public policy failure that we've seen from the previous government, cuts like this were the most common weapon in a dwindling arsenal of what was a neglectful and ineffective government. But the Australian public have spoken. They've changed the government. And the message that we got, and we knew it all along because we've been fighting the government on these issues, Australians have said that the quality and safety of our aged care system is of the utmost importance. The utmost importance, which we intend to deliver on prioritising. The last government failed in its final days to bring forward any bill relating to the crisis in our aged care system. This bill does do that. 
It's more reflective of the recommendations of the Royal Commission's report. We have a bill before us um, that is already dangerously late, dangerously late in terms of responding to a damning Royal Commission, a damning Royal Commission that has implored us to increase funding to our aged care sector. But as I said, we as a Labor government have done this as urgently as possible. I recognise that the bill is largely the same as the previous government's aged care and other legislation uh, Royal Commission response bill, but significantly improved. I also note the government had ample time to introduce such measures into this place. If you look at the legislative agenda that they pursued uh, uh, during 2021, 2020, there's no reason that this agenda could not have been dealt with then. So here we are requiring a qualified registered nurse to be on site at every residential aged care home 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is absolutely critical because when you look at the uh, issues in our health system nationally as well, and state government health hospital systems are under significant pressure. We have um, ambulances ramping at hospitals. We've got um, emergency departments trying to get patients admitted, and we've got patients who've come from aged care homes inside the hospital who've needed urgent care, who are waiting in the hospital to go back to uh, their aged care service, but can't go because there is an inadequate level of supervision and care uh, from a registered nurse 24 hours. It's important to recognise that while Many people in our aged care services might be physically healthy but have dementia or other um, challenges that mean they need to be there. Others um, have physical ailments which make it difficult to be at home. And many others are this close to being in and out of hospital. But being in and out of hospital doesn't actually help them live uh, as best, as healthily and as happily as they can in an aged care facility um, because it simply doesn't, that kind of dislocation and movement doesn't support their health. What does support their health is having that access to health and aged care, a quality service and quality health supervision and support with a registered nurse inside uh, their aged care facility. The former government ignored the Royal Commission's recommendation that nursing homes should have a registered nurse on site. So the legislation before us delivers on what was Labor's election commitment to stop the rorting of home care fees by placing a cap on how much can be charged in admin, uh, administration and management fees. So these are two key platforms that Labor has uh, taken forward, that we've consulted on, we've worked with unions, we've worked with uh, people uh, who care for people in aged care, we've worked with their families, we've worked with the whole sector to ensure that we're able to deliver what are incredibly important reforms, reforms that the last government ignored and refuse to prioritise. A Labor government wants to be confident that the precious money that comes out of people's pensions, that might even come out of the equity of the family home uh, to pay for that care, is going directly to care and not to the bottom line of uh, corporate providers. These improvements, we believe, reflect in a much better way the recommendations of 
the Royal Commission. We have a new code of conduct to set high standards of behaviour for uh, providers. We're looking to improve communication between care, care and support sectors uh, so that regulators can do their job and supervise risks uh, in facilities um, and a lot more. I wanted to, I've, I've kind of uh, rattled on without getting to one of the things that I really wanted to outline today. Uh, Amina Ship has been a constituent of mine. She bravely told me her mother's story about how unqualified staff dispensed and administered drugs and shared medication soon after um, placing her mother in an aged care home. The home didn't get a doctor quickly. Uh, there was a lack of urgency in getting a doctor. She had a major fall, uh, a number of unreported falls, and her mother passed away. Those complaints had already been made to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission before her mother passed away, and nothing was done. This is why Mina has been so angry uh, at the last government, and I want to be accountable you, to Senator her Pratt, and people time like. Has expired. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, President. I rise today to also join the debate and make a contribution on the Aged Care Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. But before I do, this is my first opportunity to acknowledge our new president in uh, Senator Lyons, and I just wanted to congratulate you on your appointment. I think it is a historic moment for our party and for our chamber, and I know we are in very good hands with your leadership and stewardship of this very important institution of the Senate. This is the first piece of legislation I get an opportunity to speak on in the 47th Parliament, and I am so pleased that the first piece of legislation we are considering is on aged care. I think aged care would be one of the issues I spoke most about during the 46th Parliament, because during that time we were confronted with the absolute worst of what happens when uh, an entire part of our care economy in aged care was left in neglect and a crisis rained down upon it. The pandemic was horrific for aged care. Still, there are many, many challenges in the sector as a result of the pandemic. But it was made worse than it needed to be because of the neglect that predated that crisis, the neglect which has existed within the sector for many, many years, ignored, not dealt with, not addressed. This is our opportunity, our first opportunity, to deal with a piece of legislation in this chamber. And thank goodness we are dealing with aged care. Now, this bill is, of course, just the first step in our government's work to fix the aged care crisis. We know that that fix won't happen overnight. And, of course, not everything in this crisis can be fixed by one piece of legislation. This is a sector that has suffered under neglect for years and was downright failed by our previous government. But this piece of legislation, this bill we're debating, the fact that it's the first piece of legislation that we are debating here is a really important start. And I want to commend our new minister, Annika Wells, the member for Lilly, for her tireless work since she's been sworn in as minister to make sure that she could bring this bill to the parliament, that it was treated with the urgency that it deserves. And I wish that minister every success in what I know are her genuine and dedicated uh, focus in fixing the aged care crisis. This bill contains a number of important measures. It seeks to implement a new Australian national aged care classification funding model, replacing the outdated aged care funding instrument, offering more equitable funding, better match to providers' costs in delivering the care residents need. There will be a new star rating system that will see the Department of Health and Aged Care publish a comparison rating for all residential aged care services by the end of 22. There will be an extension to the Serious Incident Response Scheme to all in-home care providers to increase protection for older Australians from preventable incidents, abuse and neglect. 
It establishes a new code of conduct for approved providers, their workforce and governing persons, setting minimum standards of behaviour. The bill implements new provider governance and reporting arrangements to improve transparency and greater accountability. And it will improve information sharing between the aged care, disability support and veterans care sectors to harmonise uh, the regulation of care. De President, this bill, at its core, is about restoring dignity, care, accountability and humanity back into aged care. And this is where we must start. This is where we rightfully start. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's interim report was called Neglect. It found that the Australian aged care system had failed to meet the needs of its older and vulnerable citizens. It found that this system didn't deliver uniformly safe and quality care, that there was unkindness, a lack of caring towards older people and, in too many instances, neglect of our older Australians. It found systemic problems in the aged care system that require urgent, fundamental reform and redesign. The final report, which gave the recommendations that this bill is based on and, and seeks to, to start addressing and implementing, stated that the aged care system has been under prolonged stretch and has reached crisis point. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic only extended that. It made things worse. It added an unprecedented pressure to a system already buckling under strain. Aged care was in crisis. It still is in crisis. It was a poor system before the pandemic, with the pandemic only weakening it further. Over the last decade, we've seen 23 reports, inquiries, studies, committee reports, and then the Royal Commission. The story never changed. It's not like one of these reports was the, was the standout moment where we said, oh gosh, there's a problem here. All of these reports told us the same thing. All of these reports were pointing to the crisis unfolding before us. A crisis which we have seen amplified and worsen over recent years. I am so proud to be part of a government not afraid to confront this crisis head on. I sat in this chamber many times during the 46th parliament as we had debates around wording and semantics and the government defending the use of particular words, not debates on the substance of what was happening in aged care, not debates on substantive pieces of legislation that the government was bringing before this chamber, which would enable us to get the big process of reform started. Political debates, like so many things in the Morrison government, Aged care was turned into a political football. It was, about, it was about defending on their failures, deflecting on their failures, rather than getting to the work which needed to be done. Now, I don't pretend the work ahead is easy. I don't think anyone in this chamber would pretend that the work is easy. It's going to be really hard to fix this crisis. But I hope we can all agree that it matters, that it's urgent, and I hope in the Prime Minister's spirit of a better parliament, we can work together to get this done. This matters for South Australians, for my constituents, the people I represent. South Australians like Nolene Helsler, who has been fighting for reform since 2015, when a camera she had hidden in her father's aged care facility revealed horrific abuse. It was a sight no daughter should ever have to see of her beloved father. In her evidence to the Royal Commission, Nolene spoke of her shock when she saw the visual images her heart racing, her hands shaking. What a dreadful thing. What a dreadful thing to witness of someone you love. For Nolene, for everyone who gave evidence to that Royal Commission, I am sure there would have been hope at the end. Hope that by giving that evidence, by sharing those painful stories, that fear, that sadness, of what happened to the people they loved, that change would come. And the slowness of that change has failed them. It's let them down. They bravely told their stories and they've been let down. Of course, this South Australian family wasn't alone. We heard countless stories which would shake any reasonable person to their core. We heard from carers who told of the pressure they felt to spend little time with their residents, choosing between supporting residents most at risk leaving some residents behind who they wanted to give care for but couldn't. Ad hoc care, 
staff at breaking point stretched to the limit, residents and families who felt abandoned and let down by the places they entrusted to care for people they loved. What a heartbreaking thing. You send the person you love into care, hoping that that's what they will receive. And instead of care, instead of compassion and kindness, your loved one gets failed in the most horrific way. So many South Australians have been let down by a system in crisis, a system reeling under extreme strain. They're feeling this. I know I speak to, I speak to them all the time, not just the, the residents in aged care who I've had the privilege to visit, but the workforce trying to support them and care for them. Workers like Donna, an aged care worker in Adelaide who absolutely loves her job. She loves the people she cares for. She loves the people she works with. But she's under an extraordinary amount of pressure because this system is in crisis. I've spoken to another young aged care worker in Adelaide who stumbled into aged care by accident and fell in love with the sector, fell in love with caring people, fell in love with what the nurses were doing and, and how to show tenderness and kindness to people in need. Loved it so much that she's now studying health at university, wanting to give back in a healthcare setting. And she would love to go to aged care again, but she just cannot bring herself to do it because the conditions of her work, the strain that that sector is under, means she just doesn't feel like she's up to returning to that sector. This is a young person who could make a tremendous difference but whose contribution has been lost because the system has failed so many. I've spoken to workers in Adelaide East just a few months ago, working really hard every day to support their residents, but they couldn't give them the attention they deserved. A nurse in regional South Australia spoke of the difficulty in accessing an RN. It wasn't always one on site, something we're going to fix. And how that hurt when there wasn't that care for residents when they were in need. And I've heard from residents who love their, love their support workers, the people in their clinics, caring for them, providing entertainment for them, activities, cooking for them, absolutely adore the workers in aged care. But who can see the struggle this workforce is under as well? Who want, who, who want relief for the people who care for them? All of these South Australian stories stay with me every day. The stories of dedication, compassion, the stories, sadly, of abuse and of neglect. They, they stay with me and they come in here into this chamber and they're the stories I think about when we debate legislation like this. And that's what this legislation is seeking to do, to put security, dignity, quality and humanity back into aged care, to do better by these South Australians. It builds on our our broader plans for aged care, our serious plans for aged care. We made it a centre of our election commitments because we know how much it matters to every single Australian, not just those with loved ones in aged care. If each of us are lucky enough to get old, many of us will find ourselves in aged care. Many of us will find ourselves making really difficult decisions about care for people we love. We need to fix this. We need to fix this urgently. Our policies will ensure qualified nurses are on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, increasing the pipeline of registered nurses into aged care facilities. Importantly, helping clear so many unnecessary trips to emergency departments, a particular issue in regional areas. We want to see a real pay increase for workers, a boost in workforce numbers, more training places, university places to support and grow and build that workforce and, importantly, a mandated average of 215 minutes of care being given to those in aged care. These are really important measures. There are measures which will change the face of aged care. This bill is a really important first step. It's not every step. We won't pass this piece of legislation and see a dramatic turnaround with what's happening in aged care. But the dedication of this government, the fact that this is the first, the first piece of legislation we are dealing with, I think is testament 
to how seriously Minister Butler, Minister Wells and, of course, our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, take this crisis and their role in tackling it. That's something we didn't see in this parliament. And I don't think any of us could really honestly reflect on the way aged care was treated in this last parliament with any sense of pride. This is our moment to get the real piece of reform done, to do the hard work, the scary things, to not let people down, not let down our elderly, our older Australians who have done so much for our nation, who have built our nation and are in aged care, who need the support of this chamber, of this Senate, of our government. It's our opportunity to say to those workers who have been through so much, particularly during the pandemic, to say we value you and we're going to try and get this fixed. This is about not letting down Australians. Australians who have been horrified by what's happening in aged care and, dare I say, many of whom feel scared about what their future looks like if we don't fix this crisis. I am proud to be a part of this work and I am proud of my government for not being afraid to confront the enormity of it. I look forward to the support of this chamber. Let the 47th parliament be better in the way we deal with aged care. Let us be the parliament that fixes this crisis, that restores dignity, humanity and care for those Australians who so desperately need it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, look, I rise as well to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment. Royal Commission Response Bill No. 2. Um, look, I, I appreciate uh, where Senator Smith was coming from. I share Senator Smith's absolute admiration for our aged care workforce and her heartfelt um, sympathy with the families of, of aged care residents who have been mistreated um, and for, for the gaps that have been created uh, over time. But I do not accept the premise that it was the former coalition government's fault. I also don't accept the premise that the former coalition government failed in aged care, nor, uh, as Senator Smith declared, that we treated aged care as a political football. Indeed, it was the former coalition government who initiated the Royal Commission uh, that then made 120-odd uh, recommendations, to which the former coalition government diligently reviewed diligently went through and prepared a response, um, a response to, including accepting wholly or in part 135 of the recommendations. Sorry, there was 142 recommendations. 126 uh, were accepted in principle. Uh, we had 12 subject to further consideration or noted. Um, and four noted as supporting an alternative approach. Only six recommendations were not accepted. It was also the former coalition government who worked hard to ensure that the budget for aged care was extended and extra funds were provided. And it was the former coalition government who basically drafted this legislation that we are being presented with today. Certainly declaring that it was our government who treated it as a political football completely ignores the fact that Mr Albanese was happy to let aged care providers and older Australians remain in a state of complete uncertainty, a state of limbo, for six months just so he could play political games, delaying the implementation of many of the important recommendations of the Royal Commission, which are contained in this bill that we are debating today. Now that he's in government, Mr Albanese's realised that these reforms need to be pursued. And now he's trying to push them through when they could have been passed in April. 
by playing politics with older Australians for six months and by not facilitating the passage of this bill in the last parliament, Mr Albanese delayed significant and time-critical legislation purely for political gain, purely so we can stand here today and listen to Senator Polly, Polly say that former Minister Senator Colbeck was an abject failure, Senator Smith say that our former coalition government treated aged care with, as a political football, completely denying all of the steps that the former coalition government actually did do to address aged care issues, even prior to the final Royal Commission report. I mean, let's not ignore the fact that uh, in 2012-13, under the former Labor government, the previous Labor government, there was only just over 60,000 home care packages available in the aged care sector. By the time of the last election, this had increased to 275,597 aged care home aged care packages, and we all know that many of our older people would much rather stay at home than go to a residential facility. And if we can keep them at home, keep their dignity, and make sure they are looked over after, they tend to have a much uh, more positive experience. We also made sure that in February we recognised the um, significant contribution our aged care workforce had made, particularly during the COVID pandemic. In February we announced a workforce bonus of up to $800 for all eligible aged care workers. And it was estimated that about 265,000 workers benefited from that. <clears throat> Our government certainly did not treat aged care as a political football. Our government was absolutely committed to delivering on the Royal Commission. And as we look at this legislation today, which forms the second step on what we had developed, which was a five-year implementation plan underpinned by five pillars, the home care packages that I've just discussed, residential aged care services and sustainability, looking to improve and simplify residential aged care services and access. And that's essentially what this bill helps to deliver on today. And then we also wanted to look at residential aged care quality and safety, so I will be looking with interest at what the new government does in those areas, as well as supporting the workforce, growing a better skilled care workforce. Because for all of what Senator Smith said before about supporting the workforce and needing to recognise their contribution and needing to give them uh, better pay and conditions, that's not in today's bill. So we shouldn't. Uh, pretend that we're delivering those outcomes when it's not actually in today's bill. And we also need stronger governance in the aged care sector, some of which is in this bill uh, and some of which needs further work. And I, uh, I hope that the new government will work with the opposition to ensure that aged care is not treated at a, as a partisan football as it was in the past, as it was as we saw the six-month delay by the, uh, Mr Albanese in opposition, but now he's in government, we will not stand in the way of this bill because we're not going to play those same games. We're not going to turn it back into a partisan football. This legislation is basically just a revised version of our legislation that we introduced um, nearly six months ago. There, there are only really two key changes from the original version of the bill um, that we introduced, and the key one of which is the removal of the aged care workers' screening regulation and also the removal of the enshrining of the star rating system 
in leg legislation. The key change about the removal of the workers' screening regulations uh, sought that, that clause sought to establish a nationally consistent pre-employment screening for aged care workers. Now, that pre-employment screening was not to, to uh, as has been claimed, to be a punishment. It was actually about protecting aged care residents, providing consistency and establishing a good baseline. It was actually an important um, arrangement in response to part to Recommendation 77 of the Royal Commission, and it prevented unsuitable workers from entering or remaining in the aged care sector. So we, in opposition, will be keeping a very close eye on what further reforms come forward to ensure that this recommendation, this key recommendation to prevent poor conduct in the sector, and to protect residents, we will be watching very closely to see what is brought forward, because it's our view that um, by removing the worker screening regulations, the government has basically acquiesced to the unions. They've capitulated to the unions, um, and we we would actually call on the government and say, stand up to the unions, implement good policies that protect both the residents and the workforce and allows a nationally consistent database to be established for all care workers so that it gives our residents our aged care communities you know those that we care for in their twilight years gives them certainty that they are being looked after by the best i also just while i have uh, the call i do want to um, express my dismay that the government has ceased the availability of free rapid antigen tests for aged care homes uh, during COVID at a time that is it, the timing is absolutely remarkable. When the COVID pandemic first hit and we did see significant outbreaks in aged care facilities. Um, and unfortunately we we saw some untimely uh, deaths in those facilities. However, when you look at the numbers of what's going on now, now that we're not in the peak of COVID hysteria, now that COVID has almost become endemic and, and people are treating it as part of their day-to-day -day lives, the number of deaths we're seeing in aged care facilities due to linked to COVID are higher than they were during the first and the second wave. In fact, um, according to the Australian government website uh, on the Department of Health and Aged Care, um, my calculations are there, there's been 883 ex deaths in aged care facilities um, between May, just prior to the election, and uh, as at the 22nd of July. 883. And yet, free rapid antigen testing has been ceased. Um, there's currently over a thousand active outbreaks of COVID in aged care facilities across the nation. You know that is a higher number than ever saw in the first and second waves. And from this opposition. They absolutely tried to crucify the coalition government of the time for perceived failures in rolling out um, personal protective equipment, in rolling out vaccinations, in rolling out rapid antigen tests. And yet it is now in government that they see fit to cancel rapid antigen tests for aged care facilities right when deaths are higher than they've ever been, right when active cases in aged care facilities are higher than they've ever been. So where is the consistency with what the government said in opposition 
and what they are actually implementing in government. Uh, I'm, I, it, it beggars belief. But ultimately, the opposition will not play games with this uh, legislation. We will be supporting for the health and the safety and the well-being of our older Australians. We will not delay the time-critical legislation just to play games, as was done by the opposition. And we implore the Albanese government to continue our generational reform of the aged care system for the benefit of all residents. I do commend this bill to the House. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Chisholm. Mr Acting De Deputy President, and uh, this is the first time I've had uh, first chance I've had to talk in the chamber following uh, the election result and the sitting of the new parliament. And nothing brings home the responsibility more for what uh, my party confronts now that we are in government than fixing the crisis that we were left in aged care. So it is, I think, fitting that this is the first bit of legislation that we have before us in the Senate. Um, I also uh, reinforces for me the challenge that uh, we face as a government and the faith that the Australian people have be, uh, put in us to do that, and also the people who are responsible for that. So, uh, the member for Lilly happens to be my local member and has taken on the responsibility as minister in this area. And it's an important job. It's one that I'm more than confident she is up to, and it's one where. She has started so well, and I get the sense of uh, the travel that she has done, the consultation that she has undertaken, um, has all been of an urgent nature. Uh, but it is the work that is required to get legislation like this right, uh, and it is important legislation uh, that we are talking about today. Uh, <clears throat> I do note the, the contribution from some of those opposite and the, the former minister, uh, where. They're trying to recreate the history around why a royal commission was called into aged care and trying to take credit for it and saying it was one of the things that only they were able to do. Well, it's important we don't lose sight of what the motivations were behind the former Prime Minister when he called that royal commission. And if you go back in time, it was actually not long after uh, former Prime Minister Morrison. Uh, rolled Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister, and he called a royal commission. And it was one of the first moves that we see from Scotty for marketing that we became used to. He called this royal commission not because he wanted to fix the aged care crisis. All he wanted to do was move it beyond that election cycle, which was due in about six months' time. So what did he do? He called a royal commission, not because he wanted to fix the challenges, but because he wanted to avoid taking responsibility before the 2019 election. That was his motivation in that. And we saw it, it became a theme for the former Prime Minister that was obviously one that cost them at the election. But it was the first sign of someone who wanted to avoid responsibility, uh, who didn't want to uh, take on the job as Prime Minister and actually do the hard work of reform that was needed. And we saw that aged care was in crisis um, before 2019, but it was really laid bare how bad it was and what a significant crisis it was when COVID hit and the devastation that we saw in many parts of the country um, with residents in aged care and the lack of the ability of those uh, policies to respond to ensure that uh, those uh, elderly Australians who were in those residents were treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. And I think you, there's a lot of contrast between the current government and the former government um, about the agenda for the Albanese Labor government and what we want to deliver on, uh, how we acknowledge the challenges that we're facing, whether it be aged care, uh, whether it be the economy that we're seeing uh, from the Treasury in the other place right now, that we're being upfront with the Australian people. We're actually saying the challenges that we are confronting and what steps we are taking to fix these problems. And it's just a real stark contrast between Minister Wells and what we saw from former Minister Colbeck 
uh, in regards to his performance uh, in question time uh, in the previous parliament, where he would try and give this air of confidence that everything's under control and we're dealing with it and you know, we're doing these things and it's all going to be okay, when the reality on the ground was different. And we all got received correspondence in our offices or dealt with people, I'm sure, um, who would be able to tell you their heartfelt stories of what they were confronting for an elderly relative or a friend who they cared for so deeply. Yet the contrast with the current minister is someone who uh, has acknowledged that there is a crisis in aged care, has said the steps that need to be taken to fix it, has been out there in aged care homes every week uh, since the minister was appointed and outlined a clear reform agenda, um, building on what we took to the election, uh, but also responding to the immediate impacts of what the nation is confronting with COVID at the same time, uh, and particularly in nursing homes. So uh, we know the 23 reports, we know the Royal Commission, uh, but we see the stark difference in government now with a minister, a uh, prime minister and a government that actually are, are taking on the challenge in aged care uh, and doing the things that are necessary uh, to ensure that we can provide the long-term reform to ensure that the aged care system is one that Australians can be proud of, but also those Australians who have relatives or friends in aged care can know that there is a robust system that is going to look after those people. So the Aged Care Royal Commission response bill um, that the government is introducing uh, is to respond to the decade of neglect under the previous government. Uh, they had failed to implement all the recommendations of the Royal Commission uh, that was titled Neglect. As Minister Wells said in the other place yesterday, there has been 23 reports, inquiries, studies, committee reports and a Royal Commission which all told us consistently the same thing. There has been a decade of inaction for a system that is in crisis, one that needed support and one that received nothing from the previous government. The bill shows the priority of this government is to act on aged care. It was something that the Prime Minister had talked about consistently uh, for the term of the last opposition, but also something that was a focus point for the now government during the election campaign. And we are delivering on our promise to the Australian people to treat older Australians with the respect that they deserve. Uh, we know the role that older Australians have played in building this country, uh, working hard to contribute to society, and they deserve that dignity and respect as they get later in life. For many years, the previous government showed that reforming and fixing aged care was not the highest priority that it should be. Uh, you only need to look at the performance of the former minister and when you compare that to what we are seeing from the current Albanese Labor government, uh, the contrast could not be more stark. During the campaign, uh, I met with aged care workers and workers in aged care uh, through parts of regional Queensland, and they told me firsthand the significant challenges in the sector and what years of lack of support has meant to them, uh, what it meant for people who are living in those facilities, and those workers, and I was happy to convey this as a senator for Queensland, um, thanking them for the work that they had been doing. And some of those workers I met with have been doing it for decades, uh, people who were really committed to the care of elderly Australians. So this bill will implement a series of urgent funding, quality and safety measures, measures many of which were recommended by the Royal Commission. The legislation will introduce several key measures that will ensure older Australians are protected, uh, measures that have been delayed for too long under the previous government, uh, and that includes the Serious Incident, incident Response Scheme, uh, which will be expanded to establish obligations uh, on approved providers of home care and flexible care in a community setting to report and respond to incidents and to take action to prevent incidents from reoccurring. A new code of conduct will set high standards for, of behaviour for aged care workers, approved providers and governing persons of approved providers to ensure they are delivering aged care in a way that is safe, competent and respectful. 
Improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators will enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm. An interim solution for the provision of consent to the use of restrictive practices will also be established while state and territory consent arrangements are reconsidered. The bill will also increase the transparency and accountability uh, for providers as well. Um, so the legislation has the important support of many organisations in the sector. Uh, the Council of the Ageing said that these bills are crucial steps in a reform process that, when fully implemented, will ensure Australia will finally enjoy the quality aged care system all older Australians deserve, and to have them introduced today is testament to the fact that the aged care minister has strongly supported by health and aged care minister Butler has hit the ground running in her new portfolio. The Health Services Union said that our industry will not be fixed overnight and will require significantly greater resources. But we are confident Minister Wells is headed in the right direction. For too long, the aged care system has exploited the time and goodwill of an underpaid, insecurely employed workforce largely made up of women. For the first time, there is a crack of light at the end of the tunnel. Catholic Health Australia said the legislation introduced today really fires the starting gun on reform. This is long overdue, and our members welcome the fact that the Albanese Labor government is serious about improving care for the elderly Australians. And Opal Healthcare said, we are delighted to see the new bill will enshrine mandated standards for all aged care providers, including the requirement for all care communities across Australia to have a registered nurse on duty 24 hours a day. The legislation that's something, by the way, the former minister um, took umbrage with and was one of the reasons why this legislation has been delayed because of an amendment that the uh, previous Labor opposition was able to get passed in the Senate requiring that, which is why they delayed actually passing this legislation um, in the previous parliament. So this legislation is an important first step in turning around the neglect that we have seen over the last 10 years. Uh, Anthony Albanese as Prime Minister is committed to it. And I'm confident that the abilities of Minister Wells to take the steps necessary so that all Australians can retire in dignity and comfort, uh, which is what they deserve. Uh, this is an important part of the incoming government's agenda. Uh, it's something where uh, we made a series of promises on, uh, and it's something that uh, we are absolutely committed to delivering on, and I expect that the Australian people will be holding us to account on. Uh, the performance of the previous minister and the fact that um, he is still trying to uh, create this myth about the role that he played previously, whether it be the Royal Commission, as I highlighted at the start, uh, but also his attack um, during his speech just then on uh, the treatment of Aboriginal community-controlled organisations as part of this legisla legislation was quite disgraceful. Uh, for him to try and suggest that this is going to result, that these changes are going to result in a lower standard of care for elderly Aboriginal Australians is a disgraceful thing for him to say in this parliament. Um, a key part of closing the gap um, that this government, previous government paid lip service to is actually about ensuring that those Aboriginal controlled organisations actually take the responsibility for improving those standards themselves. Um, whether it be health or community sector or, or whether, it, whether it be in aged care. So for him to try and allude that this is going to result in some way standard slipping uh, is a disgraceful thing for the minister, given his status, to actually do. Um, so I just wanted to ensure that that was on the record uh, and not let this myth be created, um, like they are trying to do on royal commissions, um, like they are trying to do on other things, um, that this isn't something that, uh, that we haven't thought of. Um, but also ensuring that we have confidence in uh, those community organisations to do the right thing by their communities, which is exactly what this government is about. Thank you, Senator. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022 and take this opportunity to commend uh, Minister Wells for bringing this uh, to the Senate, to the House, uh, showing the priority that we place 
not only on all of our election commitments, uh, which we uh, will be pushing forward over this term of the uh, parli parliamentary cycle, but to show the priority we place on our elders. We talk about our children as being vulnerable and we know we must look after them, but we also have to look after our elders. Certainly in uh, First Nations way of life, our elders are critical and we saw throughout the pandemic uh, the fear uh, that uh, most Australians felt, but in particular elderly Australians, and who still feel it today uh, because the pandemic is not over. We are living with this pandemic and it is our elders who are incredibly vulnerable. I visited uh, Nullanboy recently uh, in northeast Arnhem Land and had the opportunity to uh, work with some of the Yolngu elders there and seek their advice and their wisdom as to what we need to do in terms of our aged care and, and in terms of caring for our elders. And it, and it was wonderful to be able to spend some time uh, with the organisation that we were able to see the, the launch of, really, in North East Arnhem Land called the Carers NT and the Jakami facility in Eastern Arnhem Land. And Jakami means to care in the Yolngu language, and it's certainly a fitting name for this initiative. And the work of Carers NT at Jakami supports both NDIS disability participants and aged care clients to be supported on country in Nullumboy. And they employ local people who bring their language, culture and connection. It's an opportunity also for respite, uh, for the elders there to, to be able to have a place that's safe, but for their families and carers to know that they have some time uh, to leave their loved ones with people that they trust. Many elderly Territorians have died hundreds of kilometres away from their community, away from their homelands, their country and their families. And I say this from a very realistic point of view, that the geography of places like the Northern Territory and indeed uh, places across Northern Australia and Western Australia, uh, where we are such a great big country, and First Nations people largely want to live connected closely to their country and sometimes those hospital services, sometimes those aged care services, indeed most uh, government services are not as close as we would think they could be uh, in places like uh, uh, Darwin itself and Alice Springs. So most people travel uh, where they have to for the, for the care that they require. So for good, dignified aged care depends on listening to elderly Australians on what they want, no matter where they are in the country, and this is what good, dignified care looks like. It changes lives. Uh, if we can see great care provided in a remote part of the Northern Territory like Nullanboy with this particular service, we can and should see it done elsewhere. And I just highlight, uh, you know, as, as Assistant Minister for Indigenous Health, uh, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Service uh, Quality and Safety recommended to the government that to ensure that the new aged care system makes specific and adequate provision for the diverse and changing needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I'm incredibly pleased uh, to highlight here to the Senate that the Australian government is investing $106 million to provide face-to-face -face support for older First Nations people and $115 million to build culturally safe aged care facilities. So when I met with elders in North East Arnhem Land and with uh, the Jakamui, it is a not-for-profit community-based organisation uh, dedicated to improving the lives of family carers living in that part of the country. So we know that through this particular bill and the Albanese Labor government's commitment crosses a broad section uh, in terms of seeing uh, the aged care sector across Australia improve quite dramatically. And I just want to go through some of those points. And one of the things that I know has really, really raised the hopes of many families is the fact that we want to increase the average minimum care time per resident per day 
and introduce a mandate that requires all residential aged care facilities to have a registered nurse on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this will deliver, Mr Acting Deputy President, on the government's election commitment to put more nurses back into nursing homes, giving carers, the loved ones who care for their loved ones and their elders, more time to care. So from July 2023, our government is mandating the requirement for a registered nurse to be on site at all times, and this commitment directly responds to Recommendation 86.5 of the Royal Commission and will be delivered one year earlier than what was recommended. Aged care is everyone's business, Mr Acting Deputy President. This piece of legislation promises much of what we took to the election, and we know that that critical need is one that we've recognised has been ignored and neglected for way too long. And this was evident in the out-of-sight and out-of-mind reports that we've seen previously in the previous term. The new Australian National Aged Care Classification ANACC's funding model will replace the outdated aged care funding instrument in October offering more equitable funding that is better matched to pro providers' costs in delivering the care residents need. And aged care providers shouldn't be expected to walk alone, and our government is committed to supporting them appropriately. The star rating system will see the Department of Health and Aged Care publish a comparison rating for all residential aged care services. And this will support older Australians, their loved ones and their representatives to be able to compare services and to be able to make more informed choices about their aged care. And that's important. Why should we think that as you grow older that you have less choice and less ability to make decisions about the kind of care you want? And we've recognised, Mr Acting Deputy President, that this is pivotal to the dignity and care not only for our elders but also for the families who look after them and the general carers who are part of that network. Reforms will also see the extension of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to all in-home care providers, meaning increased protection for older Australians from preventable incidents, abuse and neglect. I, like many of you here and certainly many Australians, were horrified by the heartbreaking stories of abuse and neglect coming out of the aged care settings. For too long, there were no mandatory incident reporting requirements for providers of home care or flexible care delivered in a home and community setting, which meant that there was no oversight of allegations of abuse and neglect of older Australians receiving care in their own home. And how tragic is that, to be in your own home and to experience that neglect and abuse and be able to do nothing about it? This change is absolutely overdue, and it's critical we denounce abuse and neglect and not simply leave it out of sight and out of mind. I'm also pleased to see, Mr Acting Deputy President, the introduction of a new code of conduct for approved providers their workforce and governing persons, setting minimum standards of behaviour to ensure older Australians receive care in a safe, competent and respectful manner. New provider governance and reporting arrangements, due to begin at the end of this year, will improve transparency and greater accountability on providers to better focus on the needs of older Australians receiving care. First steps will also be taken towards harmonising regulation of care and support providers across the aged care, disability support and veterans care sectors by improving information sharing between the bodies that regulate these sectors. I not only commend Minister Wells, I also commend Minister Butler and the Prime Minister for this swift action to work on fixing this system. The status quo of neglect over the past decade simply has not been good enough. And I also commend 
all of those, elderly Australians, their carers and the workers who provided their stories and conveyed the reality of aged care in this country to the Royal Commission. These changes, among many others, will build on our promise to deliver security, dignity, quality and humanity in care for every older Australian across the aged care system. Mr Acting Deputy President, in my portfolio areas of uh, Minister Assisting in Indigenous Health, uh, I'm also very conscious, as we talk about the aged care sector, and I know there's uh, previous speakers who spoke, spoke about First Nations uh, organisations and Aboriginal health sectors, I do want to point out uh, that one of the priority, priority areas that I will focus on as well, which captures the aged care sector, is those patients who are on renal dialysis. Uh, we have a significant number of the First Nations population receiving dialysis, most of whom, uh, but not all, some of them are quite young, but many of whom are in uh, the aged care sector requiring extra need and support. Uh, now, I can speak from experience in the, in the Northern Territory, where families leave their community to go for renal dialysis uh, in Alice Springs, in Tennant Creek, in Catherine, uh, in Darwin. Some of them receive that care uh, on country, uh, at home. And it, that combined with the need to be able to have a reliable and supportive aged care nursing home nearby is also absolutely essential uh, for those clients uh, in particular, because renal disease is one of the greatest diseases that does impact uh, First Nations people in our regional remote areas of Australia uh, in particular, and highlighted by those geographical distances, the need to have access to clean water and reliable water supply for the dialysis machines but also to be able to have resources uh, in, on country uh, should people want to stay there for their care. And these are questions that I ask as I travel around Australia uh, talking about health and First Nations health and access as we look at this from the perspective of what kind of care do our elders require. So I'm enormously uh, pleased that our government has brought this bill forward. Uh, I will certainly be following very closely um, the significant policy announcements that we've made in relation to aged care and in the health sector generally, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Oh, uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Van. <clears throat> thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The coalition is committed to ensuring the government sticks to their election promises and their supposed commitment to aged care, because so far their performance towards aged care has been woeful. COVID is rampant in the aged care community and they don't have the slightest idea what to do about it. Almost 5,000 Australians have passed away from COVID-19 since the 31st of May 2022. And as of 22 July 2022, there were 9,537 active COVID-19 cases and 1,013 active outbreaks in residential aged care facilities across Australia. Worse, there have been 2,187 reported deaths in 2022 in aged care facilities. And what is this government doing about it? Nothing. For the entirety of the pandemic, while this government was in opposition, they mischaracterised the coalition's performance on aged care. And now, when they have the opportunity, and indeed the duty, to act on their words, they're doing absolutely nothing. Senator Gallagher, on the 8th of February, said in this chamber, and I quote, there are problems in aged care where the situation is so dire, with thousands infected with COVID, hundreds dying and staff not able to perform their jobs. What is she saying now? On that same day, Senator Watt, who was vocal 
almost every day and picking on our minister at the time, said that an aged care facility was in complete meltdown, with the deaths, of COVID, uh, deaths from COVID of 15 aged care residents and 182 residents and staff testing positive for COVID. Now, they're a lot lower than the numbers that we're seeing right now in aged care. And what's this government doing? What are they doing? Now, I could go on and on and pull out many, probably hundreds if not thousands, of transcripts out of Hansard from the previous years and find pretty much any one of the Labor senators over there commenting on how bad the COVID outbreak was and how more needed to be done. However, the matter of the fact is there are currently more cases, more deaths and more outbreaks in aged care facilities than ever before. And the silence coming from the Labor Party is deafening. The Prime Minister is silent. The Health Minister is silent. The Aged Care Minister is silent. In fact, the whole Labor Party is silent because they're embarrassed. Now that they actually have to try and solve the problem, all they can come up with is silence and hope that no one notices. Instead of acting on their promises of registered nurses on site, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, more carers with more time to care, a pay rise for aged care workers, better food for residents and dollars going to aged care, they are delivering a revised version of the previous coalition government's legislation, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2021, which, of course, as, an, as opposition, we support. The health, safety and well-being of senior Australians is of the utmost importance to the coalition, and we are committed to ensuring that our, generation, that our generational changes of the aged care system continues on from the 46th parliament into the 47th parliament. However, it is astounding that after all their talk in opposition, the nine years that they had, in, they had to work on legislation and all the promises they made coming into the election, their first move is to introduce a bill developed by the coalition. Good on you guys, but I don't blame them because our record on aged care was excellent. And if they want good ideas, they only have to look at what the coalition achieved and how we responded to the problems that were occurring in the aged care sector at the time. When we were in government, our formal response to the Royal Commission's final report was to accept or accept in principle 126 of the 148 recommendations. This is because we listened to the experiences of the Australians who gave evidence to the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety and took decisive action to implement the recommendations with the reforms to deliver vital services, improve quality, care and viability of the aged care sector. In the 22-23 budget, we delivered funding for aged care reform of $522 million, and that built on the funding of $18.3 billion committed in the 2021-22 budget and the 2021-2022 MIEFO. This brought the total investment by the coalition in response to the final report of the Royal Commission to more than 19 $1 billion. As I mentioned before, this legislation is a revised version of the previous coalition's legislation, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2021, which makes you wonder, if the government now supports this, why they delayed the passage of this bill for six months while in opposition? And I think you can pretty much guess the answer, because there is only one answer. That government was willing to play politics in opposition at the expense of our elderly Australians solely for political gain, which, personally, 
I find absolutely disgusting. When we were in government, we outlined clearly the importance of this legislation, and the Labor Party clearly now agrees with us, seeing as this bill is before us today. The government should be absolutely ashamed of themselves at their conduct. By delaying the passage of this bill by six months and then backflipping on their position, which, as we know, they could do at Commonwealth or probably Olympic level these days, they're by backflipping on their position to introduce it as soon as they are in government shows that they are more concerned with political gain than with improving the lives of elderly Australians. Collectively, this legislation forms a second step in the previous coalition government's five-year reform agenda through the five reform pillars. Home care, residential aged care services and sustainability, residential aged care quality and safety, workforce and governance. However, a key change from the original bill progressed in 46 Parliament is the removal of the workers' screening regulations contained in Schedule 2, which sought to establish nationally consistent pre-employment screening for aged care workers. These were important new regulatory arrangements that responded in part to recommendation 77 of the Royal Commission and prevented and were designed to prevent unsuitable workers from entering or remaining in the aged care sector. So it is disappointing at the very least to say that they have now decided to remove this from the bill. Why would you remove those protections for our elderly? The coalition is still committed to supporting the Australians as they age, ensuring that they receive the dignity and the respect that they deserve in their later years of life. So we will support this bill. But unlike those opposite, we will not toy with the lives of elderly Australians simply for political gain. We will, however, continue to keep an eye on the government to ensure that they are acting in the best interests of elderly Australians and to ensure that they continue the coalition's work of delivering the reforms that are so needed as outlined in the Royal Commission. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment and the Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. I'd be, like to begin by commending the new government on the important uh, decisions that have been made in bringing forward this bill, particularly the Minister for Aged Care, Annika Wells. For bringing this bill forward as a matter of urgency so early, so early in the government's um, uh, new elected uh, period. Now, the former government was handed the re final report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety in February 2021. That's almost 18 months ago. The former government, in fact, almost three years ago since the Royal Commission's interim report was tabled. Now, that doesn't sound like it's a matter of urgency for the former government, regardless of what Senator Van just put to the Senate and to the Australian people. Because the title of the report summed up the state of the industry in just one word all those 18 months ago. That this previous government failed to act on neglect. The neglect exposed by the Royal Commission's included residents left languishing with maggots crawling in infected wounds. It took them 18 months to still not respond. Residents left sitting or lying in their own faeces. That wasn't enough to get them to do anything in 18 months. Dreadful food, hydration and oral health, leading to widespread malnutrition and excruciating dental pain. They still did nothing for 18 months. Widespread use of physical restraints and sedatives on residents, not for their safety, but to make them easier to manage, and they did nothing in 18 months. And 4,013 4, allegations of physical sexual assault of aged care residents in just one year and they could still do nothing 
for 18 months. The Royal Commission made 148 recommendations. The sheer volume and breadth of recommendations is reflective of how bad things were allowed to get. It demonstrates how urgently the reforms in this bill are required. This bill will improve the health, safety and well-being of older Australians. Schedule 1 provides for the Australian National Aged Care Classification model for calculating aged care subsidies. Schedule 2 facilitates the publication of star ratings, which will enable senior Australians and their families to make informed decisions about their aged care. Schedule 3 introduces a code of conduct for the aged care sector. Schedule 4 extends a serious incident response scheme to approved providers of home care and flexible care. Schedule 5 strengthens the governance of approved providers. Schedule 6 facilitates increased information sharing between care and support sector regulators. Schedule 7 of the bill will increase financial and prudential oversight in respect of refundable accommodation deposits and bonds. Schedule 8 of this bill expands the functions of a renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority. And Schedule 9 enables an interim solution with respect to the requirement to obtain informed consent for the use of restrictive practices. The content of this bill clearly demonstrates that under this new government, aged care is finally an urgent priority. Of course, there's another aged care bill making its way through the House currently, which legislates Labor's commitment to 24-7 hour nurses in aged care homes, a Royal Commission recommendation that was ignored by the last government. That bill will also enable the government to cap the fees charged by home care providers. Among other important reforms that I look forward to debating next week. So again, I commend the urgency with which this government and the minister has acted to bring forward critical reforms. After 18 months of inaction and delay, we finally have decisive action for our older Australians. And of course, there is also much more to be done. I'm speaking particularly about the conditions suffered by aged care workers. The former government has allowed a situation where aged care workers are second-class citizens, a situation where I'm certain they would never want a member of their family working in the conditions experienced by aged care workers. Through the Select Committee on Job Security, I heard firsthand from aged care workers across Australia about these very issues. There is the inadequate time and resources that staff had adequately to care for each resident. Anu Singh, an aged care worker in Melbourne, said, The worst thing that I've gone through is that the workplace where I used to work, we used to have to do two carers for 15 to 20 residents, and that gave us a time frame of just 20 minutes. In those 20 minutes, we used to wake up our residents, who were about 90 years old, and do showering, toileting, dressing and undressing, tidy up their rooms, make their beds and then take them slowly to their dining. Care, you can imagine, you can, care can you imagine, she went on to say, doing all those things for just, with just 20 minutes? Well, she went on to say, well, we did that with our residents. We had to push ourselves to do that all in 20 minutes. She went on to say, we don't push ourselves physically, we are mentally stressed and emotionally broken if we don't push ourselves physically. And for that physical, mental and emotional strain, what do aged care workers get in return? They get insecure work, usually part-time contracts with few, if any, guaranteed hours. They are required to be available for a shift at any day of the, of the work at just a few hours' notice. They never know how much money they earn in a week. They don't know if they can pay the bills or their rent. They can't make any personal plans or financial commitments. And on top of all that, they are some of the lowest paid workers in the country. Tracy Colbert, 
Another aged care worker told us during the inquiry, I work permanent part-time hours. I would love to have a permanent, permanent hours. I don't know from one week to the next how I'm going to afford to pay for all my living expenses. There are workers that all only get five hours a day. They can't live and support their families. We only get $22 an hour, so I have to work weekends for low money. I do 11 hours days on a weekend away from my family to be able to support them. I've had a lot of friends that have left the sector because they just can't afford to make a living, and some of them had to do two or three jobs. The disgusting reality is that it's become the norm in aged care. The people we depend on to look after senior citizens have been treated in a way that borders on contempt. And Ms Clark went on to say, as Sheree Clark, a nurse from Queensland, said, when my mother went through cancer, I couldn't tell her that I would support her for, for cancer appointments. Because if I'm not available to pick up a shift, then they don't offer you that shift the next time. How disgusting is that? The people, she said on to say, we rely on to care for our parents and grandparents are put in a position where they can't care for their own families. Under the former government, this became the norm for aged care workers. Nine in ten of aged care workers are on a casual or part-time contracts. Those part-time contracts usually have so few guaranteed hours they are just casual contracts without casual loading. And that is the reality for 90 per cent of aged care workers. And somehow that isn't the worst of it. In aged care and the NDIS, there are bottom feeding platforms, gig platforms like Mabel, which have a business model based on paying workers below the minimum wage. As the Health Services Union, Lauren Hutchins told the Job Security Inquiry, she went on to say, they are a combination of between Tinder and Uber. If you put your profile out there and people with disabilities or their carers then make a decision based on the information that is provided. Mabel told the Job Security Inquiry that their workers can earn hourly wages as low as $25. The Mabel workers are engaged as contractors, which means that $25 is without superannuation. It's without any paid leave or any loading in lieu of paid leave. It's without any penalty rates. It's without consideration of any costs incurred by Mabel workers travelling to home care appointments. The fact is, when you strip all those costs out, Mabel workers are paid only a fraction of the national minimum wage, let alone earnings anywhere near the award minimum for workers. And if you let Mabel grow in aged care, as the previous government did, we'll have aged care workers living in their cars. We'll have aged care workers having to skip meals to make ends meet. We will see the quality of care provided to senior Australians go into freefall. And what did the former government do in response to the threat posed by Mabel? They gave them $7.2 million to provide surge workforce in aged care homes during the early waves of the pandemic. The former government paid Mabel, a company that pays workers below the minimum wage, $7.2 million. And how did they go? Well, Mabel's service quality was so woeful that they were hauled before the Age Royal Commission. Anglicare, which owned a facility in Penrith where Mabel provided workers, told the Royal Commission, and I quote, it quickly became apparent the staff that Mabel could provide did not have the skills and qualifications that were needed. That is what the Australian taxpayer paid Mabel for, $7.2 million for a workforce that was underpaid, exploited and incapable of providing the service that was required. What an utter boondoggle. Unbelievably, for the much of that last year, Mabel was being spruiked on the NDIA's website as a preferred provider. So how did, even they, get, how did they get there? Perhaps it's something to go to look at Mabel's owners and board, courtesy of reporting by Crikey. We know that, to our great shock and surprise, 
This dodgy outfit that exploits workers and got millions from the former government, surprise, surprise, is owned and operated by donors and associates of the New South Wales Liberal Party, such as a prominent Liberal fundraiser, Matthew Playfair, prominent Liberal, prominent liberal donor, Lucinda Abode, and Liberal Party double branch president, Ray Whitten. And here we see how the disgusting sausage gets made. Mates of the New South Wales Liberals pile money into an outfit that underpays aged care workers and disability workers and doesn't provide a service. The Liberal government pays them $7.2 million to provide care that is so bad it earns them a spot in the aged care Royal Commission. And Senator Hughes comes into this building regularly and sings Mabel's praises at every given opportunity. And surprise, surprise, when the Royal Commission recommended that these shonks shouldn't be used in aged care, the former government did not accept the recommendation. This whole saga, Mabel's saga, separately encapsulates everything wrong with the former government. I'm glad that at least the Productive Commission is now reviewing that issue. Because there is a broad consensus that gig platforms, not all gig platforms, but gig platforms like Mabel, are not conducive with an acceptable quality of care in aged care and disability care. That is the position of unions involved in the industry. That is the position of employers' sector like Anglicare. That is the position of the Australian Medical Association. That is the position of numerous academics who made submissions to the Productivity Commission and to the Job Security Committee. And that is the position of the Aged Care Royal Commission. So I again commend this new government for moving so quickly to introduce these reforms. And I look forward to the report of the Productivity Commission, because we need to end the scam being perpetrated by Mabel and others with the support of the Liberal Party. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, um, we heard uh, evidence uh, from the Royal Commission. Um, I just want to read a, a section of it out. Uh, my father told me that when the man entered his room, he told the man to leave his room. The man then hit my father over his head several times with a plastic doll, resulting in a small cut to my father's forehead, bruising across the bridge of his nose and defensive bruising on his forearms. There were no staff around at the time the incident occurred, one of the submissions told the Aged Care Royal Commission. Another said, my 71-year-old husband is a resident in aged care because of advanced Parkinson's disease. On the night of December 31, 2018, he was horrifically, abused, horrifically sexually abused by two night duty staff. Yet another told the Royal Commission, what I do know for absolute sure now is that mum who three weeks ago waited in anticipation for family to arrive, spent every day talking, laughing, reminiscing and going on outings and been engaged with life and is now drugged to the eyeballs. I think of my own family's experience in aged care, which, which at best is variable. My wonderful father-in-law, uh, a terrific bloke, struck by the ravages uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease, a former Telstra Liney who, uh, who um, could tell you a story about every little country town and every uh, bit of Telstra infrastructure throughout the Hunter Valley. Um, in his time, in his uh, years in aged care, his wife, uh, my wife's mother, spent every daytime hour with him making sure that he got fed. Uh, making sure that he got clean. Now, the staff in that centre, they were good people, really good people, but they did not have the resources that they needed. They did not have the staff that they needed. Uh, they could not uh, fulfil their responsibility. Uh, and I remember the effort that my wife's mother put into, uh, into Peter's care. You know, these are stories, snippets of stories from the Royal Commission itself but they are, they are elements of the lives of every Australian family who's had somebody in aged care. The bravery of families, friends, carers in the system, advocates,
peak bodies, the unions and others who submitted to the Royal Commission meant that it laid bare just how broken the aged care system is. Shocking, alarming, harrowing, a source of national shame are just some of the ways the final report in aged care was described. In the face of this mounting evidence, you would think that the previous government would have acted urgently on the 148 recommendations contained in the report. Well, you would be wrong. Consistent with their track record on so many issues, the Morrison government sat on their hands. They turned their back on aged care reform and on older Australians. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, made this so much worse. It exacerbated the pressure on the system in which a largely female, underpaid aged care workforce was already under incredible strain. Almost a year after the final report was handed down in March 2021, the former Prime Minister Morrison called in the ADF to fill worker shortages in the sector. A year of inactivity and then call in the ADF. Um, a year of policy failure trying to fill the skills shortages and then relied upon our men and women in uniform to try and fill the gap. You can't help but think how different the COVID crisis in aged care would have been if the Morrison government had acted with some sense of urgency. I mean, some of the backbenchers on the other side don't still don't believe that the COVID crisis was real. So perhaps that played a role in the government's dysfunction. At the time, Linnell Briggs, one of the commissioners, said that the government should have heeded the warnings about the sector's long-standing workforce challenges much, much sooner, putting dignity, respect and humanity front and centre underpins our approach, the new Albanese government's approach uh, to fixing a broken system. We've introduced in the Senate a key, pair of, a, a key piece of aged care legislation delivering on our promise to ensure older Australians receive higher quality care that every single one of them deserves. Because older Australians deserve a government that cares, and older Australians deserve a government that will do what it says that it's going to do uh, and deliver on the promises to have a standard of care that each of them deserve. Band-aid solutions won't work. We've got to be honest about the scale of the problem and the kinds of steps that will be required to fix it. Comprehensive legislative action delivered with the urgency that Australians deserve will make a difference. The bill that's been introduced will deliver a new Australian national aged care classification funding model which will replace the outdated aged care funding instrument in October 2022. More equitable funding matched to product providers' costs will make a big difference in delivering the care that residents need. The star rating system will see the Department of Health and Aged Care publish a comparison rating for all residential aged care services by the end of 2022. Extension of the serious— Senator Ayres, um, it now being 1.30, it's a hard marker. You'll be Thank in you. continuation when we come back to this legislation. But we're now moving to two-minute statements, and I'll call Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise in this place this afternoon to address a particular, a particular issue, and that is the disjointed reporting, uh, the use of language, and under the general theme of an aggressive China. And. Uh, we see an awful lot of articles in the newspapers, which is our main, of course, our, uh, in the newspapers and other media, our main way of receiving information. We have US generals, uh, many, many of them, admirals, other officials coming to this country, and warning of the progress that China has made in relation to its military capability, how it's now got the largest army, the largest navy, the largest maritime militia, the largest submarine. Uh, 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 the, the largest sub-strategic rocket force that the world has ever seen. Uh, China is out there bullying and dominating, according to these, to these many people, particularly in the Western Pacific, and it's much more aggressive. Uh, we see nuclear-powered 
torpedoes, and we shake our heads in amazement and think the extraordinary technology, because we get nuclear-powered submarines in 20 years' time, all of a sudden China has got nuclear torpedoes, and they're saying in 10 years' time they'll have nuclear torpedoes. Speaker Pelosi, of course, wants to go to Taiwan, and if you want a trigger for a bad thing to happen, it seems to me that's a pretty good trigger. But uh, Acting Deputy President, one by one, these things are of vague interest. Put them together and they are absolutely terrifying. It's a beautiful use of language. We talk about the massive failure of deterrence. Well, what really is the massive failure of deterrence? The massive failure of deterrence is what is commonly referred to as war. It's the massive failure of deterrence. It's quite a simple word. But what the next question we've got to ask is, Senator what are we Marlin, doing about it? Senator time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. It's a great honour to be appointed Special Envoy for Disaster Recovery. Whether it's floods, bushfires or storms when natural disasters hit, Australians look to us to work collaboratively and urgently with state and local governments in their hour of greatest need. Australians all believe that we should be rebuilding their lives and communities and build them back better and more resilient. I've started receiving briefings and listening to stakeholders from recently impacted disaster regions. There is a lot of optimism about what a change of government will mean for disaster recovery. But there is also a lot of frustration and scepticism given these communities' experience with the former government, a former government which withheld disaster relief funding after being pressured to finally provide support, excluded communities and labour-held seats, which is disgusting. A former Prime Minister who snuck off to Hawaii during the Black Summer bushfires. A now opposition leader who had made jokes about our Pacific neighbours suffering from rising sea levels. A former government that appointed the former National President of the Liberal Party, Shane Stone, as our disaster recovery agency chief, despite having no experience in disaster recovery. Mr Stone's main contribution to the role was to insult flood victims, suggesting it was their own fault for living in areas prone to flooding. So Senator there is a lot McGrath. of work to be done to restore uh, safety. Senator Sheldon, resume your seat. Senator Starr, sorry. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are very gross uh, reflections. Are you a point of, point of order? order? There are gross reflections being made on a former Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, and I would suggest to my colleague he should withdraw. Senator Sheldon, just resume your seat for one moment. Because he's not a current Chief Minister, it's technically not um, contrary to the rules, so, but if Senator Sheldon it would assist the smooth running of the chamber if you withdrew. Uh, Chair, I would really prefer not to be withdrawing that, those comments because they are an accurate description of what actually um, was, said by, well, was said by Shane Stone. Was said by Shane Stone. Excuse me, Senator McGrath. Could you stop interjecting? Uh, Senator Sheldon, just continue your speech. In that case. And of course, despite having no experience in disaster recovery, Mr. Stone's Senator main contribution McGrath. to the role was to insult flood victims, suggesting it was their own fault for living in areas prone to flooding. So there is a lot of work to do to restore faith with. Resume your seat. Senator McGrath, please stop yelling and interjecting. It's disorderly. Senator Davies? MacDonald, my apologies. It's, right. it's been a, been a big break. Years. Uh, my point of order is that that is uh, grossly inaccurate, having managed the northwest flood recovery uh, to the very great satisfaction of those no, people. No point of order. There is no point of order. It's, there is no point of order. Senator Sheldon, you have nine seconds left. So there is a lot of work to do to restore faith with communities and un undo the damage of the last government. But we are hitting the ground running and making a difference. Senator Almond Payne. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and please note that this is not my first speech. Public school teachers are some of the hardest working people in Australia. Throughout the pandemic, they have been beacons of reliability, dedication and compassion, working for the benefit of our kids in some of the most challenging teaching and learning conditions in living memory. The unshakable positivity of the teaching profession under these circumstances is admirable. They deserve our thanks, but they deserve more than just our thanks. Public school teachers deserve better conditions and a pay rise. I understand the value of the work that public teachers do, and I also recognise the complexity of their work. I have been a teacher for almost 30 years, and immediately prior to joining the Senate, I was a teacher and head of department at Gladstone State High School. I have seen firsthand how the current system is failing our public school teachers and their students. I have seen firsthand the ever-increasing pressures placed on teachers and the lack of funding to meet the challenges of more and more work with less and less time. We need an approach to education in this country that values our public school teachers and empowers them to do what they do best without the additional burdens of operating in a system that is consistently underfunded and creates excessive workloads. Teaching conditions are learning conditions and public money should be for public schools. My message to teachers is this. I am in your corner. You deserve better conditions and a pay rise, and we will make sure or work hard to make sure you get them. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. The last time Labor was in government, it delivered no funding for mobile base stations, not a dollar for new or upgraded mobile infrastructure, and delivered the MBN to just 51,000 users. Its performance was abysmal. In setting out the Labor government's priorities for this term in the Governor-General's speech, mobile communications did not even get a mention. Not one word. This is shameful. Mobile connectivity is critical infrastructure, and that is why, when we were in government, we funded more than 1,200 mobile base stations and delivered more than 1,000 new or upgraded base stations. This keeps families, students, small businesses connected, and of course, this is also critical infrastructure when it comes to times of emergency, such as during bushfires. We get this, particularly in rural and regional communities. Labor did not. Incredibly, Labor failed to back the Perry Urban Mobile Program before the election, and it was only after very substantial advocacy from coalition MPs and senators that Labor reversed its position and backed round one to deliver 66 projects around Australia. I congratulate uh, Aaron Violi, we went to Casey and less than 24 hours. The Minister for Communications reversed Labor's position. But there's still the extension of the pump program that is supporting peri-urban areas in regional major cities. Wollongong, Geelong, Gosford, Newcastle, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, Townsville, Cairns, Darwin and Canberra, $78.5 million. We committed not a cent from Labor. This decision needs to be reversed. Senator Grogan. Thank you. I rise today to recognise the role of education in strengthening our democracy and to celebrate the efforts of teachers throughout the state, my state of South Australia, to promote a sound understanding of democracy in our school system. To fully participate in our democratic process, people need to understand how it works, which is why it's so inspiring to see teachers in my home state delivering excellent education, teaching their students how this parliament works, how elections work, how votes are undertaken, and what role they can play in being part of that. So at the start of this parliament, which is the sunrise after the election, I'm filled with great hope. I had an excellent visit with a school called St Paul's Lutheran School in Blair Athol um, just a few months ago. 
and they invited me to go and talk to them because their students were studying exactly that democracy government elections voting and australian history as part of that they were setting up their own political parties within the classroom and working out what the key issues for them would be and they sent me a range of letters um, that each of the students had put together outlining what they wanted to see change now a number of them were about school uniforms, we had some dog parks, but it also ranged to issues of taxing and social services. They were very impressive letters from a group of five students from Blair Athol. Um, they asked amazingly deep questions, which were a little confronting, but an awful lot of fun. So I would just like to recognise the extraordinary job that some of our teachers do in ensuring their students can participate fully and understand our democratic Senator process. Senator Grogan, your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Hi. This is not my first speech. I'll need a teensy bit more than just a couple of minutes for that. I'm um, sorry. That, oh, sorry. <laughs> do I get a do-over? But I no. couldn't pass up a chance to stand up here and say a big thank you to all the people who worked so hard to get me into this place. I never thought in a million years that I would be a senator. I'm not a politician. I'm a normal person, a Tasmanian. I'm an Olvi girl who's lived in the same place on the northwest coast of Tassie for 25 years, with my beautiful partner Tim and our silly dog and our boys. And as proud as I am to be here, that's what I'm most proud of. I love our state. I love who we are as Tasmanians. I cannot wait to bring a little piece of our community up into this place just like Jackie does every time she steps in here, because that's what Tasmanians deserve. We need people in parliament who are here for us, people who get us, people who know what it's like to live in a state like ours with all the absolutely amazing, fantastic, gorgeous bits and all the problems too. So can I please say a big thank you to everyone who got me here. Thank you to the volleys, the donors, the people who chucked up signs in their front yards and took them down for us after the big day too. Thank you to Bruce, who brought me soup and went out of his way to get our signs up. Thank you to Sam, who went all the way to Bunnings just to get me a snag. Thank you to Catherine, who stood out in the rain for hours at the pre-poll booth in Burnie. Thank you to Franny for the banana cake and coffee and all the good support. There are so many people who made this happen, but the clock's running down. And I can't thank you all. You know who you are. You made this happen. You got us here. Our community, our people. We're breaking into this place because of the work you're doing. And this is just the start. Thank you. Senator Starr. Senator Terrell, it wasn't your first speech, but it was a very good speech. And uh, it was very gracious. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll do your party proud. And continue uh, Senator Lambie's great work, especially in relation to veterans. Uh, on 28 July 2022, Deputy Premier of Queensland Stephen Miles announced that the WellCamp quarantine facility would be closed from 1 August 2022. And of course, in the announcement, Madam Acting Deputy President, there was no reference to cost of the facility, absolutely no reference to cost whatsoever. What is the cost? The cost was of this facility $223.5 million. $223.5 million. A staggering $320,000 for every person who used that facility at a time where there's chronic homelessness in this country and in my home state of Queensland, a, a dearth, a shortage. Of, of housing assets, $325,000 per person. I checked, I checked on the internet. That equates to something like 5,437 apartments or houses currently on the market in Queensland. Five and a half thousand residences you could buy for that $223.5 million. The worst example, the worst example of pandemic politics, in my view that I have seen. The worst example. And of course, uh, 
This facility was doomed from the start. Why? It wasn't near an international passenger airport. It wasn't near where most of the hospitals in the southeast corner are located. And the Commonwealth was building the pink and bar facility. This was politics, rank politics, putting politics before people. October 2024, in the next Queensland Your election. Expired, Senator Scar. Senator Chikan. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, earlier this week, I wasn't actually able to uh, make a contribution on the passing of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, but I just want to make a, a very short contribution uh, right now. Like everyone in this place, um, right throughout the nation, I was shocked to hear of the assassination of uh, Shinzo Abe. It was a very dark moment uh, for democracy and looms large all over us who are committed to representative government and the rule of law. Abe was one of Australia's strongest allies on an increasingly fraught international stage, particularly in our region in the Pacific. I recently had the opportunity to attend the Rim of the Pacific exercise as part of the Australian Defence Force parliamentary program, uh, where I was able to and had the pleasure of speaking to the Japanese uh, Maritime Self-Defence Force, uh, particularly their Rear Admiral uh, Hirata as the Vice Commander of RIMPAC. Um, Japan's participation in, in this exercise was a very strong reminder of the positive influence that Shinzo Abe has had in bolstering Japan's positive and peaceful influence in our region. And I sort of continue to, to work with uh, the, the Japanese people. Uh, no doubt there will be a parliamentary friendship group of uh, Japan and Australia, and I look forward to being part of that. All democratic nations are better off for Shinzo Abe's efforts. Abe's death must be taken as a reminder that we cannot take peace and democracy for granted, and we must all recommit to ourselves and to the people defending our values, defending our institutions from these cowardly acts of violence, these acts of terrorism. I am sure everyone else in this chamber joins me in grieving for Abe's family and the people of Japan. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Then Deputy President, this is not my first speech. A new parliament is a chance for new politics, and voters have told us loud and clear the old two-party system that delivered for the big end of town while making everybody else wait is no longer working. But we are already seeing worrying signs. We're already seeing who the new government plans to work for and who's going to be left behind. They're already working to ram through over $200 billion in stage three tax cuts, delivering for the rich at the expense of the many. They're pushing through 114 new coal and gas projects, blatantly ignoring the demands of the millions who voted for climate action. They are already ignoring the 15-month waiting list for public dental care, forcing people to wait until an emergency to get their teeth fixed. They're dismissing exploding inflation and the cost of living crisis. They're telling workers, workers to wait for a living wage while they hand out billions in, of public money to fossil fuel corporations and the big end of town. They are ignoring the six million people who access social support payments, a quarter of the country, who are being forced to choose between rent and groceries each week. Those people can't wait. They're abandoning young people who are being forced into casual work who won't ever own a home or are facing decades of debt just to get an education. They're being told to wait by the Albanese government. Millions of people across the country voted for a new parliament for new hope and not to be told to wait. Today we are here with a record 16 Green senators and MPs, and we're telling the Alb Albanese government that the only restraint on delivering for good, for delivering now, is the scale of its ambition. Senator D. Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. This is not my first speech. I was very pleased to hear the Attorney General stopped the prosecution of Bernard Kaliri. The Attorney's action ended the unjust prosecution of a man who blew the whistle on a disgraceful attempt by the Australian Government in 2004 to defraud the impoverished people of Timor-Leste of the oil and gas resources by spying on their sea boundary negotiating team, spying in what were supposed to be good faith negotiations. Regrettably, the end of the Kaliri trial isn't the end of excessive and unjustified state secrecy in our courts and tribunals. Today, there's another secret proceeding happening in the Melbourne office of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. 
The matter relates to a request to National Ar Archives for access to a 22-year-old cabinet submission relating to the Timor Gap negotiating strategy of the Howard government. The applicant, former Senator for South Australia, Rex Patrick, wants full disclosure of Mr Howard and Mr Downer's dirty dealings. But the government, this Labor government, is happy to have a secrecy certificate applied to the proceedings. Mr Patrick is fighting against the government's refusal to release historical documents, but he's not allowed to see the documents and he's being prevented from hearing the government's arguments. He's got both hands tied behind his back. The secrecy around the Howard government's attempts to steal Timor-Leste's oil and gas has to end. Australians want full disclosure. The Timorese want that too, and while secrecy continues, there will be an elephant in the room when our officials meet with theirs. As His Excellency Janana Guzmao said in the AAT proceedings, continued secrecy creates a sense of suspicion and impropriety Senator Pocock, and cannot time remain has a feature expired. of Senator Antic. Brave farmers in the Netherlands are protesting their government's draconian and tyrannical climate policies, and through peaceful protest, they're defending their livelihoods and their liberty. They deserve our support. They're standing up for their own country and everyone who opposes the elitist globalist agenda being imposed on ordinary people throughout the world. The Dutch government, led by the World Economic Forum, is imposing a climate agenda that will result in thousands of farmers having to forfeit their land, all because their government says that cows and soil are contributing to climate change. This is all in accordance with the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. These actions will do nothing more than transfer wealth and property from the hands of hard-working people into the hands of the already ultra-wealthy elites. This is a weaponisation of fear, falsehoods and threats. The Labor government in this country is now seeking to pursue their own reckless emissions policy, with Mr Albanese referring to climate change as a national security issue, a bizarre and nonsensical claim, unless he means climate policies weaken us and make us more vulnerable to outside threats like the Chinese Communist Party, in which case I agree. There is no way to achieve these reductions without transforming society in ways that will cause many Australians, including farmers, to lose their livelihoods. So how long before the government tells Australian farmers they are not allowed to work? Good, hard-working people have had enough of the senseless, arbitrary government intrusions into their life and they're standing their ground. So whether it's the Dutch farmers or the Canadian truckers, freedom-loving people are peacefully holding the line. And if the Australian government pushes further with a 2030 agenda in this country, then God willing, Australians will need to start speaking up. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As servants to the people of Queensland, or our state and Australia, we have a sworn duty to tell the people the truth rather than what people would like to hear. Responding to fabricated narratives from predatory billionaires and their mouthpiece media is not honest government. Legitimising fairy tales is not honest government. We live in an age where feelings are the new facts, an age when facts are conspiracy theories. Successive parliaments let this happen. We were elected to lead, not to follow. I always vote the facts, not the narrative, and I will continue to do so. Too many others in here do not. As a result, the next decade may be the worst in our history for freedom, opportunity and personal wealth. With a change of government, we have a chance to choose what is right over what is expedient. Is Prime Minister Albanese capable of accepting that challenge? Time will tell. I sincerely wish the incoming government well and offer my support where that support is merited. Will the Nationals and Liberals learn from this election and return to their roots, representing farmers, families and aspirational Australians? Time will tell. I certainly hope so. Nothing will serve Australia better than making the next election an old-fashioned battle of ideas. In the last election, the lack of vision from both major parties left voters underwhelmed and disappointed. Focus groups fine-tuned bland policies into a bland sameness, leaving voters uninspired. One Nation is ready to begin the debate of ideas that will carry our beautiful nation and all within it forward to a future of freedom and abundance. We will be more focused on generating and endorsing the visionary ideas our nation needs for future prosperity. Where families and personal responsibility are ascendant over collectivism and oppression. Where Australians' interests are placed ahead of foreign globalist interests. Where we have one world made of many countries, not one country made of many worlds. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Senator B. Pocock. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I note this is not my first speech. On Tuesday, we were welcomed to country and parliament in a powerful and beautiful ceremony. So many Australians want to tell the truth about our history and move to treaties in a more powerful voice for First Nations. But our work has to be more than words. We have to make sure we do no fresh harm. In this light, as I speak, one of South Australia's First Nations communities, the Bungala people, are in the federal court arguing against the plan to put Australia's low and intermediate level nuclear waste on Bungala land near Kimber. We talk about voice. The Bungala people's voices have not been heard in this decision. They have been ignored and they are excluded from the local ballot on this matter. But they have been clear to a person that they do not want this dump on their country. They want to protect their country, country they spent 21 years winning native title for. They are now in court, opposed by this government, which is pursuing the previous government's terrible decision. They are arguing against a fleet of lawyers to be heard and to be listened to. If we're serious about the Uluru Statement, about addressing the hurts of the past, then we cannot layer new hurt on old. For a people who experienced generations of fallout from British nuclear tests at Maralinga, like members of the Bungala community have, then we must not now add new insult to injury. There is not broad support in South Australia for this dump, and most South Australians have had no say over its siting. We must listen to the Bungala people. There are different solutions available to this government, better solutions. The new government must find another way a way that ensures we don't just make speeches about truth-telling while adding new injury today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Macdonald. I rise to remind the Labor Party that Northern Australia matters. It matters to me, to my coalition colleagues and the 1.3 million people who call it home. And on June the 2nd, I said I feared the installation of a Labor government would herald the sunset for Northern Australia. I hope to be wrong. But on the very first day of this new parliament, Labor has abolished the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia and thrown the, future, the region's future under a cloud. Only people who don't appreciate both the potential and challenges of the North would make such a decision, thinking that Northern issues are just the same as Southern issues. The arrogance and ignorance of this attitude is truly breathtaking. Order. And we in the North pay more, and in many parts, you can't make a mobile phone call. Our children's schooling is hampered by slow internet. The Bruce Highway is cut off by every heavy rain event. We have unsealed roads that isolate communities for months in the wet season. But despite all of this, through sheer will, attitude and hard work, the North protects, it feeds, it clothes and it enriches the whole country. Australians re uh, the Australian resources sector, much of which is based in the North, poured $39 billion in royalties and taxes into government coffers in 2020-21 and added $390 billion to our economy, funding roads, schools and hospitals used by all Australians. Our northern beef industry is worth more than $5 billion, and more than 90 per cent of our bananas, mangoes, sugarcane and winter tomatoes and other horticulture are grown north of the tropic. All these people and these critical industries are relying on Labor to look out for them, but they have been abandoned at the very first step. Under the coalition government, we built momentum for developing the North, and I will be moving a motion in the Senate that the committee is re-established and gives the North the specialised focus and policy making Thank it you, deserves. Senator MacDonald. Your time has expired. <clears throat> we'll now move to question time, and I call Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Yesterday in question time, when pressured on how many passengers have walked through sanitised foot mats, the minister said, and I quote, 100 per cent of passengers have been walking through sanitised foot mats. The minister has clearly misled the Senate. In fact, tens of thousands of passengers have disembarked from Bali since the outbreak in Bali on uh, July Five, and the installation of the foot mats only this week without uh, footwear being disinfected. I wrote to the minister informing him of this misleading statement yesterday, and he still has not taken the opportunity to correct the record and make a ministerial explanation to the Senate. When 
Will Order. the minister do the honourable thing and correct the record to the Senate? Uh, Senator Watt, uh, minister, sit down. Before I call uh, the minister, I am going to ask that you respect the senator asking the questions and not interject, and that you listen to the minister's response. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, that's a pretty sad way for this question time to start out today, given that I think on three or four occasions yesterday I actually answered the question that you are asking. I have received, I have received a letter from you, which I have Senator signed a response McGrath. to, and I'm sure that you, will, you may have even received it by now. Uh, well, maybe talk to your office, but we certainly have, have signed off a response. Um, and I will confirm yet again, I'm probably up to five times, six times, seven times, that 100 per cent of passengers who have returned to Australia from Indonesia since the footmats were in place on Monday and Tuesday. That's what I said. That's what I said. Order. Wow. Wow. Order. Is this what you've become? Is this what you've Minister? become? Is this what you've become? Minister, resume your seat. Order. Senator is Order. 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 Uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator Ayres, I had just called the Senate to order and you interjected. I would appreciate you following my order when I call for order that you do not interject. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. It is rather interesting that only since the election and they went into opposition that the opposition became interested in footmats because, of course, this outbreak reached Indonesia on the 9th of May. What did the opposition do about footmats or biosecurity zones or any of the things that we've done in response to the outbreak? Well, I'll tell you what they did. The former minister, Mr Littleproud, uh, when the outbreak oh, reached— sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, come Senator, on. Senator, what, uh, minister, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Brockman. It's relevance. And, oh, come on, Senator Watt. Answer the question. Do not uh, attack Senator the opposition. Brockman. Senator Brockman, just a moment, please. I'm not quite clear what your point of order was. Can you order. go directly? Yes. Yeah. I apologise. I apologise for responding to Senator Watt's interjection. However, uh, I was making a point of order on direct relevance. This is not an opportunity to attack the opposition or thank previous you, government Brockman. policy. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator Wong and Minister Watt. Minister Wong, the question was about uh, footmats. The minister was directly um, referring to footmats. As you know, I cannot, uh, Minister Watt, I haven't called you. That I cannot direct a minister on how to answer a question, but he is being directly relevant to the question, which was about footmats. Senator, uh, Minister. Oh. Order. Senator McGrath, let's allow the minister to continue the answer. Minister. As I was saying, I'm pleased that the opposition has become interested in footmats because when this outbreak reached Indonesia on the 9th of May, what did the former Minister for Agriculture, Mr Littleproud, do? Did he introduce footmats? No. Did he introduce biosecurity zones? response McGrath. zones? No. You know what he did? He sent a tweet. He sent a tweet. That is the only thing Minister Littleproud did at the time. And then he didn't say anything until the 6th uh, of July. What? Senator McKenzie. Madam President, this is actually a grave matter that this minister uh, on Senator the first McKenzie, day has your my question direct relevance. Thank you. This minister Thank you. has misled the uh, Senate Sen and is not Senator dealing McKenzie, with it in his question. Please resume your seat. Minister Watt, you the, there was a direct question about mats. I was giving you some latitude, but please get to the um, 
the directness of the question, please. Thank you, President. I have lost count of the number of times I have now answered this question. I did it repeatedly yesterday, again today, Senator and in the letter today. Uh, Minister, former Minister Little Proud was not the only person to say nothing about footmats or the outbreak until uh, it Senator got to Bali. McGrath. We heard nothing from Senator McKenzie until the July the 19th. Uh, she thank didn't you, comment Minister, once your when time it got to Indonesia. Senator McKenzie, a sec our first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I refer Senator Watt to his statement to the Senate yesterday that Australia has, and I quote, approximately one million vaccines available to us in a stockpile and they are available within one week's notice." End quote. Given this fact, why won't vaccines be delivered to Indonesia, who is going through an uncontrollable outbreak, for more than four weeks, as uh, first advised, and not arriving till August, as you informed the Senate? Um, Minister Wong. Just on a point of order, I would ask you to rule as to whether that is in fact supplementary to the primary question. Um, if the minister wishes to answer, obviously it's a matter for him. At his, yeah, but uh, that is not in my submission uh, as su supplementary to the primary question. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, on the point of order, both the question and the supplementary question relate to the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. Both of them relate to quest answers given by Senator Watt in question time yesterday on the same related issue. It is demonstrably a supplementary question to the primary question, then you should rule Senator Wong's point of order out of order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll take some advice. Uh, thank you. Given there's been uh, different views expressed by Minister Wong and Senator Birmingham, we think that um, I'm advised that the question is broad enough to allow that first supplementary. Um, but I will review the Hansard and, if necessary, come back to uh, to the Senate with an answer. But I would uh, invite the minister to respond. Uh, thank you, President. I'm happy to take the question. Uh, it seems that the opposition. Uh, Senator McGrath. Minister. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Senator Brockman. President, I mean, direct relevance. The minister cannot start an answer with the opposition. I mean, that is uh, a, Senator that Brockman, is a significant. Senator Brockman. That Senator Brockman, I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Brockman, I have asked you to resume your seat. Thank you. Order. The senator has just commenced his answer, um, so we will see where he goes in the next breath. He's barely said two words. Minister. Thank you, President. As I was saying, uh, we have ordered vaccines for Australia, and we have them in the vaccine bank to ensure that we are properly prepared for a foot and mouth disease outbreak should it reach Australia. The, uh, the former minister's question goes to Senator Indonesia McGrath. vaccines. Now, I know this might come as a surprise to the opposition because it's something they never practiced when they were in government, but when you work with other countries, you need to do it cooperatively. You actually need to develop a partnership relationship as opposed to the kind of relationship your government cultivated with our friends in Southeast Order. Asia and the Pacific. So when the Prime Minister was in Indonesia, where he was very well received, I might point out, uh, he offered assistance in the form of vaccines to uh, the, the Indonesian government. At that point in time, they decided to pursue their own interests. We have since, as Thank a result you, of my Minister, visit, offered a million and they're expired. coming. Senator McKenzie, a second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, biosecurity officers will not only be deployed into airports, they will be deployed into mail centres as well. How many of the 18 new biosecurity officers are currently operational at mail centres? Which mail centres are they? And what is their specific foot and mouth disease passenger intervention task? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. I anticipated I might get a question about this because it came up yesterday. Would you like the answer? Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Please continue to answer the question, um, Minister the, And My intention, as is normal uh, practice, is to answer the questions that I took on notice yesterday at the end of question time today, which is what many ministers on your side of the uh, chamber have done. The, the answer McGrath. is uh, that my announcement was that our new funding, funding that your government, when you were in power, did not commit and did not implement, will deliver 18 new biosecurity officers. They are currently being recruited, and in the meantime, we have employed 65 contractors and 10 other officers in the Order. meantime. Now, Order. again, I make the point that every Order. action we have taken, sanitation footmats, uh, biosecurity response zones, extra uh, biosecurity officers, None of those measures were ever taken by your government when this Minister outbreak Watt. got to Indonesia. All Minister you did was send Watt. tweets. Resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have asked politely on a number of occasions that you not interject. Please desist with the interjections. They are disorderly. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, and it's no wonder, uh, with, when this, with this calibre of debate, that industry Minister is backing the government. Uh, thank you. The time has expired. Senator McGrath, I asked you just then, I directed you not to interject, and the minute the minister got up, you interjected again. Uh, uh, I'm not, it's not a debate. Senator McGrath, it is not a debate with me. It's a direct request. I'm asking you to stop being disorderly. Yes. Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, if I may, um, President, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, re in relation to your previous point of order, uh, perhaps refer you to um, uh, Odgers uh, and ask, uh, and I do this also so that the opposition can be aware of the position of the government. In relation to the use of supplementary questions, President McClellan made a statement in which he said, uh, supplementary questions are appropriate only for the purposes of elucidating information arising from the original question and answer. They are not appropriate for the purpose of introducing additional or new material or proposing a new question, even though such a question might be related to the subject matter of the original question. So I, I, I again, whilst I do note there's been some changes in standing orders since that time, I, I would ask you uh, perhaps subsequent to question time to consider that. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. And, and President, uh, whilst undertaking that review, I would encourage you uh, to look back at uh, past consideration of questions that were asked. Uh, I think you will find that in terms of uh, the relationship between the question that is asked and the supplementary questions, uh, that oftentimes that relationship uh, relates very specifically to the subject matter and the flow of then smaller issues uh, related to, uh, to uh, those subjects. Uh, in this case, uh, the discussion of foot mats uh, and the discussion of vaccines being supplied to Indonesia clearly all relate to the foot and mouth outbreak uh, and are following the very common practice since the process of having the primary question and two supplementary questions uh, was introduced into this Senate. Thank you, and I thank both uh, leaders for that, uh, those comments. And uh, as I said, I'll review the Hansard and come back to. The Senate, if necessary, Senator McKim. Yes, if I could just, on a point of order, very briefly observe, um, President, that we're chewing up a lot of time at the moment. <laughs> question time yesterday uh, had a very, very small number of questions asked because time was consumed with excessive points of order. I just simply uh, ask senators, uh, including Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham, to consider the passage of time while they are making their points of order. Uh, Senator Kim, I can reassure you that during this current uh, debate and points of order, the clock has been stopped. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we're calling Senator Green. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. <clears throat> can the Minister advise the Senate on the state of the economy following the Treasurer's economic statement today? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank Senator Green uh, for her interest in uh, the economic um, situation across Australia and the Treasurer's ministerial uh, statement that he made earlier today. Uh, it's, it's true that we're facing a very challenging set of economic circumstances, both domestically and internationally. 
and the Treasurer, in his address to the House of Representatives today, delivered that message, but also importantly, that the Australian economy is growing, but there are some challenges that need to, to be managed uh, in the near term. We've been upfront with Australians about that since coming to government, and we will continue to be upfront and honest as new challenges emerge. Today, in the latest update of Treasury forecasts, the Treasurer outlined that economic growth has been revised down by half a percentage point for the next uh, three years. I think inflation is ex expected to peak at seven and three quarter percent by the end of the year, and that the inflation challenge obviously has an impact on the outlook uh, for real wages and real wages growth. The forecasts also show, with inflation, with real wages. It will get worse before it gets better, but that it will get better. The current expectation is that inflation will indeed get worse this year, moderate next year and normalise the year after. The Treasury forecasts also show that real wages are expected to stabilise mid-next year before growing again in 2023-2024. When it comes to the budget, Speaker, whilst the final results for the 21-22 financial year are likely to show an improved, um, than in, a better in, than improved expected outcome compared to what was released at PFO, however, temporary factors like supply chain disruptions, capacity constraints, and extreme weather have delayed some spending, and low unemployment and volatile commodity prices boosted revenue. The short, medium and longer term pressures on the Thank budget you, Senator are Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Green, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Can the minister advise how the challenges in the economy are impacting Australians? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank Senator Green. And this was, uh, we absolutely understand the impact uh, that this is having on Australian and Australian households, and it's why we're being really upfront with the Australian public because Australians are up for that. They want honest government. They, want, they don't want a government of spin and of pretending things are, are fine when they're not. They want a government that understands the challenges they're facing, that, that, that household budgets are stretched, that bills are going up, that wages aren't matching that. They've had 10 years of stagnant wages growth at, at best. They've had nine years of a government with missed opportunities and wrong priorities. And this government is going to be clear about what the challenges are and clear about the plan to manage those challenges and to help households deal with that. But we're not going to pretend that nine years of neglect and poor government can be reversed Thank you, Senator overnight. Senator Gallagher, your time has expired. Order. Order. I've called Senator Green. Second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Green. Thank, thank you, President. What are the government's plans to deal with these challenges? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, um, Speaker. And I, Smith. I, I know responding to interjections is disorderly, but from it the is. interjections I have managed to hear whilst I've been talking, they will be interested in the answer to this ca uh, question. Despite what some of them, uh, the op those opposites say, we do have a plan to deal with the economic challenges we face. And one of the plan is to deal with the waste Order. and rorts that you Senator riddle Scott. through your budget. The waste and rorts, billions of dollars, the pork barrelling, the buying of seats, the buying Order. of votes. That's part of our plan as we, re as we reorganise and reprioritise the budget. But we have concrete plans, childcare, cheaper medicines, cheaper and cleaner energy. We've got plans to grow wages. You get that? Grow wages, not hold wages back, which is what you did. Grow wages. Invest in skills. Make sure that our people are ready for the Order. jobs of the future. Senator These are what a responsible government should be doing for the Senator past Hughes, 10 years and what are we going to do now? Has expired, Minister. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Youth, Senator Watt. Tuesday night on the 7.30 program, the Prime Minister said, we intend to honour our promises. The Prime Minister promised on 3 December last year that Labor's policy, quote, will see electricity prices fall from the current level of $275 for households by 2025, end quote. Minister, with young Australians impacted by cost of living pressures, will the government honour this promise? Minister Watt. Yes. President, I do question whether that's an appropriate question for me. Order. 
Para. Ora. Ora. Please resume your seat, Minister. Order. Order. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, if I make, I, I do believe point of order um, in terms of the addressing of the question to a minister. I, I understand that the opposition used the word youth. Uh, the policy, f uh, which was referred to in the question, is not within Minister Watt's portfolio. Uh, it's in within, within uh, Minister Bowen's portfolio, and that would be the appropriate. Um, uh, minister, who's the minister representing that? It's me, I think. <laughs> so. Senator Wong, Senator Birmingham, are you on a point of order? I, I, I am president. Very, very briefly, mindful of Senator McKim's observation, uh, the question didn't reference a specific policy. The question referenced the promises uh, of the now government and the now prime minister, uh, and it referenced those promises in the context of cost of living pressures specific to young Australians. Senator Watt represents the Minister for Youth in this place and therefore should answer questions relevant to young Australians. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll just confirm. Um, I, I think Senator Watt is comfortable to take the question. Um, the, shall I? Minister Watt, I'm going to ask Senator Wong to confirm that who the repping minister for youth is. Senator Minister Wong, I, I'm just wishing to ascertain that the, the repping minister for this question is um, Minister Watt. The minister wishes to... I was actually trying to be helpful to the opposition. Uh, to, I know, believe it or not, to say Order. I'm very happy for them to... I'm Order. very happy... I, I'm very happy... If I could finish my sentence... Oh. No, I was just going to say, if you want to re-address the question to the appropriate minister, I will take the question. If you wish to persist with it to Minister Watt, it's a matter for him to answer. I think at this point there's been no redirection from Senator Chandler, so I um, invite Minister Watt to respond to the question. Thank you, President. Um, I'm always happy to talk about our plan to bring down energy prices and your utter failure to do so in the 10 years that you were in government. Unlike, unlike the opposition, the government has a plan. It's probably one of the reasons we won the election, is that we actually had a plan going forward to bring down power prices uh, in the way that we promised. The best thing about that is that at the same time, not only will our plan bring down power prices, something that you were incapable of doing over 10 years, we will also bring down emissions, something that you didn't believe in doing for 10 years, let alone achieve, and we will create over uh, 500 or 600,000 of jobs. There's so many, I can't remember Order. the exact figure. That's how Order. many jobs we will intend to create, including five out of six in regional Australia. Our plan will help young people Senator with their power McGrath. prices. Our plan to lift wages will help young people, especially because of the number of young workers who work in industries like hospitality, retail, minimum wage jobs. And what did those people get from a Labor government? They got a government that supported a wage rise, something that you weren't prepared to do for the 10 years that you were in government. So our policies will bring down uh, youth, wage, youth uh, prices, uh, something Minister, you couldn't do. resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, uh, point of order on, uh, on question of direct relevance, and indeed in the previous point of order I commented on, I highlighted the fact that the question didn't ask specifically about a policy of the government. It asked about a promise made by the now Prime Minister. That promise was that Labor's policy will see electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 Thank for households by 2025. Senator Birmingham, what's the, the question, point of order? The question is, is the government going to honour that promise? That Thank you. Promise? Uh, thank Senator you, Senator Watt Birmingham. Is not addressing Please resume that your seat. Promise. Thank, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Uh, well, on the point of order, this is precisely why the opposition should have readdressed the question. He's, he's responding. No, no, no. Order. He, he's Senator not the Cash. minister representing the minister responsible for the policy position. On the point of order raised by Senator Birmingham, I noted that order. The Leader of the Opposition has raised a point of order on the question which I am seeking to respond to. So, On the point of order, I, uh, the minister is being relevant. It talked about electricity, it talked about promises, it talked about uh, bringing prices down and young people. 
um, and uh, in my view, the minister has been uh, relevant. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. We have every intention of delivering all of our election commitments, whether it be this one or any other commitment that we made, such as getting rid of the ABCC, such as establishing an anti-corruption commission, something you didn't do for, three, for the last three years, uh, such as lifting minimum wages, something that has already happened under this government, and, as I say, benefits younger people as well. Now, I might just note that uh, not only did the former government fail to do anything about power prices in the ten years that it was in government, it had the hide in the run-up to an election Order. to actually hide Order. from the Australian public how much those power prices were rising. Because this mob over here will be the people who will be Senator always remembered McGrath. for hiding the increase in the default market offer price, which has increased power prices in New South Wales alone uh, by up Minister to 19 Watt, your time has 90%. expired. Senator Chandler, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, with cost of living pressures faced by young Australians travelling to work and study, will the government extend the reduction in the fuel excise? Uh, fuel, would government extend fuel excise? Impossible to hear that question. Uh, Senator Could I ask Watt, it to be... direct it to me. If you sorry, require the sorry. question to be repeated, then simply ask me. President, would you mind having the question repeated? It was impossible Thank to hear you. due to the interjections. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. I can oblige. Minister, with cost of living pressures faced by young Australians travelling to work and study, will the government extend the reduction in the fuel excise? Senator Wong, is there a point of order? Point of order. Wrong minister and not a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Bir Birmingham, and then I'll come to you, Senator McGill. Oh. E e e e e equally briefly. The question relates to young Australians, to the minister representing the Minister for Youth. The question relates to cost of living pressures, as did the primary question. Uh, I'm, taking a point of, I'm going to respond to that point of order. As I said, there's, there's already a. Just resume your seat, Minister. Order. There is a question before the chair on uh, supplementaries. In the same way that I've agreed to look at that previous question, then we will look at this question um, and whether it relates to the primary question. And if it doesn't, we'll report back to the Senate. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing. Wait, so, the... Sorry, Senator McKim, I might beg your pardon. I thought you were on a point of order. Oh, no, I'm trying to ask a question. Right. We'll get to you. <laughs> thank you. Resume your seat. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim, resume your seat. Thank you. Senator McKim, resume your seat. Yeah. So, Richard. What? I advise the Senate that the question asked by Senator Chandler has been directed to uh, Minister Watt, and he can only answer it within the broad depth of his policy area. And I've, I think he had some time left, but I'm, I will check. Yeah, Senator Watt. Uh, well, unlike the opposition, uh, this government cares about young people. Uh, but as to the specifics of this question, I refer them to the responsible minister. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Senator Chandler is entitled to have silence while she asks her question. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank Order. you. Thank you, Madam President. Mm. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Chandler, please continue. Thank you, Madam President. The ABS confirmed yesterday that inflation has risen to 6.1 per cent, the highest level in 20 years. When can young Australians expect the government to provide specific detail in measures to help them with cost of living pressures? Good. Minister Watt. I, 
with, with the greatest respect, I think that is a question that's appropriately directed to the, youth min the uh, minister representing the Minister of Youth, which is why I'm happy to give you an answer. Um, again, unlike uh, the opposition— Senator McGrath, this, take a breath, please. He's a minister sore loser. Unlike the opposition, this government does care about young people. It has a minister in place with programs for young people. And the, the best thing that we have already done in the short time that we have been in power for young people is ensure that they got an increase to the minimum Senator wage. McGrath. Uh, because of the sheer number of young workers who are on the minimum wage, something that this the opposition consistently refused to do. Remember, remember about low wages were a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy under this mob? No wonder they lost the election and no wonder Order. young voters refused to vote Senator for them in McKenzie. droves. So the two ways Senator that you McGrath. can deal with cost of living are bringing down costs, and that's what we fully intend to do Senator with the promises McGrath. that we put in place. The second way you can do it is by lifting wages, and everyone knows that will only happen under a Labor government. It will never happen under you, Mob. Thank you, um, Minister Watt. The time has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. We'll, uh we will try again and finally. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, congratulations on your ministerial appointments. Two weeks ago, the Australia Institute released research which showed that rising profits, not rising wages, are a primary driver of inflation in Australia. And earlier this week, former ACCC chair Mr Rod Sims observed that in times of high inflation, Companies in concentrated markets, which many Australian markets are, can use their market power to increase prices at a higher rate than their costs are increasing and further exacerbate inflation. Does your government accept that corporate profiteering is a primary driver of inflation in Australia? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, speaker, and I thank Senator McKim for the question. Uh, there's no doubt that inflation is the most significant economic challenge or rising inflation uh, that Australians are facing across uh, the economy. In terms of the drivers of that, I mean, I think we saw in, in yesterday's um, inflation figures from the APS, the main drivers beh behind that were um, dwelling costs and uh, rising fuel costs. Were the major contributors to that. We have uh, been very clear about our response to that. I mean, there are some things that we can do. Some of it is out of our control in relation to some of the, the international uh, pressures that are coming from China, uh, from the war in Ukraine, or China's COVID strategy and the war in Ukraine. They are definitely having impacts here locally. Domestically, where there are floods and, and some of those natural disasters that we've seen, some of the supply chain disruptions that we've seen, which are flowing on to higher costs for households. And the position that we have taken is that in order to respond to those, we need to assist households with long term policy responses which support lowering costs, so power, uh, prices, uh, childcare, investing in skills getting wages moving. They're the things that this government wants to do to deal with um, the reality of households dealing with uh, rising costs and rising interest rates, which are hitting households so hard. That's the focus of Dr Chalmers and I as we work together uh, to put forward um, our budget in October, but also over the longer term how we deal with some of the, the higher inflation and higher than expected inflationary impacts that we're seeing across the economy. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, Minister, the Treasurer has just told Australians that because the inflation is rising, they should brace for higher unemployment and further real wage cuts. But the Treasurer said nothing about what corporations who are earning record, record profits should brace for. Why is your government telling those who can least afford it to brace for yet more pain, yet we're hearing nothing at all? from the Treasurer about what the profiteering corporations should brace for. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Speaker. Well, I think uh, what you saw from the ministerial statement is a very honest assessment from the Treasurer about uh, what households are experiencing now and what they can expect in the future. And This has been part of the um, 
the, I guess, the different approach that we are taking to those of the previous government, where it was all about spin, short-term solutions, and political fixes. I mean, we, the assessment today in the ministerial statement, and it will be followed up in the October budget, is. Uh, giving people the best and latest information available to the government about what we expect to happen over the next year, updated, of course, in October. Uh, and I would say, in relation, you know, I think the government is going. I understand the point that Senator McKim is making, but the, the the approach this government is taking is about pulling people together, working with each other to secure. Uh, to deal with some of the challenges. It's no longer this divisive game that's been played Thank in politics you, Senator about Gallagher. those that Your have and those that have expired. not. Senator McKim, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, given corporate profits are at record highs, why has your government ruled out introducing a corporate super profits tax or taxes which could fund cost of living relief by providing high quality, free public services to Australians, such as free childcare, tru truly free public education, and putting dental into Medicare and helping Australians address the cost of living crisis. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, the government's position is that we will work with the private sector, with business, with community groups. Uh, right across the board. We don't want to divide, we don't want to point the finger between the haves and the have-nots and, and, and point the blame at anyone. We are dealing with significant economic challenges right now. Households are feeling it. There is no, no such thing as free money, uh, Senator McKim. There is no such thing as free money going anywhere. That You can just do this and it will be just that. It doesn't work. We, will be de we are dealing with these economic challenges that are thrown at us. We, will be, we are, in a, the first instance, looking, as households are trying to find extra dollars, we are also looking across our budget at ways we can reprioritise and reinvest to deal with some of these cost of living pressures. But we're going to be honest about it. We're going to work across the community and business to make sure that we get these decisions right. And Thank we're going to do Senator what we Gallagher. said we were going to do before the expired. election. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. And it gives me great pleasure to ask a question to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Minister, the emergence and rapid spread of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia has heightened public and industry interest. FMD is a potentially devastating threat to our economy and our industry and would cost billions of dollars. Can the minister please outline to the Senate the biosecurity measures that have been strengthened and introduced in Australia by you and the Albanese government to protect Australia from an outbreak of foot and mouth disease? Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, I know that agriculture in general, and particularly this outbreak, is something of great concern to you, uh, so I appreciate you asking a question uh, for the facts of the situation. Uh, the Albanese government is taking the threat of foot and mouth disease very seriously, and that is why we have introduced the toughest biosecurity measures that have ever been used in Australia based on expert biosecurity advice. I am pleased to say that as a result of these measures, Australia remains foot and mouth disease free. You might not know that based on what you're hearing from the opposition, but we remain foot and mouth disease free. And long may it stay that way, because an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Australia would have a devastating impact on our economy and on the livelihoods of thousands of Australians. In direct response to the spread of foot and mouth disease to Indonesia, and in particular to Bali, we have strengthened biosecurity measures beyond those that were in place under the former government to protect Australia from an e a foot and mouth disease incursion. These include, for the first time ever, wide-scale deployment of sanitation foot mats in every international airport in Australia. For the first time ever, the declaration of biosecurity response zones in all Australian international airports. And these things have never been done by any Australian government, despite the fact that we currently have 70 foot and mouth disease outbreaks around the world. There are so many measures that I don't have time to go through them, uh, but that is just a start on the types of things that we are doing, in addition to risk profiling 100 per cent of passengers returning from Indonesia and screening all mail and freight items coming from Indonesia and China. 
So it's no surprise, President, uh, that those strong measures have been backed in so strongly uh, by the livestock industry. For instance, Jason Strong from Meat and Livestock Australia says the federal government's response to date has been very coordinated and collaborative. Patrick Hutchinson from the Australian Meat Industry Council has said AMIC is very supportive of the Australian government's measured response. Fiona Simpson from the NFS has said the same thing. There are innumerable Thank you, comments Senator from industry. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. I really thank the minister for that comprehensive and detailed uh, answer to my question. My, um, Order. First supplementary. In addition to the recent outbreak in Indonesia, as you've also mentioned in your previous answer, Minister, can you please confirm, uh, not just over the 70 countries around the world, but what assistance have you and this government provided to our friends and neighbours in Indonesia to assist them to manage the outbreak? Minister Watt. Thank you, Thank you Senator Ciccone. Uh, foot and mouth disease obviously is heavily impacting Indonesia right now and its economy. And again, I might say that it was impacting Indonesia prior to the election of this government and prior to the introduction of the measures that we have put in place. With our assistance, with this government's assistance, Indonesian authorities are doing many things to get the outbreak under control. And on 15 July, I announced a $14 million biosecurity package to bolster Australia's frontline defence and provide more technical support for countries currently battling foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Of course, that followed the visit that I undertook to Indonesia to meet with Indonesian ministers about how we could assist. Now again, it's no wonder then that so many industry representatives have praised the government for what we've done, and it's no wonder that so many industry representatives have criticised commentary about this issue which has been more political than anything else. Ian McColl from the New South Wales Farmers Association says, I see some people out Senator there using McGrath. this outbreak as a weapon to further their own ends. And frankly, it's pretty disappointing. I wonder who he could be Thank talking you, about. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you, President. And it's very clear that uh, foot mouth disease, along with other pests and diseases, poses as a major risk to Australian agriculture. So my last question to the minister today is, could you please outline to the Senate how the government's response to biosecurity threats differs from that from the previous government. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Senator Cheney. Very, very good question. Uh, the coalition are full of ideas now that they're in opposition, but when they were in power, they didn't implement any of the measures that we have put in place, despite the fact that this outbreak got to Indonesia on their watch. This government has done more on biosecurity in nine weeks than that lot did in nine years. Everyone from the National Farmers Federation order, to the Northern Ter order. Territory Cattlemen's Association Senator and Ag Force in Queensland are supporting the government and criticising the opposition. As I say, Senator Mr McCall, McCall had more to say. He said, Mr McCall from the New South Wales Farmers Association, farmers have argued for stronger, sustainably funded biosecurity system for years. For years. This isn't something that's just happened overnight. Fanning the flames of fear will not help one little bit. Who could be fanning the flames? Order. I wonder who could be doing that. Order. Oh, Deirdre Chambers, she's over there, he's over there. Every single person on the opposition benches is fanning the flames of concern, is letting down farmers and is endangering Thank our you, international Minister trade. Your time has expired. Uh, order, Senators. I'm waiting to call Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Um, I'm just going to be really sensitive here. It is about domestic violence. My heart goes out to you people. But there will be questions that we need to ask to make sure that we can get these policy settings correct. Senator, respectfully, I want to know how your government's proposal to introduce 10 days domestic violence leave will work in practice. So my first question is this. Will employees have to tell their bosses that they are a victim of domestic violence in order to claim domestic violence leave? Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Lambie, for a really important question. Uh, I, I do realise that this is a very sensitive issue that, uh, frankly, affects many people in this chamber, let alone the wider community. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that our government is introducing legislation to provide domestic and family violence leave for the first time in this country. It's something that many people have needed for a long time, and I'm proud uh, that we have introduced that legislation, and I look forward to wide support of that legislation. As you would understand, I'm not the responsible minister, I am the representing minister, and I'm very happy to obtain specific answers to your questions. They're very uh, valuable and worthwhile questions, and I don't want to give you the wrong information, uh, but I'm, I'll provide that you with that information as soon as I possibly can. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, 
Senator Lambie. Uh, thank up. you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Minister, it's common for employers to ask their, their workers to show a medical certificate for their sick leave. What evidence will employees have to give their employer to claim domestic violence leave? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and again, thank you, Senator Lambie. Again, I will have to uh, come back to you with specific answers on those questions, not being the responsible minister. Uh, but I can assure you that this government does take the privacy uh, and, uh, of uh, victims of domestic violence very seriously. Uh, uh, I'm sure that Minister Burke, who's responsible for this legislation, has contemplated these issues uh, and, and is working with stakeholders around them. I'll certainly encourage him to continue doing so. Uh, but again, if you wouldn't mind if I could come back with some specific answers to those questions for you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. And lastly, will employees have to work in their job for a certain period of time before they can get access to that leave? And if so, how long? Senator Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Again, I'll need to take the detail of those questions on notice and come back to you as quickly as I can. Uh, if there's anything I can do as the repping minister to facilitate some further discussion with you and your team, I'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Nampajimpa Rice, I believe this is your first question. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. The sites of the current CDC income support programs were put in place at the request of the communities in which they operate. Can the Minister advise which of these communities and their community leaders were consulted by the Minister prior to the Labor, <coughs> excuse me, Labor Party making the decision to scrap the cashless debit card, and which of these leaders and communities supported that decision? Thank you, Senator Nampajimpa Price. Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, oh. uh, thank, um, I thank the uh, senator for her uh, question and uh, note that it is her first question and uh, uh, good luck uh, for your time here in the Senate. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this has been an uh, issue that the government uh, has been uh, dealing with. Um, um, in particular, the uh, Minister for Social Securities, um, Amanda Rishworth. Um, and uh, of course, uh, legislation was introduced into the um, Parliament, the uh, lower house, uh, earlier this week um, to end the process of the cashless uh, debit card. Um, the Well, I'll, I'll take I'll take that I'll, I'll take I'll take that uh, interjection, um, Senator Lambie, because uh, I am aware that the uh, minister did in fact um, consult very widely um, to all of the communities. Order. Well, I'm trying to answer. You, you've Order. interjected, uh, Senator Lambie, and I'm trying to answer the question as you've uh, as you've interjected. Um, I'm personally aware of a number of visits that um, Minister Rishworth uh, took to these communities. I can personally tell you that in South Australia, uh, Madam Deputy uh, President, um, she, uh, Madam, Madam, uh, Madam President, yes, <coughs> uh, change there, um, that uh, Minister Rishworth visited um, uh, Sejuna in South Australia. I'm aware, and she talked to the community um, um, there Minister about these Farrell, issues. Minister please resume your seat. Sorry. Senator Rustin. Um, uh, Madam President, uh, on a point of order in relation to relevance, um, uh, the question was very specific mm. about um, the consultations that had taken place before the decision that was made, and uh, I would ask the senator to make sure that when he is responding to that question, that he doesn't mislead the Senate, because I believe he may be referring to consultations or engagements that occurred after the decision Thank was made. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I'll remind um, Minister Farrell of the question, and, and uh, Senator Nampajimpa Rice Price, beg your pardon, asked um, which communities. Uh, requested coming off the CDC and which communities were consulted. Thank you, um, Minister Farrell. Well, look, I want to be clear that uh, those um, 
uh, discussions that took place did take place uh, after the uh, the election, but they took Thank place. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, Minister Farrell, the time has expired. Senator Nambajimpa Price, uh, first supplementary. Will the government guarantee that the rates of crime, including domestic violence, child neglect, and alcohol and drug-fuelled violence, will not increase after the removal? of this important social support program. Thank you, Senator Nampajim Price. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank the Senator, for uh, her question. Um, look, there obviously um, are serious issues in a range of uh, communities uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Um, but what we know from the uh, evidence of the 17,000 or so people who were on the cashless uh, debit card was that it wasn't solving the problems that it was alleged it it wasn't it wasn't it it, it wasn't Order. solving it Order. wasn't solving it wasn't solving that the problems it wasn't solving it wasn't solving the problems that uh, it was alleged to be fixed by this cashless debit card now labor could not have been clearer the Labor Party, the Labor Party uh, Senator, could not have been clearer about what its policy was in the lead up to the last election. We made Senator, uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, point of order on direct relevance. The question wasn't asking what the government's policy was prior to the election. The question was specific about the consequences of the legislation the government has uh, introduced for the abolition of the cashless debit card. Uh, and specifically asking the minister whether or not the government can give a guarantee that the rates of crime, domestic violence, child neglect, etc., will not increase. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. As you are aware, I can't direct a minister to answer a question, and certainly uh, Minister Farrell did talk about um, the evidence of proof and so on. So he was, in my view, being relevant to the question, and I would ask Minister Farrell to continue. Thank you. Um, um Madam President, um, look. The reality is that there was no evidence whatsoever that the cashless debit card. Thank was you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Nampajimpa Price, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Is the government intending to remove compulsory income management from the Northern Territory? Thank you, Senator Nampajimpa Price. Um, Minister Farrell. No. Thank you, um, Minister Farrell. You've completed your answer. Um, Senator Babette, I believe this is also your first question. Congratulations. Yes, it is. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the government is going to do to reduce the $963 billion of national debt? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Madam President, and I thank Senator Babbitt for the question and for his first question in this place. Uh, the senator is right to point out that we face a significant challenge managing the, the uh, almost a trillion dollars, it'll hit a trillion dollars next financial year, of Liberal debt that has been uh, left for this government to manage. Uh, well, it is, it is true. It is true. A trillion dollars, Order. a trillion dollars of liberal debt. Order. Trillion there dollars of liberal debt that that is left on the budget to manage debt, debt going out into the future. And whilst those opposite would like to say, would like to say that this is all a result of the pandemic. Senator Ayres. The, the, the former government had doubled the debt before the pandemic hit. Let's not forget that. Their fiscal vandals had done the damage before the pandemic hit, and now we are all going to be paying the price for it. And the cost of servicing that debt is increasing and increasing rapidly. At, and we've seen the latest figures from the Treasurer that some of that cost of servicing debt is going to exceed programs paid for that pay currently on childcare subsidy, higher education, those types of um, programs run by the Commonwealth Government, the cost of servicing debt is going to exceed those. That's the situation we're in, and that's why the work we're doing, uh, Senator Babbitt, through uh, 
uh, going through the budget line by line to see where sensible savings can be made so that we can reduce uh, that debt over time. It is one of the key challenges facing us as we work through the Expenditure Review Committee to make sure that we can deal with some of those challenges uh, over time. And servicing debt and managing the debt is a really important part of strong, Thank responsible you, budget Gallagher. management. Minister Gallagher. Senator Babbitt, second, uh, first supplementary, sorry. Thank you, President. Inflation has just risen to a horrifying figure of 6.1 per cent, absolutely huge. Now, the cost of electricity is a component of CPI. What is the government's plan to reduce the cost of electricity? Senator Gall Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the senator for the question. The, uh, the Labor government went to the last election with a plan uh, known as Powering Australia Plan that involved setting up a Rewiring Australia, which is a, a, a fund Well, it, we have to modernise the grid. I won't interject to Senator Rennick, but in case he hasn't noticed, we need to work out how to get more renewables into the grid so that we can lower power prices, something that you guys failed to do Order. over years Senator and years. Hughes. We need to grab the opportunities that come, the Senator opportunities Brown. that are going to come with modernising the electricity grid so that it can take in more renewables, good for lowering our emissions and lowering power Senator prices. Hughes. The cheapest price, the cheapest energy is renewable energy, and we can't get it into the grid. We can't get it into the grid because you guys did nothing. So that is what we'll do. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Order. Order. These are Senator Babette's. Senator Brown. I'll call all senators to order. This is Senator Babette's first set of questions. He has the right to ask them in silence and hear the answers in silence. Second supplementary, Senator Babette. The RBA has increased the cash rate, which has triggered an increase in home loan rates. Is the government's plan to help the millions of Australians who will experience hardship as a result of not being able to meet their ever-increasing mortgage repayments? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank the Senator for the question. And it's an important question because it's about how households manage with increasing costs, not just from mortgages, but from uh, sh you know going to the shops, filling their car up. The, you know the prices of everything are, is going up. Uh, the areas that we think we can make the most difference as a government, obviously there's the short-term um, additional payments that were made through the former government's budget, which are still going through the system. But where we believe that the most responsible investments can be made to support households so that they can manage some of these costs are by trying to lower power, lower power prices, lower childcare costs, getting wages moving and dealing with some of the supply chain blockages and disruption that we've seen. That's actually the areas where we as a government can make a difference. I think everybody understands the challenges that people are facing and that they can't be fixed overnight, but we're a responsible government that's going to make those investments to help over the longer term. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Marielle Smith. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Farrell. Australian exporters are struggling with the combined impact of 10 years of neglect on the world stage and the additional challenges of the pandemic. Can the minister advise how the newly announced Export Supply Chain Service will help our Australian food and beverage exporters navigate some of these challenges? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Smith uh, for that uh, question. One of the very Senator many. Uh, good young women on this side of the uh, chamber. Um, there's no doubt, uh, <coughs> President, that uh, some Australian exporters have done it really tough as a result of the neglect by the previous uh, government, the worsening conditions during the pandemic, as well as Russia's uh, terrible war on the Ukraine. Exporters are critical to our economy, and they deserve a government who will stand with them and ensure that they uh, uh, get the support they need to thrive. To this end, last week in Brisbane, I announced the establishment of a new service to help Australian food and beverage exporters navigate global supply chains. One of the biggest ongoing challenges for Australian exporters is getting their produce into international customers. Over the past few years, the freight environment has irreversibly changed. 
There's no doubt that the supply chains we see today are very different from the supply chains that we saw prior to the pandemic. To help these exporters navigate these complexities, the Australian government has established the Export Supply Chain Service. Under this new service, Australian exporters, states, territory governments, uh, industry bodies will have ex access to information and insights on supply chain issues. It will be, uh, it'll give uh, Australian uh, exporters, uh, Madam uh, President, the information and the uh, uh, insights uh, that they need to inform their decision making and navigate what has become very complex uh, uh, supply chain issues. Throughout the pandemic, many Australian businesses have demonstrated ingenuity and grit in response to ongoing trade disruptions. With the aid of the Australian uh, government, they will continue Farrell, to your do time so. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith, first supplementary. As we work to restore our international reputation, what is the minister hearing from Australian exporters and businesses about how the new service will support their recovery? Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith, for that uh, question. And, uh, Madam uh, President, um, I was fortunate. <coughs> sorry, um, I was fortunate enough uh, last week to uh, attend uh, the Brisbane uh, markets yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah yeah lovely <coughs> lovely set of markets Absolutely. and uh, visit a company called J H Levy. Uh, this is this is a company that uh, uh, exports a whole range of uh, produce uh, overseas. In fact, <coughs> you'd like to know this Senator Birmingham. I in fact saw them exporting some naval oranges from Wakery uh, into the uh, the China. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Rustin, Sen Senator Rustin approves. Um, this, 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 little company, this little company working out of the Brisbane uh, markets exports all over the world, and like all of the other companies that export this, uh, uh, these uh, great Australian products, uh, they have been suffering through this, uh, through this pandemic. Um, Thank um, you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Second supplementary, Senator Mario Smith. Yes. Order. Senator Smith. Can the minister advise what other actions the Albanese government is taking to facilitate and support trade opportunities for Australian businesses after a decade of inaction? Minister Farrell. Uh, thanks, Senator, uh, Senator Smith, uh, for her question, and uh, again congratulate her for taking an interest in uh, trade, which the opposite side don't seem to be at all uh, interested in. But. <clears throat> The Albanese government is uh, um, supporting Australian businesses because, because, well, let's talk about wine exports. Uh, you completely, Order. you completely Order. let down every Order. single exporter of wine in this country. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And one Order. of the reasons, one Senator of the reasons Smith. you lost this last election because you didn't understand what you were doing to Australian exporters in meat, Order. in crayfish, in wine, in barley. None of those, none of those, none of those industries got any support from this government. But Senator we are, McGrath. we are committed. We are committed to repairing the damage that you did to this country, to those exporters, and we're going Thank to you, do Senator it. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Order, Minister Wong. I'd like to move an extension, but I, instead I will say, <laughs> instead I will say, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, uh, just on the review of questions that uh, that you undertook uh, earlier, um, and noting that uh, that was first raised in relation to questions to Senator Watt from Senator McKenzie regarding foot and mouth disease, and that those questions went through related issues of foot mats, of uh, vaccines, and of biosecurity officers. Uh, in undertaking that review, I would encourage you, whilst noting I believe these questions are all in order, to equally look at the question from Senator Ciccone um, on the same topic of foot and mouth disease uh, that went through uh, domestic measures and then separately asked about assistance to Indonesia and then separately asked about the actions of the previous government. Uh, and I think you will find there's a consistency there. I would contend, President, that they are all in order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. We will take particular notice. Yes. Yeah. Um. Just so call him. Uh, 
Senator Watt, do you seek the call? Thank you, Deputy President. I advise the Chamber that I have additional information to provide in response to questions I took on notice during question time yesterday. And as is the custom, I seek leave of the Chamber to provide those answers. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Deputy President. In response to the question I took on notice from Senator McGrath, as I advised the Chamber yesterday, on the week commencing the 11th of July, 23,600 passengers arrived from Indonesia by air, with 90 per cent of those travellers uh, coming in from Bali. In answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Birmingham, I advise as follows. On 15 July, as part of the government's $14 million funding package to strengthen Australia's prevention and preparedness for foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, we announced 18 new biosecurity officers would be employed at our mail centres and our airports. The increase in biosecurity officers has been added to an already running biosecurity officer recruitment program, and this program will be finalised by the end of September 2022. Officers will then be trained and deployed to Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Darwin, Cairns and Adelaide. In the meantime, my department is bringing on an additional 65 contractors and 10 team leaders to assist with biosecurity efforts at our international airports and mail centres. New contractors began in both Sydney and Melbourne on Monday. In answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Roberts, the, number of the exact number of doses held in the vaccine bank uh, is considered confidential information in the interest of national security, including to protect against bioterrorism threats. Uh, we hold enough vaccine doses, I am advised, to cover at least the first four months of a disease response, which then provides time to order more vaccines should they be required. The vaccine manufacturer prioritises the production of vaccines for countries that are experiencing a disease outbreak, hence uh, the priority being given to Indonesia uh, at the moment. In, finally, in answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Cash, uh, stakeholders were consulted about the government's plan to abolish the ABCC on the following dates since the election. On 17 June this year, uh, a, me a meeting was held with the CFMEU Construction Division. On 21 June this year, a Zoom, was held, a Zoom meeting was held with the AWU National Executive. On 29 June, a meeting was held with the ACTU. On 5 July, a meeting was held of Commonwealth, State and Territory Ministers with responsibility for workplace relations. On 19 July, a meeting was held of the National Workplace Relations Consultative Council at Parliament House. I'm advised that at this meeting, the minister informed stakeholders that, quote, the building code will be amended to ensure that workers in building and construction are subject to the same rules to those in other industries. Council members include representatives from the Housing Industry Association, uh, Ms Melissa Adler, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, Scott Barklam and Andrew McKellar, the ACTU, Sally McManus, Michelle O'Neill, Scott Connolly and Liam O'Brien, the Business Council of Australia, Ben Davies, the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, Gerard Dwyer, the Australian Resources and Energy em Employer Association, Steve Knott, the National Farmers Federation, Ben Rogers, the United Workers Union, Joanne Schofield, the Master Builders Australia, Danita Wan, and the Australian Industry Group, Stephen Smith. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Rennick. To take note of answers provided by Senator Watt. Well, today was a masterclass by a minister who has clearly still got his training wheels on. This is a minister who is way out of his depth. And I've got a lot of experience with this man for the last three years. For the last three years, whenever we've done interviews together, this guy has done nothing but throw smear and mud. He hasn't been able to answer any questions. We've just got a long list of answers then from the questions that he took on notice from yesterday, because he is not around the detail. He is not around the detail. He doesn't take the livestock industry seriously in this country, and it's not surprising. He grew up in inner city Brisbane. He went to an inner city posh school. He's never gone any further west than the Oxley pub. He knows nothing about agriculture in this country. And let me tell you, the livestock industry in this country is the backbone of this country. It's not just beef, it's sheep and it's pigs, it's cattle uh, and camels and, all, and also all the wild feral animals. So if this gets out, if foot and mouth gets out, we've got a, a, a wild pigs roaming around out, out in the regions. This will be very hard to contain. 
And of course, what Senator Watt doesn't realise is he likes to blame the previous government for not doing anything. Was that foot and mouth only got into Indonesia on the 9th of May? But the key part of it was, was that it only got into Bali on the 5th of July. So that was when Labor took government. Uh, after Labor took government. Now that is a classic example of the spin by Senator Watt. Now, as he just pointed out, 90% of the traffic that comes from Indonesia is from Bali. Right? So that is why the previous government didn't do anything, right? Or in terms of didn't have to do anything because there was no serious outbreak until it gets to Bali. But when you've got travellers going over to Bali, coming back, and 90% of the people coming back are basically not thinking of foot and mouth. You don't expect to when you go to Bali. That's not the first thing on your mind. Senator Watt tries to downplay just how serious this issue is. And let me tell you this, that if foot and mouth gets into this country, it will be very serious. Every farm within a three kilometre radius of where foot and mouth outbreak is diagnosed will have to have all of their livestock destroyed on the spot. That will absolutely harm, if that, and, and if that continues, we will see a devastation of our livestock. Now, that is not a laughing matter, and that is something that Senator Watt should be taking more seriously. And we know that he's not because his good colleague here, Senator Ayres, pointed out that they took a long time to even have any foot mats. They didn't have any foot mats. So he's taken a long time to respond. He's only bringing on 18, 18 extra biosecurity staff. That is not enough. When you've got 90% of 323,000, about 300,000 people coming from Bali, how on earth is 18 extra uh, security uh, officers going to actually make sure that we trap foot and mouth in this country? And the other thing that I want to talk about is the, is the fact that the Labor Party think they are going to look after our youth. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Labor Party have a long history of destroying the dreams and aspirations of our young people. There is no greater example of that than the introduction of superannuation in this country. Right now, our young children who are on low incomes are having 10 per cent of their incomes taken from them. It has now just jumped to 10.5 per cent in the last week, in the last month, and Labor want to take it to 12 per cent. But that is not enough, because in the second term, if they get in, they are already talking about lifting it to 15 per cent. Now, I fail to see how that's going to help our young people deal with the cost of living when they are ripping money out of, our young, out of young people's pockets and giving it to their mates and industry super funds and their rivers of gold and their rivers of gold. And this is why they won't do anything about the corporate sector either, because the Labor Party today is the party of the big end of town. And never ever forget that. They've marched through the bureaucracy, they've marched through the corporations. They love big business. This is the party of big business, and, and they've just been ripping it, ripping the fees, th over $30 billion in fees, out of hard-working Australians every year. And this is why they go par paralytic when you ever talk about touching superannuation. It's not your money. You should give that money back to the young people and let them pay off their mortgages. But you see. They don't want that because the industry funds own over 20 per cent of the banks in this country. They want to be ripping off our young people both ways, through bank fees and interest and Thank superannuation you, fees. Senator Krogan. I also rise to make a broad and wild statement about um, the questions asked today of Senator Watt. Um, it's wide ranging, yes, because having such a broad um, such a broad remit here is is quite good. I think um, the first thing, just to be really clear, the manner in which this debate has rolled on over the last two days, there's been a, the asking of questions and no sense of wanting to hear the answers at all. So the footmats, it's very clear, they were decided upon by the minister. They were announced by the minister, they were commissioned by the minister, and they were then installed. They were installed on Monday. The numbers given were appropriate numbers. And I think that the, the, the entire approach here has been wild. I appreciate that the opposition may be suffering with quite a lot of grief at the moment, but the behaviour— OK, that's lovely. Glad to hear it. Um, it's important. Yeah. Um, the number of people 
returning from Indonesia since the outbreak was answered the previous day, and the updated numbers based on following questions were also answered. If you're actually looking for a genuine investigation of what's happening with this critical issue, then you should potentially improve your questions, listen to the answers and bring, bring further questions on from there. Senator Renning, I think excuse me. Yeah, we're, not, we're not here to get lessons on how to answer, put questions to the ministers, and if you could ask her to stay pertinent to the actual relevant well, I, questions. I appreciate the point of order, but I believe Senator Krogan is relevant. There's a fair bit of latitude in this, this, part, of the, um, standing, um, this part of the day. So I think if we're talking about the facts here, we have introduced the toughest biosecurity measures ever used in Australia. We have remained calm and focused on maintaining strict biosecurity quarantine protocols to keep this virus out of Australia, which is what we intend to do, which is what we will do with the measures that have been put in place. We have strengthened the biosecurity measures. We have a $14 million biosecurity package. We have deployed sanitised foot mats, as we've discussed. We have additional frontline resources at the airports and in mail centres. We have enhanced the mail profiling and inspections. We have added biosecurity officers, boarding planes on arrival. We have increased the information flow. Everything is being done to make sure that this issue is being managed and that we will not have an outbreak in this country. We have the support of the major stakeholders who also believe that we are dealing with this appropriately. So I don't think that there's um, room for the opposition to be looking at this situation as a joke, as a shouting match. There are facts here. The facts are fully available. We are taking appropriate action and this country will remain safe. Our relationship with our international, with our international friends and partners is something that the Labor Party has worked very hard on and has made fundamental improvements in in the last number of weeks since we took government. I would also um, range to the issue of the questions uh, from Senator Chandler around young people. Now, at the point at which, at the point at which Senator Chandler started asking her questions, and all the yelling and shouting and heckling was going on, the entire gallery was full of school students. Now. I'm pretty confident that the kind of behaviour they saw in this chamber is not the behaviour that they would be allowed to get away with at home or in the classroom. Now, heckling is something that goes on every question time, but not listening to the answers, not listening to the answers is not something that I believe we did. I will also take you to the fact that when we're talking about the economic future of young people and the situation they find themselves in. We have experienced a decade of energy policy paralysis. That is why we have got issues with our energy prices. We have spent a decade under the previous government with the wrong investments in skills and local manufacturing capacity. We have not boosted the jobs of the future. We have not invested in our young people. We have not provided them with appropriate training to build their careers and foster a positive future for themselves. This country, under the previous government, just totally put those young people aside and did not provide them with the opportunities that they deserve. Senator Macdonald. I rise to continue taking note of responses, uh, of questions given to uh, Minister Watt. As somebody who's been involved in the agricultural industry uh, all of my life and receive hundreds of representations from farmers and graziers across this country every week since the introduction uh, of or the discovery of foot and mouth in Bali, uh, I share uh, the industry's concern about the politicisation of this discussion. Uh, I called early for greater steps to be taken in the response, not because I was interested in a political outcome, but because 
I was urged by industry, by farmers, by graziers to provide a sense of urgency to both the department and the government. They were incredibly distressed about the impending risk to uh, their herd, to uh, their farmers and graziers' mental health, to the impact on consumers of the cost of food. Uh, but anyway, we all know we all know what the impact of both foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease would be on arriving in this country. We don't need to continue that discussion because it is too horrific uh, to think about. When foot and mouth arrived in the UK in 2001, it spread the length of that country after uh, contaminated meat came in on an airline food tray that was fed to pigs. It, came, it, it travelled the length of the country within days. It was into Ireland and then spread with the export of uh, vealer animals to France and to Netherlands. And this all happened within such a short time frame that the contamination and quarantine zones resulted in the destruction of six million head of sheep and cattle. The, the impact on those farmers, those butchers, those uh, transport uh, truck drivers, uh, uh, consumers uh, still lives with them uh, in them today uh, in, a, in a desperation. So uh, the, the response uh, that the opposition has had has, has not been, as has been suggested, a political one, but a sheer uh, desperation of ensuring that the government is making a proportionate response to the risk. A proportionate response. And that is our job. Our job is to ensure that we represent our industries and that the response is suitable. And I have to tell you that we are now week four, week four since the introduction of foot and mouth, or the discovery of foot and mouth in, in Bali. It is a completely different country because unlike other countries that you travel to, uh, there is a lot more uh, pigs, which are a super um, conductor of foot and mouth disease. It, it grows. Um, quickly and spreads easily amongst that herd. Uh, it is also 25% uh, of the people, the 143,000 Australians who travelled to Bali last month, 25% stay in a private residence where the uh, ladies who might be cooking for that family or that, that house return from caring for their sick animals at six o'clock in the morning and cook a, a meal for the Australian family before they get on a plane back to this country at, say, 8 o'clock in the morning. So the risk profile is very different, and that is why the previous government, uh, like this government, was watching the risks as identified by the department. But we are now in a different situation. Uh, so I acknowledge the measures that have been introduced by this government, but I do have to once again point out that they have been too slow. The foot mats that are in place are citric acid. Normally, contact with citric acid to kill a foot and mouth disease or a virus like that would be 30 minutes. We're asking people to walk across it, hopefully shake the dirt from their shoes and kill the virus as it falls on the mat. It doesn't address the entirety of their shoe. It doesn't address the other fo um, footwear and clothes that they have in their suitcase. We've also been asking that all food that comes into the country be dumped in big food tubs the way you do going into the Northern Territory or New Zealand, because that is a, a proportionate response to the risk to this nation. And we're also flagging that the response and the money being spent, the $14 million, the, the uh, vaccines into Indonesia, uh, into uh, Papua New Guinea, into Bali, is not enough. It is not fast enough, it is not proportionate, and that is the job we will continue to carry out. Senator Smith. Thank you. And, uh, Deputy President, this is my first opportunity to congratulate you on your role. I'd like to take it. I was getting a bit worried about the lack of South Australian representation in this chamber, so it's very pleasing uh, to see you in the chair. Um, not enough South Australians uh, uh, in, in that sort of area of the chamber, I would Thank say. You. Thank um, you for your kind I was words. really, really pleased to hear the, the sudden interest from the other side today on youth policy in Australia. Um, particularly on the economic impacts of youth. And I, I do wonder if the 
Opposition hadn't abolished the Youth Advisory Council if perhaps they would have less questions and more answers around what young people in Australia are thinking and needing and wanting from their government. And I'm very pleased to let them know that under a federal Labor government, a thoughtful, detailed youth policy is back. We're going to have a new youth engagement model. We're going to have a fantastic minister for youth in Anna Lee. So for all those questions which went unanswered for you during opposition because you abolished the advisory board, really great news. Young people finally have a seat at the table again, just as they should. Now, Senator Farrell referred to me as a young person today, and uh, whilst I don't take any issues with that uh, at the uh, age of 35, it's nice to still be called young. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I will be respectful of, uh, of those Australians who are actually um, in, the, in the government's definition of young, and I won't speak on their behalf or for them. But I will advocate for their interests, because you see, when, when, when this lot were in government, we saw uh, intergenerational theft of young people when they were forced to raid their superannuation accounts during the pandemic. Intergenerational theft. Targeting the people in our country with the lowest balances of superannuation, they were forced to raid that. Do you think they will ever get that back? Do you think they will ever catch up from that act of intergenerational theft? They will not. Young people in Australia are doing it really tough. And they've been saddled with the burden of a trillion dollars worth of debt from the former government. They've been saddled with a former government who had uh, low wages, stagnant wages as a design flaw of their economy, unlike the Labor government, which has already advocated to an increase in the minimum wage, which will make a real difference in young people's lives. Young people bear the burden of failures of government more than any other group in our society. They have to deal with it for the longest. And when I was elected to parliament, I made a vow to stand up for children, to stand up for young people, and that's exactly what I'm doing. And I am so proud to be part of a government with fairness at the heart of all of our plans, with concern for the next generation at the heart of all of our plans. We never stop thinking about the next generation. We never stop thinking about the next generation. We've got some great policies for them. Fee-free TAFE. What an excellent policy if you're a young person. 465,000 fee-free places, including 45,000 new places. My stepdad's a TAFE teacher. We've seen firsthand how amazing TAFE can be, how amazing TAFE can be, the opportunities it has for young people from the dedicated and passionate workforce which delivers it. For those kids who want to go to university, and look, we know university is not everything, but for some kids that's the thing which will unlock their dreams and out their potential in their future. $481.7 million to deliver 20,000 extra university places, unlike the former government which made it more expensive and more difficult for young people to go to university. If you want to hear about a positive agenda for young people. I could go on more. I'll take an extension of time. I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased you're interested. I'm really pleased you're interested. Really, really pleased. I don't, I'm so glad you're back, Senator Reddick. It's so great to have your engagement back. I think the only time I've been named in the Senate is in response to an interjection from you before, but I promise to behave myself this time. Deputy Speaker. It's nice to have you back. I know it's been a bit tough. I know it's been a bit tough, but it's nice to have you and your interjections back. Deputy Speaker, young people can trust that our government will never forget them. We'll never forget them in, in every way we consider and design policy. We take seriously our responsibility of custodians for the next generation. Our responsibility, our heartfelt belief, which defines all of us as Labor people, to leave this nation better for the generations that come after us. That is core to every single person who sits on this side of the chamber. It is our reason for being, our reason for being Labor. We care about the next generation. We will make Australia better for them because we're in it for them and not for ourselves. But great to have you back, Senator Rennick. Senator Brockman. Sorry about that, Mr Deputy President. I was just enjoying Senator Rennick's interjections, uh, which are always disorderly, I would remind Senator Rennick. Um, I too rise to take note on answers given by Senator Watt. And, uh, in beginning, I will note the uh, very thoughtful contribution of Senator MacDonald. Like Senator MacDonald, I do come from a farming background. 
uh, and like Senator Macdonald, I care deeply about the agricultural industries of Australia. And as Senator Macdonald said, one of the things that we are reflecting is in this place is the level of concern we are hearing from our agricultural communities uh, under threat from uh, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease uh, and the response that is currently uh, occurring. Uh, Senator Watt was sworn in on the 1st of June. From the 1st of June. Foot and mouth disease was present in Indonesia, yes, when Senator Watt was sworn in. Uh, but in July, foot and mouth disease reached Bali. A full month after Senator Watt was sworn in, arrivals from Bali to Perth in the month of July are around 17,000 people. 17,000 individual passengers returning to Perth Airport from Bali. By the evidence given and the dates publicly available as to when foot baths became available, foot cleaning became available in the airport, two days. There were two days of foot cleaning available in the airport. That means, and I'll be generous, we'll say around 1,500. At best, 2,000 passengers had access to those foot baths. So we had 17,000 passengers arriving back in Perth in the month of July. At best, around 2,000 of them having access to foot baths at a time when, for probably all that time, uh, foot and mouth disease was present in Bali. Now, foot and mouth disease was only detected in Bali, I believe, on the 6th or 7th of July. However, everybody knows that the presence of foot and mouth disease will predate the actual date of declaration. So we had effectively a full month with more than a month of warning before that, a month of Senator Watt being the minister, and so around 15,000 15, individual passengers returned on planes from Bali to Perth no foot baths and no increased levels of inspection. Um, now, and, and anecdotally, and I know you cannot rely on anecdotes in this place, you need hard evidence, but anecdotally I've spoken to numerous people who went through the airport from uh, returning from Bali in that period who ticked a box saying they had been to a farm, who ticked a box saying they had been to rural areas and who received no additional inspection, right. no additional inspection, no additional uh, precautions to take footwear out of bags, to examine it for dirt, to look for uh, uh, potential um, contaminated products in luggage. So you have people declaring, doing the right things. Australians do care about agriculture. Australians care deeply about agriculture. And you have people doing the right thing declaring and then nothing happens and then nothing happens and the other thing that worries those on our side is when you have a state labor minister downplaying downplaying the serious threat of foot and mouth disease saying oh it could make milk milk and meat cheaper have we heard one word out of the Federal Minister for Agriculture on that topic? Have we heard one word from Senator Watt, Minister Watt, the Minister for Agriculture, the minister who is responsible for, for protecting the agricultural industries of Australia? Did he repudiate that state Labor minister? Not a word. Not a word. And yet this is the state Labor minister who he said in his own words yesterday that he is relying on to manage Thank biosecurity. You, Thank you, Senator Brockman. I'm going to put the question uh, to the motion moved by Senator Rennick. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, the response to my question given by Senator Gallagher in question time. And, um, 
I want to start by making the point that despite in all three of my questions, the primary question, the first supplementary, the second supplementary question, despite me explicitly referring to the issue of corporate profits and specifically asking about the issue of corporate profits, Senator Gallagher could not bring herself to say the words corporate profit uh, in any of her responses to my questions. Now, the facts are these. Corporate profits in Australia are at record highs. They are soaring and they have never been higher. And corporate profits are significantly contributing to inflation and they are significantly contributing, therefore, to the cost of living pressures facing ordinary Australians. Now, in the House today, the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, gave a long speech telling Australians that they should brace for the tough times ahead. He told Australians to brace for higher unemployment. He told Australians to, ba to brace for their real wages to go backwards, or I should say to continue to go backwards. And he warned us to brace for those things because interest rates are going up. It was a speech heavy on the hand-wringing, uh, heavy on the old we don't want to gloss over the glaring issues shtick, and uh, heavy on the old we can't bury the bad news shtick. Uh, it was the Treasurer doing his best ashen-faced routine. But what was most striking about his speech is what he didn't mention. And what he didn't mention is that corporate profits are soaring. Corporate profits are at record highs, and a record high rate of Australia's income is being siphoned off by private capital. And not once did the Treasurer mention that these record high corporate profits are actually a primary driver of inflation in Australia. And that is a critical point, and it's a point that the Treasurer didn't make today in his speech in the other place, and it's a point that the Minister for Finance, the Minister in this place representing the Treasurer, refused three times to acknowledge today. Two weeks ago, the Australia Institute released research which showed that Australia is at the beginning of a price-profit spiral. Their analysis found it is rising profits, not rising costs or rising wages, that are driving Australia's inflation. And the executive director of the Australia Institute, Richard Dennis, made the obvious point. And he said this, I quote, while workers are being asked to make sacrifices in the name of controlling inflation, the data makes it clear that it is, that it is the corporate sector that needs to tighten its belt. And earlier this week, former ACCC chair Rod Sims said that one of the ways that big corporations can help fuel inflation is, and I quote, when there's high inflation, dominant firms often realise they can increase prices above any cost prices because consumers will be more accepting of this. In other words, when inflation is running hot, corporations with market power, which many Australian corporations have, use this as cover for profiteering. Now, this is fundamental stuff, obvious stuff. And by all accounts, next week the RBA will again increase interest rates. And this is going to hurt the most for those who live below the poverty line, as always, uh, renters, as always, and new homeowners, many of whom bought because they believed the governor of the RBA when he said rates weren't likely to move until 2024. But these people who are about to feel the pain because inflation is running hot have had little or nothing to do with causing inflation to be running hot. Instead of giving corporate Australia a free pass, the, the Treasurer should be telling corporate Australia to brace for a super profits tax. We need a super profits tax 
in this country to raise $460 billion in revenue so that we can do things like free childcare, put dental and mental into Medicare to address the cost of living crisis. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator McKim. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Honourable Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 3rd of April 2022 of the Honourable James Joseph Webster, a Senator for the State of Victoria from 1964 to 1980. I call the Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. And I think this might be the first time you've been in the chair while well, we've had an opportunity to um, congratulate you on your uh, very fine election. We're taking over. You'll have to be careful. <coughs> you have to watch it. Uh, but look, it's my uh, melancholy duty uh, on behalf of the uh, leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Wong, and I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of uh, Senator the Honourable James Joseph Webster. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death uh, on the 3rd of April 2022 of the Honourable James Joseph Webster, former Senator uh, for Victoria and Minister for Science and Environment, and places on record its gratitude of his service to the parliament and the nation and, the nation, and tenders uh, its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. <coughs> Um, Senator Farrell. So I rise uh, on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of a former Senator and Minister, the Honourable James Joseph Webster, at the ripe old age of 96. <coughs> As I begin, I wish to convey the government's condolences to his family and friends. Born in Tasmania in 1925, and specifically on Flinders Island in the Bass Strait, James Webster spent his first years there before his family moved to a farm near Melbourne. <coughs> After completing school with two brothers at the war, he remained at home to manage the farm and serve in the Air Training Corp uh, before training in business and accountancy. After gaining some experience in other environments, he would join a timber, hardware, and plumbing business founded by his grandfather that also undertook significant civil engineering projects. As I read the entry for James Webster in uh, the bi bi Biographical Dictionary of the Australian Senate, I was greatly encouraged. Following World War II and prior to joining the family business, he joined uh, a firm of timber merchants and became a delegate to the Australian Timber Workers Union which, if I'm not mistaken, um, <clears throat> was a union that uh, um, Senator Wong once worked for. And I'm just getting a nod. That is correct. Later, he worked as a tally man on the wharves and became a member of the Waterside Workers' Federation, another terrific organisation. Um, and what a sad thing that such a servant of the labour movement has passed away, I thought. So I was shocked to discover that when James Webster first entered the Senate, when he... Uh, filled a casual vacancy in 1964, it was a member of the Country Party. He would go on to serve in the Senate as a member of that party until 1990. I cannot help but think <coughs> the Nationals today would be better served if they had more members from trade union backgrounds. He was, he was also an elder of the Presbyterian Church at the age of 21 the same denomination of which uh, the father, a former Labor Senator, John Button, served as a moderator. But in truth, James Webster had a strong country party pedigree, with his father briefly representing the party in the Victorian Legislative Assembly and joining himself as a member of the Young Country Party. He would later serve as the party's, uh, on the party's federal council. Entering the Senate, he spoke of how grateful he was to have the Country Party's support and especially reflected on its policies, uh, and I quote him here, 
aimed at maintaining a free enterprise community with a minimum of control. <coughs> Given party uh, leader Sir John Blackjack McEwen was the foremost defender of the tariff wall, as Trade Minister now, I found those comments a little surprising. Like so many in his party, he walked both sides of the street, speaking about the importance of economic liber liberalism while staunchly advocating for government support for all manner of projects and schemes. Not much has changed. <coughs> Bringing his business experience to the Senate meant he was interested in economic issues combined with an emphasis on the breadth of Australia's wealth created by primary industries. He spoke about the importance of recognising and supporting this. These latter comments are sentiments uh, I would endorse. When he was born, his father was chairman of the local butter factory, so it was no wonder he lined up against the forces of margarine, which he thought would break the Australian dairy industry. Interestingly, in his first speech, he also reflected on the growing availability of television and the need to ensure the production of Australian content. His support of the Australian film and television industry was something he would continue right throughout his career. He, came, he became embroiled in the coalition opposition's relentless constitutional attacks on the Whitlam government by seeking a High Court injunction to inhibit the joint sitting of both Houses of Parliament under Section 57 of the Constitution that followed the 1974 simultaneous dissolution. The court did not find in his favour. Later, he found himself in the High Court for reasons not of his choosing, as his ongoing involvement in the family timber and hardware business was called into question after it was awarded government contracts. The High Court would find that his arrangements were not in breach with Section 44 of the Constitution. This was a fortunate outcome for James Webster, not least because he uh, was to become the minister in the, a minister in the Fraser government following Labor's defeat in 1975. James Webster served as a Minister for Science from 1975 until 1979, just before his retirement. In 1978, the environment was, adding to his, was added to his ministerial responsibilities. He was fortunate to serve at a time at which there was great support within the government and externally for the advancement of scientific and environmental matters. Some of his signature achievements, including multilateral progress in the Antarctic, a place in which he took a strong personal interest. He visited the South Pole on two occasions. Webster Bay, yes, Webster Bay in the Australian territorial section of the continent is named in his honour. He oversaw the restructuring of the CSIRO, having a strong appreciation for its role in supporting rural industry. Kakadu was declared a national park during his time as minister. Whaling was banned in Australian waters. The Great uh, Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, came under federal control and Prime Minister Fraser placed a ban on petroleum exploration on the reef. The latter resolved an issue that had been the source of some difficulty for the minister and within the government. Concurrently with his time as minister, he was the leader of the party in the Senate, having served as a deputy leader in opposition during the term of the Whitlam government, including, intriguingly, at the same time as he was serving as deputy president of the Senate and chair of committees. Faced with the prospect of a difficult election in 1980, James Webster offered to leave the Senate ahead of the election and became the High Commissioner to New Zealand a post in which he would serve for four years. Uh, James Webster was at times a contradiction. A business person who represented the, Labor, uh, the uh, country party, a farmer who became an environmental minister. Perhaps this is simply an illustration of the importance of a breadth of experience and ability to see different perspectives. This is something we can all take on board as we reflect on his life and service. The government again expresses our condolences following the passing of the Honourable James Joseph Webster and we again convey our sympathies to his family and those who knew him well. Senator McKenzie.
In the Senate Leader's Office of the National Party here in Parliament House hangs a two-metre parchment scroll honouring the service of every National Party senator for the past century. Almost exactly at midpoint on that scroll of five dozen senators is former Senator Jim Webster, who served as my predecessor as a Victorian Country Party senator, the leader of our party in the Senate from 1976 until his resignation in 1980. Today, the Senate records its deep regret at the death on April 3, 2022, of the former senator and places on the record our appreciation for his service to parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Jim Webster served in the Australian Senate from 1964 till 1980, representing initially the then Australian Country Party and from 1975 the National Country Party. He was Deputy President of the Senate for a period of almost two years, from early 1974 to the end of 1975, including a period as Acting President. Jim was the Minister for Science and later the Minister for Science and Environment for the Fraser government. He is remembered as an enthusiastic minister, relishing the new roles of science and the environment that had not been previously held by the Country Party. His achievements include most notably his work for the environment, for Australia's Antarctic research efforts, establishing the National Marine Science Research Centre in Hobart, and the CSIRO's Australian National Animal Health Laboratory at Geelong, which provided a world-class facility for the safe handling of exotic animal diseases and his support for the fledgling Australian film industry. One of the great achievements of Senator Webster was his work in ending pirate whaling. Uh, often in the National Party and previously the Country Party, uh, as Senator Farrell has noticed, uh, noted, um, what seems like being contradictions is simply challenging stereotypes. And uh, I don't think it's anything unusual for National Party or former Country Party senators to care about their environment and when they have the opportunity as ministers in this place to make um, pragmatic changes to our environmental system uh, and, and uh, efforts. He was uh, instrumental in introducing the Indian Ocean Whale Sanctuary. Green senators, please take note. Uh, we want to achieve actual environmental outcomes, not merely virtue signalling. I wish to place on the record to the Senate a brief account of Senator Webster's formative years. Jim's family moved from Tasmania to a farm near Melbourne when he was four years old and later, whilst a student at Caulfield Grammar, he found himself running the family farm whilst his older brothers served in World War II. In what was a clear desire to serve his country, Jim joined the Air Training Corps in Essendon, achieving air crew status. After the war and further study, primarily in accounting, Jim joined a firm of timber merchants and became a delegate of the Australian Timber Workers Union. We love our forestry industry. Stints as a clerk at the log mill and as a tallyman on the Melbourne wharves, where he joined the Waterside Workers' Federation, made for an interesting background which could have put him on a path for a different seat in the Senate. He was an elder at the age of 21 in the Presbyterian Church of Victoria, whilst also active in the Junior Chamber of Commerce and Rotary Club of Caulfield. And he was a member of the West Brighton Club, which amongst its members included one R.G. Menzies. Jim's father had served three years in the Victorian Parliament, and Jim became active in the Australian Country Party, ultimately leading to his nomination in 1964 to fill a casual vacancy in the Senate. Reports suggest Jim was very much reflective of the breed of fresh-faced senators keen to put their stamp on this chamber, becoming a member of many committees and vocal in support of rural and regional areas of Victoria and, more broadly, across Australia. The dairy industry was the focus of perhaps his strongest and fiercest support, with Jim explaining to anyone who'd listen in the margarine industry that seeking to break the Australian dairy sector, that was seeking to break the Australian dairy se sector, he rallied against dubious advertising of the margarine industry, such that one Labor senator referred to him as the Honourable Senator for Margarine. Jim had a particular interest in Papua New Guinea having early been active in the then Territory through the National YMCA movement. Jim once sailed a 50-foot yacht from Melbourne to Rabaul 
and had walked over much of PNG and New Britain over the course of his many visits. He advocated strongly for PNG's independence, but his prerequisite was for a sound economic base to be established before independence. Jim became embroiled in events which ended in the dismissal. He was one of two senators who asked the High Court of Australia to stop a joint sitting of both houses voting on a group of bills that had been the catalyst for the 1974 double dissolution election. The bid failed, and with the court ruling that the government of the day could stockpile bills that failed to pass the Senate before proceeding to a double dissolution election. He did survive another engagement over his pecuniary interests um, in the family business and also survived pressure from Liberal members to resign over oil drilling in the Great Barrier Reef. He was also pivotal in ministerial service. Jim also strongly encouraged Australian involvement in Antarctica uh, from a national sovereign interest perspective and backed an agreement negotiated with the United States and New Zealand for a cooperative air transport system to Antarctica. He twice visited bases and the South Pole and his commitment to the continent is recognised with Webster Bay in the Australian territorial section of the territory being named in his honour. Jim's service to Australia did not end with his time in the Senate. He resigned in 1980 and became Australia's High Commissioner to New Zealand, a position he held for four years before returning to farming and business in his beloved home state of Victoria. On behalf of the opposition and the Australian Senate and the Victorian Nationals, to Jim's loved ones, his four sons and four grandchildren, I extend our gratitude for his service to a thankful nation, a grateful party, our sincerest condolences. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. Now come to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Farrell. Oh, sorry, sorry Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I thought you were singing <laughs> you the call there the for a moment. Attack there, Deputy President. Um, I presented additional information received by committees relating to estimates. Thank you. Uh, Sen I caught, Senator Rice caught my eye. Do you wish me to give the call to Senator Scar first? Senator Rice. If it was the end of the consideration of documents, that's uh, yeah. Oh, Senator Scar. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, uh, I seek to take note of items relating to committee reports and government responses first. We're not, Senator Scar, we're not quite there apparently. But okay. Thank you for your anticipation. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on page three to four. That. Ah. <laughs> Senator Wright. Thank you. I seek, leave. Apologies. I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition um, relating to the suspension of Workforce Australia payment cut-offs from 31,425 signatories, which I understand has been agreed to by the Whips. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on page 3 and 4, 324 of the notice paper. Senator uh, Thank you. I uh, rise to take note of documents number 1, 2, 5 and 7 on page 3 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Do you want me to keep going through the pages? I'm just going to take note and seek leave. Yep. Yes. Um, under committee reports and government responses, I uh, take note of uh, numbers six and seven on page four uh, and page nine and 17 on page five. And under Auditor General's reports on page six, 
I take note of document 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I'm seeking to take note of items uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 on page 3, items 8 and 9 under documents on page 4, and in relation to committee reports and government responses, items 3, 4, 5 and 6 on page 4 and items 11, 13, 15, 16 and 18 on page 5 and in relation to Auditor General's reports, items 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 on page 6 and items 10, 11, 12 and 13 on page 7 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is there any other, any other senator seeking? Uh, senator Still John. Hello. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, <laughs> could I I'll just get, are we in tabling and of consideration of documents? We are? Excellent. Could I seek to <laughs> Jesus, sorry. Could I seek to um, I order, yeah, could I seek to uh, um, speak to document seventeen, please? What is the words? Uh, I'm, could I, is that something I can do? Sorry. It is still John. Oh, we uh, we're gotten... still dealing with documents at the moment, so awesome. you have time. Thank you very much. An opportunity coming. Yes. Does any other senator wish to uh, uh, seek to uh, speak on a document? Because any document that does, to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Uh, senator. Moment responses yet, have we? Senator Shoebridge. We haven't yet got to committee reports and government responses. No, we haven't. So we're, you've, you'll have your opportunity in a moment. Okay. The Senate will now. Uh, it, leave has been requested. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We'll now, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses, and Auditor General's reports, which are listed on pages four to seven of the notice paper. Senator Shoebridge. Mr Deputy President, um, uh, I, I, I move that the Senate take note of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee report, the performance and integrity of Australia's administrative review system. Madam Acting Deputy President, um, this, is not my first this is not my first speech. It's a basic principle of law that decisions should be made on the merits of the case and applying the law to the evidence and the evidence to the law. And it is pretty clear from not just this document but from other material in the public domain that the AAT is failing on this principle. It's also a basic principle of good governance, or it should be, that appointments, particularly to senior and influential positions, are made on merit. And the AAT, in its current form, is failing on that principle. And in fact, your outcome in a case shouldn't depend, depend on which tribunal member you receive. It should depend upon the facts and the law. But in the AAT, it does. It depends upon which member you draw. And in fact, research published in the Saturday paper examined more than 18,600 AAT decisions in relation to protection visas. And this ranged over a more than five-year period, from the 1st of January 2015 up until mid-May 2020. And what did that research show? Well, it showed of members who'd considered more than 50 cases. So it was only where there was a statistically sufficient sample that it did the analysis that, in fact, one member did not find in favour of a single person seeking protection—not one case. 
15 members found in favour of less than 5 per cent of the cases that came in front of them, while three members approved more than half and one member approved some 86 per cent of cases. It's hard to imagine what it would be like to be a person seeking protection from this country after often receiving appalling mistreatment from the country they've, they've, they've fled from. To come to this country, a country that's meant to be under rule of law and protects human rights, you finally get to the tribunal. You rock up to court after sometimes two or three years of delay. And when you get to the court, your lawyer turns around and says, well, actually, do you know what? You can't win this case. You've got naught percent chance of winning this case. And it's not about the facts. It's not about the law. It's because you've drawn Joe Bloggs, who's going to slot you. And he does it, he or she does it every single time. That's not a justice system. That's a lottery. And the Grant Institute's analysis of the AAT gives some insight into why this is happening. It showed that of the 320 members of the tribunal that it had reviewed at that time, 22 per cent had an overt and direct political affiliation. And of course, you add to that the spray of appointments that this the former coalition government made as it was heading out the door, lucrative gifts to very senior mates that it gave as it headed out the door, and you can see just how politically skewed the AAT has now become. And, and jobs for the mates compounds the other injustices that, that people before the AAT have. And in, in the submission from the AAT, and credit to them for at least giving it a go and putting in a further submission, that they, that, that in response to the, the, the issue about um, merit-based appointments, they say that the AAT supports merit-based appointments. It's just that no such system exists. It is the most politically slanted tribunal in the country. And the coalition's election eve handout delivered a lucrative senior member position, paid more than the president, is my understanding, of this place, um, to the former New South Wales Liberal Minister, Prue Goward, as well as appointing a former Scott Morrison Chief of Staff and four other now members of the AAT with direct and overt links to the former coalition government. That's not about justice. It's going to do nothing to reduce the continued backlogs of the AAT. It's just more jobs for the mates. And it's at the cost of the litigants who appear in front of that tribunal, and it's the, at the cost of the integrity of the justice system. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, would you re re resume your seat for a moment? Thank you. Uh, on, on a point of order, Senator Scott. Point of order, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've been listening very closely uh, to the senator in the context Scott, of Standing the Rule of 1933 oh. yes. uh, in relation to uh, senators not making imp or not imputing improper motives uh, to judicial officers in particular. And I was listening very carefully, and I think the senator crossed the line when he actually referred to uh, Prue Goward. Uh, and also to another judicial officer by name, and I'd ask him to withdraw those in reflections of improper motives. Uh, well, thank you very, thank, thank you very much, Senator Scar. I have been listening very carefully, and I do acknowledge that there were some comments that were negative about the AAT. I, I don't know that they were mentioned in the context of those particular names at the, simultaneously. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless. I believe it would be assistance to the chamber if you were to withdraw Senator Shoebridge. Could I speak to the point of order? Uh, yes, you have the call. Yeah. I was impugning the motives of the government that made the appointment, which I maintain, but to make it clear, um, I'm in no way impugning, and to the extent there was any imputation just, taken, could I withdraw any there, imputation Senator against Shoebridge? the member. Okay. Thank you. Just hold on clearly. I well, want to be done. clear. This is not a time for debate. But you have the option to make a point of order, and now you have declared that you are withdrawing. Is that correct? Well, to, to the, I want to make it clear that uh, I withdraw any imputation against the, the member. You, just, I, you don't need to make a speech about it, it, it in this place. It's just, terrific. I withdraw will suffice. If you could do that for me, Senator Shoebridge, that would be very helpful. 
Well, indeed, I withdraw any imputation against Thank the you. member. Thank you. And you may continue your remarks. You have 33 seconds remaining. Thank you. Um, Madam Deputy President, um, it is clear that the AAT is cooked. It is clear that it is one of the most highly politicised tribunals in the country, if not the most politicised tribunal in the, current, in the country. And, and it is largely as a result of 10 years of overtly politicised appointments by the, by the former coalition government. It is the task of this parliament and the new government to reverse this, not just Senator, for the individuals, but for the expired. status of... Uh, um, I see Senator Steele, John, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. You, Thank you. have you. the call. Acting and are you responding to the same item on the uh, notice? No, different, different right. item. Would you like to indicate which document you are going to speak uh, to? Document 17. Document 17 on page? Oh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, on page 5. The National Disability Insurance yes, Scheme Joint Standing Committee report. You have the call, Senator Steele John. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, in speaking to this uh, report today, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to summarise uh, for the Chamber um, the key findings of the uh, NDIS Joint Standing uh, Committee's work uh, for the previous Parliament. It's a committee that I um, have been proud to serve on uh, for the last uh, three or four years um, and has done some incredible work uh, alongside enabled by the disability community, uh, particularly in relation to pushing back against uh, some of the very worst ideas brought forth uh, by the previous government. Alongside the disability community, the Greens have been calling um, during the course uh, of uh, the committee's time and in response uh, to the recommendations that it has formulated uh, after engaging deeply, authentically uh, with disabled people for transformative changes uh, to the NDIS. In acknowledgement of the simple truth uh, that disabled people should be able to access under the NDIS every single support uh, that we need to live a good life. Um, and th that is exactly what the NDIS was created to do, to provide disabled people with access to the supports and services that we need to live a good life. In recognition of our uh, national obligations uh, under international law, uh, but on a deeper level in recognition of a collective community responsibility to work together um, to bring down the barriers of structural ableism that exist in our society. Uh, as we can see clearly laid out in the summary report uh, of the committee, um, the government, the previous Morrison government, uh, tore constantly at the NDIS, tore at the NDIS, tore at disabled people, sought to shut us out, to kick us off, to cut our plans, uh, and to force us into uh, and a, 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 an administrative appeals tribunal, which my colleague uh, Senator Shoebridge has just drawn our collective attention uh, to, is cooked, is stacked, uh, and is now in so many ways uh, no longer fit for purpose and in urgent need uh, of complete revamp and reform. Indeed, in its dying days, the government and the agency leadership colluded together uh, to basically transform the Administrative Appeals Tribunal uh, into a final uh, and impassable wall, uh, past which disabled people and their families uh, found it almost impossible uh, to get over or get under. Um, people were forced to go to the Admi Administrative Appeals Tribunal to defend their rights to supports and services which they had been receiving uh, for many years. And when finally a day for a hearing would come or a date would be set, the agency would settle because they knew they didn't have any case. They were just attempting to defeat the legitimate claim of disabled people and their supporters to access services uh, so that they didn't have to continue to provide those supports and services. They were fighting an administrative war of attrition against disabled people. Now, the solution uh, to so many of these problems uh, is in twofold. First, we must recognise uh, clearly what brought us to this moment. Now, the NDIS was created 10 years ago uh, thanks to the collective 
campaigning, of disabled people, our families, our supporters, our allies. Community organising, community activism brought the NDIS into creation. Uh, to fulfil the obligation to provide services and supports to disabled people so that we can live uh, our lives uh, equal and free in Australian society. At that key moment and juncture, disabled people, having delivered the change, were too often shut out of the implementation. And the decentering of disabled voices uh, in bureaucratic processes, in policy creation, is a key part of what has led uh, to the brokenness of so much of the NDIS as we see today. But it is not unsalvageable. By giving it the appropriate resources, by ensuring that everyone in it uh, has thorough anti-ableism training, by ensuring uh, that disabled people are empowered to lead as the CEO, as the chair, on the board, in the senior management. These are the ways that we will fix the NDIS. These are the reforms uh, that the Greens will continue to work with the disability community uh, to see achieved, as well as ending discriminatory age capping within the scheme. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of document number 10 on page 5, COVID-19 Select Committee Final Report. Thank you, Senator Roberts. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that government mismanagement of COVID has fuelled rampant inflation, created a debt blowout, blowout, has destroyed jobs, businesses and families, and has created a two-tier society. Louis Pasteur, the famed 19th century microbiologist, said that individuals, communities and nations expect governments to use all the available tools of science and public policy to combat the threat of infectious disease. And where such tools are lacking or poorly used, responsible leaders are expected to take action, plugging the gaps and enhancing execution. Australia's COVID-19 response, as we re reeled from failure to disaster, was neither enhancing nor focused on plugging gaps. As our cost of living and mortgage costs spiral, we must ensure that the poor planning, failures and uncontrolled government spending never happens again. We must. Labor went through COVID-19 and meekly agreed with the Liberal Nationals. Instead of standing up for Australia, Labor hid behind their state health bureaucrats' decisions when state government decisions based on poor research and unproven vaccines steamrolled our freedoms and rights. Labor and the union did nothing to protect us or our freedom of choice. Labor states are not fixing ambulance wait times or ramping. Australians are now unsure if they can trust their healthcare system to protect them when and where they need help. We must have a detailed forensic analysis of what went right and what went wrong. We must show the people we have learned from the COVID mismanagement. Early on, we were told there was no need for masks. Later, we heard this was because the government did not have enough masks in stock for us. Then the injections that were forced upon us still left the aged and the vulnerable at risk, and injected people are now dying. There was no real COVID plan. There still is no real COVID plan. The politicians and bureaucrats just had a template for forming layers of committees to protect themselves from accountability. Look at the fake national cabinet and the secret decisions. I refer you to the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 report at recommendation 19, Madam Acting Deputy President. Quote, the committee recommends that a royal commission be established to examine Australia's response to the COVID-19 pandemic to inform preparedness for future COVID-19 waves and future pandemics. What happened? Why do we need a royal commission? Because only a royal commission is likely to have the power necessary to compel the health expert the expert health advice Australian governments relied on to justify and implement pandemic measures. Much of this advice has been hidden from the Australian people, and we're starting to find out why it's been hidden. We need a Royal Commission because this inquiry must be completely transparent to the Australian public. Failing to learn from our mistakes means that Australia will be just as unprepared next time as we were this time, and more people will die, needlessly die. There have been so many errors of judgment during COVID. For example, government taking recommendations from medical bureaucrats without considering the economic impact of jobs and businesses that cost more lives. Lockdowns, border closures and business failures. Conflicts of interest with big pharma, rampant. Putting pressure on doctors to comply instead of caring for patients. School closures and the impact on our mental health. 
cancer and cardiac patients being barred from hospital and treatments that led to a rise in mortality. People being denied treatment. The mismanagement of a hotel quarantine and the construction of expensive facilities far too late to be used for COVID. Regulations that introduced a terrible and devastating new, no jab, no job society and more. The question of whether a person died of or with COVID is meaningless to a grieving family. If we had protected our aged and vulnerable better, fewer would have died and the rest of us could have got back to work sooner. Australians want to know that we will never have another COVID debacle. We cannot afford the cost in dollars, jobs or human lives. Australians must come together as one community, as one nation, to tell Labor we want the Royal Commission, the Senate Committee inquiry recommended and that Labor chaired. Today we need safe jobs, affordable housing and rentals. We need tax reform, a less complex industrial relations system and we need cheap, sustainable energy. COVID-19 mismanagement must not become Labor's excuse for letting Australians down on these other important issues. I call on all present in the Senate to support our request for a Royal Commission on behalf of the Australian people. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I move that the Senate note the 489th report, Defence Major Projects Report. Um, and I note at the outset that this uh, is— Before you commence, could you just indicate uh, what page— it's number one on page four. The Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee. Did I say number one? I, yes. I think I did. I actually meant to say number two. That's OK. So number two, the Public Council Norton Joint, Joint Statutory Committee, 489th Correct. report. Um, you have the call, Senator Shoebridge. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, first, I note that this is not my first speech. Madam Acting Deputy President, with inflation at record levels and a cost of living crisis hitting everyday Australians, when this government is telling workers to wait for a living wage, why can we always find money to increase spending on weapons and war? The Major Projects Report is an annual review of the Department of Defence Defense, uh, Equipment Acquisition. And we need to see more transparency and more accountability regarding the extraordinary amount of our public wealth that is spent on, on the military. Defence acquisition is expenditure is ramping up. And in 2021-22, there was in fact a $2.1 billion increase in acquisition spending on the previous year. And this government has committed to yet a further increase next year as they pledge to spend more than 2 per cent of Australia's GDP on defence. And indeed, the only difference between the Labor Party and the Coalition on Defence in the election campaign was who was going to promise to outspend the other. We're being told now to prepare for an austerity budget, to brace for cuts that will hurt everyday Australians. But has the defence establishment been warned to brace for a budget cut? Well, no, quite the opposite. But what do they do with the money that we give them? Well, this report and the report that follows makes quite disturbing reading. As at the 30th of June last year, the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group, or CASIG, within Defence was managing 161 government-approved major acquisition projects and 13 what they describe as minor projects, with a collective cost of $121.6 billion. Well, a collective cost as at the time that report was written, because we know it's blown out since. But what, when you look at Defence's capacity to deliver that, it makes sad, sad reading. The 2019-2020 MPR shows forecast delays across all projects of some 507 months. That's a collective delay of 42 years. And in the latest MPR, the forecast is still a staggering 405 months, or a collective delay of some 34 years. That's the value for money we're getting from the, from the defence establishment. And, and the cost, once approved, is blowing out to an extraordinary degree. When you look at the 2019-2020 report referenced in this public accounts um, uh, committee report, you, we can see that the cost blowout just of the acquisitions program, just the acquisitions of defence, and just the cost blowout 
was $24.2 billion. That's just how much it was above budget. But that's enough to fully fund our education system and to cancel about a third of HECS debt. And that's just the cost blowout. And in the most recent report, the cost blowout is sitting at $18.3 billion, or a 31 per cent variance on the budget, more than a third more than what they initially said. And if you go back year on year on year, there's not a single year where the variance wasn't multiple billions of dollars above the initial estimate. Yet we keep going to defence, the same broken institution when it comes to this budgeting, and asking them how much money they need, and they keep giving us a figure, and every single time it's wrong, every single time it's lowballed, and we're caught in the middle of these major acquisition projects paying billions and billions of dollars more than what the defence establishment initially said every single time. Surely at some point we will learn. Surely at some point we will apply genuine rigour to this extraordinary expenditure of our public wealth on weapons and war. In fact, there's a lot more to see here. But the truth is the Labor and the Liberal parties don't want us to see it. And why can we always find the money to increase spending on weapons and wars that kill children? that destroy countries and destroy communities? Well, the answer is simple. It's that both major parties have agreed to do this and to deliver the report and not even debate it, not even question a $20 billion blowout from defence, not even raise a ripple in this chamber. But for this contribution, it would have gone through in silence. Well, it's time that ended. It's time we applied a blowtorch to this extraordinary degree of expenditure of our public wealth on weapons and war. It's time we did more than just comfortably agree to give the military whatever they want, and the Greens are up to that job. Senator Shivridge, thank you. Uh, are there any more speakers? If there isn't, we shall now move to ministerial statements. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, I table a ministerial statement on the economy and I seek leave to make a short statement about, in relation to the document. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Minister. Uh, I am tabling the Treasurer's ministerial statement on the economy that the Treasurer presented in the House of Representatives today. Now, as the Treasurer said, Australians know that this government has changed hands at a time of instability, uncertainty and volatility around the world and at home. We have wanted to be upfront with the Australian people about the international factors that buffet us and the domestic, economic and budget pressures that we are working through. We also know that Australians are already experiencing the consequences of these circumstances every day. We recognise that Australian families are under pressure. You see it when you go to the shops, when you fill up at the Bowser, or when your bills arrive. The Liberals and the Nationals gave this country a wasted decade. Instead of investing in the Australian people, they invested in waste and rorts, missed opportunities and messed up priorities. And fixing that mess is going to take time. But despite all these challenges, we know that this is also a period of great opportunity for Australia. We are already at work on our main task to build a stronger and more resilient economy. It's an economy that will be powered by cheaper, cleaner, more reliable energy and with Australian workers that have the right skills in secure jobs with decent wages that grow strongly and sustainably. And this is our chance. This is our chance to build a better future for all Australians. Now, as the Treasurer outlined in his statement, the Australian economy is growing, but so are the challenges. Some are homegrown, some come from around the world. And to that extent, Australia is not alone. The global picture is complex and the outlook is confronting. The International Monetary Fund has this week significantly downgraded the outlook for global growth both in 2022 and 2023. China's strict COVID containment measures have had a substantial impact on their output and have made existing supply chain disruption more severe. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has undermined energy and food security and increase global prices. 
In his statement, the Treasurer outlined new economic forecasts from the Treasury. These forecasts better reflect the economic circumstances, such as higher inflation and slowing global growth that our government is dealing with. Now, the Treasurer announced these revised forecasts well ahead of the October budget because, as a government, we consider that Australians deserve to know where our country is positioned. And there are a couple of issues in the Treasurer's speech that I want to draw attention to, particularly around inflation, particularly around the budget. So while the Australian economy is outperforming much of the world, high inflation is impacting on Australian living standards. In an environment where workers are not getting enough wage rises, not getting the wage rises to match the price rises. In the pre-election forecasts, inflation was expected to peak at four and a half percent. My apologies, it was four and a quarter. It's now 6.1 per cent through the year to June and now forecast to peak at seven and three quarter per cent in the December quarter this year. So as the Treasurer has said, the current expectation is that inflation will get worse this year, moderate next year and normalise the year after. A combination of higher interest rates combined with a global slowdown will impact on economic growth here in Australia. The revised economic outcomes and forecasts are expected to cut half a percentage point from growth for the last financial year, this financial year and the next financial year. So instead of four and a quarter per cent growth in real GDP last year, as estimated before the election, it's expected to be three and three quarters per cent in 2021-22. Instead of three and a half per cent this year, it has been revised to three per cent. And next year, instead of two and a half per cent growth, we are looking at two per cent. It's largely driven by weaker consumption on the back of higher inflation and interest rates. So yes, the economy is growing, but there are challenges ahead. We've been upfront about those challenges that we have inherited. And that, of course, includes the trillion dollars of debt left by the previous government. We know that the government's last-ditch pre-election budget is chock full of waste and rorts with a series of expiring measures. We also know that there are long-term demographic challenges that come with critical and necessary spending. I want to make a comment on the final budget outcome for 2021-22, which will be published soon. It's likely to show a dramatically better than expected outcome for a few reasons. Temporary factors like supply chain disruptions, capacity constraints and extreme weather delayed some spending, while low unemployment and volatile commodity prices boosted revenue. These are temporary factors, and we know that the short, medium and longer-term pressures on the budget remain and are more pronounced. You will see a full set of fiscal forecasts in the October budget, but the additional impacts of COVID-related expenditure is already costing the budget an extra $1.6 billion this year. We also expect government payments to be around $30 billion higher over the forward estimates than forecast pre-election because of issues like inflation and wage expectations. We also have a growing debt burden left by the former government, the highest level as a share of the economy since the aftermath of the Second World War and with deficits that stretch beyond the decade. That debt burden is growing heavier due to the impact of higher interest rates on repayments. And let us not forget that this is a government that, even before the pandemic, had more than doubled gross debt. So we want our budget in October to be about high-quality investments in the right priorities. We're already working on our audit of waste and rorts, and the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance are going through the budget line by line to ensure that our spending is about building value. The budget will be an opportunity to deliver the commitments that the Australian people voted for in May. And while we recognise that our choices are constrained by the fiscal situation, we have an economic plan to lift the speed limit on the economy. And it's a plan with three elements. The first is to address the cost of living pressures, like cutting childcare costs and cutting the cost of medicines on the PBS by up to $12.50 a script. The second is to grow wages over time, and we've already demonstrated our commitment through successfully arguing for a decent pay rise for the lowest paid. And the third is to strengthen supply chains and deal with the supply side of the inflation challenge, like investing in cleaner and cheaper and more reliable energy and addressing skills and labour shortages. The economic statement today paints a challenging and confronting picture. 
But as the Treasurer has said, the growing pressures on the economy and the country don't make our election commitments less important. They make them far more crucial. This is our opportunity. It's our opportunity to build a better future for our country and for future generations. Thank you, Minister. If there are no further minister, oh, Senator Birmingham. Sorry. Yeah, uh, um, like the minister, I seek leave to make a short statement on the ministerial statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I thank Senator the Senate. Uh, well, this economic statement, or so-called economic statement, tabled by the treasurer or delivered by the treasurer in the other place, is a demonstration that this is a government that has no plan. It's a government big on promises, big on platitudes, that, as the treasurer himself acknowledged, sought to paint a picture today of those promises and platitudes, but it has no plan. It's a government that, through the election campaign, talked a big game. Through the election campaign, it promised that wages would be higher, growth would be higher, interest rates would be lower. All of these things would magically materialise if we just had a Labor government. Nine weeks ago, they were promising that they had all of the answers, all of the solutions. But what's been delivered in today's statement? It's an economic statement that lays the foundation for the government to break all of those promises, to not deliver upon the commitments and the promises that they made. Throughout the statement, the Treasurer says it's complex, it's difficult, that there are pressures and problems, it will take time and there are challenges. They're all the Treasurer's words. He offers no solutions in the statement, no plan, no announcements, just a series of complaints that it's tough. Well, yes, government is tough. Government is tough. We were up front through the election campaign that there real were real that there real that were real challenges uh, for Australia that were faced as a result of a range of different global circumstances. But, Mr. Chalmers, Mr. Albanese, those on the other side endlessly stated that they had apparently the answers to the challenges. Well, where are they? Where are those answers when you look at today's statement? Because it offers nothing other than downgrading of those promises. But instead of wages being higher, as the Labor Party promised going into the election, Mr Chalmers delivered a statement today showing real wages would be lower. Instead of growth being higher, as Labor endlessly said, Mr Chalmers went into the election indicating that now a statement showing that growth will be lower. And, of course, instead of interest rates being lower, as Labor emphasised throughout the election, they now acknowledge that interest rates will be higher. Labor said during the election that cost of living was the biggest issue. One of the areas where they promised a solution was an explicit promise by the Prime Minister to take $275 off household electricity bills. Now, no commitment to that promise anymore. No commitment to that promise anymore. When asked directly, the government fudges its way around the $275 commitment. They fudge, they dodge, they refuse to repeat that. Clearly, they don't expect there will be any relief from electricity prices. The $275 promise was designed to go on election material, not to be delivered in government. On wages, the government now says they have to wait some years. It's not what they were saying during the election campaign, when they were promising real wages growth all the time under a Labor government. Now they say it will take years. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Labor Party in opposition said that unemployment would be the key measure of the coalition government's success in managing the economic impacts of that global health crisis. And we delivered. We delivered on that unemployment benchmark. Something foreign, it seems, to this government. Under our government, unemployment hit a near 50-year low—3.9 per cent when we left office. The Labor Party had set a benchmark, and we well and truly met and exceeded that benchmark in terms of creating jobs and driving down unemployment, laying the foundation for the most recent 3.5 per cent unemployment rate recorded. But what's the commitment from this government now? Well, today's statement shows it expects unemployment to deteriorate. They expect unemployment to go back up. 
just as they seem to expect that power prices will be higher, not lower, just as they expect growth to be lower, not higher, and interest rates to be higher, not lower. This is a government that clearly has come to office on a litany of vague promises and aspirations, but now the Treasurer has started to try to lay the foundation for a budget that he will hand down in a couple of months' time, where he's indicating, obviously, that he expects things to be difficult. And governing is difficult, as we have always acknowledged. But this government needs to try to live up to the rhetoric that they laid out in the election campaign. This government will be held to account for what they've said about wages, what they've said about interest rates, what they've said about questions like spending. Because only one party went to the election campaign with savings that exceeded their spending promises. Was they were the Liberal and National parties. The Labor Party went into the election campaign promising more spending and much more that they didn't account for. And we will see in future budgets when the Labor Party says that they want to tackle debt and deficit, let's see whether that spending comes down or goes up. Because if they deliver to deliver on their promises, it's only going one way, and that's going to be up, and that's going to mean higher deficit and higher debts in the future. There is, of course, one acknowledgement uh, through the Treasurer's comments today uh, of the previous government's work. That is that the final budget outcome for 2021-22 will be dramatically better than expected. Dramatically better than expected. That's an admission of the coalition's budget management, an admission that our conservative economic forecasts in our budgets and our strong plans for growth have delivered outcomes exceeding expectation. Unemployment lower than we had forecast. Growth delivered through our term in government exceeding usually the budget forecasts in recent years. And a budget outcome much stronger than had been forecast. That's what a good government does. This government, based on today's statement, leads little hope uh, of it emulating such outcomes. If there are no further, uh, Senator, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Scar, Senator Ciccone, Ch 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 sorry. That's all right. Thank Thanks you so very much, much, Acting Deputy President, and also congratulations on your swearing in today too. Good to see you back in this place. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to make a couple of remarks as well. Um, today, we obviously. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Senator so, Chicago. Uh, by leave, uh, Chair. I'm and sorry, I was, acting sorry, Deputy Senator President. Chair, I was too busy taking all the accolades. Take leave. It's not very often people speak nicely of people around here, and I was <laughs> soaking it up. Sorry, you just need to seek leave. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Leave as well, too. It will take note. Sorry, take note. Sorry, take note. Move to leave, leave Brandon. You're no, no, move, move and take note. I'm moving, oh, I'm moving to take, take note of the minister's my, statement, my Chair. My apologies. Yes, okay. Send it to go. Thank you. Um, well, today we heard a very grim pitch of the economy from the Treasurer, and uh, particularly when it does come to the very point around inflation. Now, that 6.1 that per cent inflation figure uh, revealed yesterday was not unexpected, but that doesn't make it any easier for Australian families who are already struggling with the costs of living at the moment and the soaring costs of living, uh, not just in the last couple of months since we've been in government, but for the last couple of years uh, under the coalition government. Now, if we do not combat inflation and if we don't take it seriously and we don't continue to undermine the living standards and the pain conditions of Australian workers, there will be further economic pain for many, many families. Now that's why that Labor, so that's why that we are seeing central banks all around the world raising interest rates, using their powers at their disposal to take action on inflation. But this is tough for all Australian families. Increasing mortgage repayments and increasing the cost of servicing debt more broadly. And every extra dollar that Australian families have to find to service their mortgage is a dollar that they can't use to buy the essentials and pay the bills. The essentials and the bills that are getting more and more expensive every day. 
This is the insidious spiral of inflation. The inflation that makes these rates increases aren't necessary has been exacerbated by the, by the decade long of lack of investment in our skills and training, in our TAFEs and in our universities, making things, more, making things here in this country. Our domestic manufacturing sector has been decimated. And all thanks to the previous coalition government after the last nine and a bit years. They failed on skills, on energy, and ensuring that we had a very strong sovereign capability when it came to, uh, to manufacturing. The Treasurer provided a look under the hood of the Australian economy and was sobering. There are a number of international factors that are impacting uh, Australia's economy. But China's response to its COVID outbreaks has significantly constrained the productivity capacity of their economy, putting further pressure on already a fragile supply chain around the world. Uh, Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine has also undermined energy and food security and put upward pressure on the price of essential goods. We have seen global economic forecasts cut this week, and it's expected that the revised domestic forecast will cut half a percentage growth from growth for the last financial year and this financial year and the one after. This is a result of high interest rates combined with a global economic slowdown. And with the coalition leaving a trillion dollars of debt, these high interest rates are having a significant, a significant impact on the government's balance sheet. The Treasurer has stated that interest rate repayments on the coalition's debt will be the single largest expense of the government, more expensive than Medicare, more expensive than the NDIS, more expensive than education. There is no doubt that these are significant challenges. But I appreciate that we have a Treasurer and indeed a government that is been up front with the Australian people. Jim Chalmers didn't stand up and say that everything is rosy. It's all great and no one should worry. This is in stark contrast to the approach that we saw under the previous administration, who just a couple of months ago was on the campaign trail bragging about their economic management ability, suggesting that Australians should be grateful that they had a coalition government. Well, unfortunately, this doesn't match up with the reality of our Australian economy. That's been all just spin. Short-term slogans designed for a re-election of a government that was tied. And fortunately, from members on this side of the, of the Senate, Australians saw right through the Liberal and National Party. The budget that the Albanese Labor government has inherited was and seems to be bursting with some waste <coughs> and rorts, and we are intended on cleaning that up. Hidden mismanagement and low quality spending. And again, a trillion dollars of debt with not enough to show for it. Government spending should be measured against how effectively it supports the services and the projects that Australians rely on, not measured against how many votes it can win at the next election. The times that we live in are tough, and, extra, and each extra dollar that government spends is becoming a lot more expensive as interest rates rise. We simply cannot afford the political ideologue of the previous government and their wastes and their rorts. But I want to draw the Senate's attention to the Treasurer's comments on wages, Mr Acting Deputy President. There has been some commentators and politicians, for that matter, who have suggested that rising wages are somehow a major contributor to inflation, that the primary focus of the federal government should be on constraining wage growth. This suggestion does not stand up for scrutiny, in my opinion. We are experiencing soaring inflation despite real wage growth averaging just 0.1 per cent for the past decade. And that was largely due to the previous government's policy of deliberately keeping wage growth low. Now, this is not the policy of this government, of the Albanese Labor government. And we saw that when we first came in. One of the very first acts of Prime Minister Albanese was to ensure that the government put a submission towards the Fair Work Commission asking that those on the lowest wages in this country got a pay rise. 
It is more urgent than ever that we get wages moving again so that working families have the ability to keep up with inflating prices of essential goods and services, prices that are determined by dozens of different economic factors but, and not just wages. So we should not just indulge, sorry, we should not um, indulge those who want to continue constraining wages and making it tougher for workers to get ahead, let alone keeping up with the soaring cost of living. This is a shallow idea that's been pushed by those who want to see the economic policies of the previous government continue. But this is not just what uh, this is not what Labor stands for, Mr. President, Acting President. We are tackling these challenges because Australian families need a government that is on their side. They do not need more of the awful economic management that we've seen in the past decade. It's important to note that our government does not see the tough economic times ahead as a cause for delaying or scrapping our election commitments. In fact, the economic plan that we took to the election is now more urgently required than ever. We must invest in our childcare sector, ensuring that there is cheaper childcare, ensuring there are people at the front line who can provide that essential service predominantly for women so they can also go back into the workforce and add to our productivity in this economy. We must bring down the cost of medicines to provide the cost of living relief that so many pensioners and seniors have been calling on for for some time. We must take the speed limits off our economy by investing more in accessible TAFE and our universities. I mean, two great areas of government that we should put more money into, not less. Investing in our children, in our students, in our future leaders of this country. We also have to invest in cleaner and cheaper energy and growing advanced manufacturing. Now, that's been the crucial part uh, or the missing link, I think, in this place for some time. And I've spoken at length about how we need to invest more in our man manufacturing sector, not relying on overseas products, but making as much of that here in this country. And we must be responsible in how we go about repairing our budget by tackling the coalition's mismanagement, their waste, their rorts, but missed opportunities, many missed opportunities over the nine and a half years. And this work is already underway through our audit of waste and rorts. There are many reasons to be optimistic, and the Treasurer also outli outlined them today. Australians have a government that is on their side, that backs them, and to be honest, will be ensuring that we get the best value for money when it comes to our budget that we'll hand down later this year in October. We are committed to working not just with them but for them to build a better future. The Treasurer noted that the character of the Australian people is our greatest resource, our ability to come together to confront those challenges and overcome them. So Australians should be confident that while there are tough times ahead, we will get through them. Your time has expired. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Senator. Um, Senator Scar did jump earlier, so I'll come back over with your indulgence. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Senator uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. If I can also uh, offer my congratulations on your uh, swearing in uh, as a senator today, this place would not be the same uh, for your absence. Uh, you add a great deal to it in every way. Uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed. Senator Ciccone, who I have a very high regard for, talks about a concern for costs. A cost. And I quote him, he said, each extra dollar government spends is becoming more expensive. And I agree. I agree, Mr Acting Deputy President. Each dollar, each extra dollar government spends is becoming more expensive. So I'm perplexed why it is at the start of this government at the start of this government, it's taking action to abolish, to first gut the powers of the Australian Building and Construction Commission, and then to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which is the cop on the beat, the cop on the beat of our construction sites across this country. If you want to, if you want to save costs, if you want to maximise every single dollar of government infrastructure spending to build our hospitals, to build our schools. To build our, our roads, you need a cop on the beat in terms of our construction sites. 
And I want to quote to you a release put out by the Australian Industry Group this week. And I, I quote the title, Gutting of Building Code. And that is what, that is what the minister, Industrial Relations Minister, is proposing to do. Gutting of the building code, a backward step for safety and the fight against bullying and intimidation. And I quote, I quote Innes Will Willox, the chief executive of the National Employer Association, the Australian Industry Group, and he said, these are his words, not my words. This is what he said. It is a backward step for the fight against bullying and intimidation and will add costs. And will add costs. The costs which apparently the government's so concerned about will add costs and delays to vital community infrastructure, the community infrastructure which is to be provided for the people of this country, such as roads, hospitals and schools. That's what's being proposed. And the issue we're of course dealing with is the unlawful activity of the CFMEU on our construction sites. The unlawful activity of the CFMEU on our construction sites. And Mr Deputy President, I'm Acting Deputy President, I know you were uh, a proud member, no doubt still are a proud member of a trade union uh, in this country. My father was a member of a trade union, my mother was a member of a trade union, my sister was a member of a trade union. I have great respect for Senator Walsh sitting opposite, who was a senior official of United Voice Union. Um, I have a great respect for many members sitting opposite who have held sen senior positions in the Australian labour movement. But I do not have respect for the lawless activity undertaken by the CFMEU on construction sites in this country. And I am baffled, I am baffled as to why the Australian Labor Party wants to protect the construction division of the CFMEU. Absolutely baffled. And I'm going to refer to, I'm going to refer to a number of very confronting incidents which the CFMEU has engaged with on our construction sites. And bear in mind the Australian government, the Labor government is saying, we don't need a beat on the cop, a, a, a cop on the beat in terms of our construction sites. Just listen. Listen to this roll call of shame of the conduct of the CFMEU on our construction sites. And let you be the judge. Let all those listening be the judge as to whether or not there's an issue in terms of the unlawful behaviour of the CFMEU. And some of these examples are confronting. And as someone who's dealt in a previous life with trade unionists, um, the trade union movement, I don't think they're representative of 99 per cent of the trade union movement. The issue is we've got a problem in this country with the construction division of the CFMEU. And let me give you some examples. A CFMEU official was jailed for assault. He had once told a female inspector this is a woman working on our construction sites. I think we should be promoting our construction sites as a place for women to work. And this is what he said to that lady, someone's wife, someone's daughter, someone's niece. He said she was a expletive expletive, asking her if she had brought knee pads as you are going to be expletive 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 dogs all day. We don't have a problem at our construction work sites with the CFMEU. Here's another example. The Courier Mail paper in my state revealed a CFMEU official allegedly barked like a dog at female health and safety consultants on a Gold Coast construction site and said, go on, off you go, you expletive dog expletive, go get your police. He allegedly called her an expletive dog expletive twice more that day. We don't have a problem on our construction sites. We don't have a problem with the CFMEU. You see, the Australian Labor Party, in the minister's announcement, when he said he was going to gut the, C gut the ABCC of its watchdog powers with respect to our construction sites, he couldn't even bear to mention the CFMEU. He didn't even mention their names. They are ashamed of the CFMEU. And yet officials of the CFMEU sit around their national executive table and donate millions and millions and millions of dollars to those sitting opposite and their political causes. I'll give you another example. I'll give you another example. It just gets worse, and it goes. I've got pages of this stuff. It is appalling. In another visit, a female inspector was called a expletive, expletive, and a dog by union officials while she was doing her job. How's this one? A CFMU dele delegate was accused of harassing the daughter of a builder. 
So not just the, the person on the construction site, their family. And I've actually spoken to people working on construction sites who've had to, who've had to live with the stress created by CF, CFMEU construction officials invading, trespassing, unlawfully invading construction sites and taking photographs of the car plates, their number plates on their personal vehicles. That's the sort of thing the CFMEU construction division does, and you're defending them. It's disgraceful. You can't even mention their name. You can't even mention their name. In this case, the builder's daughter. The builder's daughter. And you've heard our Prime Minister say, oh, it's all trivial. It's all about stickers and flags. No, it's not. It's about someone's daughter. It's about someone's wife. It's about someone's niece. And this is what happened to her. The CFMEU picketers were accused of harassing the daughter of the builder when she entered the site in her car by commenting on her breasts and bottom and making an oo sound at her. They allegedly called her daddy's girl, a blonde bimbo, etc. etc. Here's another case. A CFMEU official made three phone calls late at night to a female inspector. Her mobile phone, the last call logged at 11.23 p.m. And an anonymous fly was then circulated referring to the woman as a dog who wanted to be a pole dancer. These are the cases, example after example after example. And what does our High Court say about the CFMEU Construction Division? What does our High Court say? And this judgment was released. This judgment was, was released on 13 April 2022. 13 April 2022. Our High Court, not a politician, not a politician, our High Court, unanimous in a judgment. This is what they said about the CFMEU Construction Division. Our High Court. The full court's approach in this case is at apt to undermine the primacy of deterrence as the objective of the civil penalty regime in the Act is amply demonstrated once regard is had to the failure of previous penalties to have any deterrent effect on the CFMEU's repeated contraventions of the Act. The CFMEU has continued to breach the Act, steadfastly resistant to previous attempts to enforce compliance by civil penalties fixed at less than the permitted maximum is a compelling indication that the penalties previously imposed have not been taken seriously because they were insufficient to outweigh the benefits flowing unlawfully, unlawfully to the CFMEU from adherence to the so-called no-ticket, no-start policy, which is the policy that they intimidate, intimidate people off construction sites unless they are a member of the CFMEU. Don't we believe in freedom of association in this country? And this is what the High Court says. To the contrary, the CFMEU's continuing defiance, continuing defiance of the Act indicates that it regards the penalties previously imposed as an acceptable cost of doing business. So those, those opposite talk about cost. Those opposite talk about cost. The CFMEU regards breaching the laws of this land as a cost of doing business. As a cost of doing business. Why are you standing up and defending this? Lawless union, which is a contaminant on our construction work sites. It baffles me. It baffles me. We will shine a bright light on the unlawful conduct of the CFMEU, whose members sit on your national executive, whose members sit on your national executive every day to the next federal election. Senator Walsh. Deputy President, and I rise to take note of the ministerial statement on the economy delivered by the Treasurer earlier today. And this is a time for us to be honest with the Australian people about the challenges ahead. And it's time for us to be honest about the opportunities that also lie ahead as we work together to meet those challenges head on. Australians don't need us to tell them that times are tough. They don't need to track inflation figures to know that everything that they need in their daily, in their daily lives is costing more — food, petrol, electricity. What they do need is to be part of a discussion with their government on the way forward, to have their voices heard, to know that the people they put into this parliament will use every lever available to government to help them not just get through this period but do better into the future. And on the Labor team, on the government benches, that is exactly what we will do. Listen, act and govern in the interests of everyday Australians. It's exactly what we have always done, because on this side of the chamber we bring the stories of the people who hold up our economy day in, day out. 
right here to the floor of this parliament. We bring their experiences into the policies that we create, the stories and experiences of the essential workers of Australia who hold up this country. These are the people we're thinking of as we chart a path forward through difficult times. Because, as the Prime Minister says, we believe in an economy that works for people, not the other way around. And we know it's these Australians who have the least room to move when their wages don't go up, but the price of everything else does. And that is the reality too many Australians have experienced over the last nine years of the former government, and a reality which is hitting people hard right now. Today, the Treasurer outlined the pressures that are bearing down on all of us and most particularly our lowest paid workers, those who have little buffer to protect them. And I commend him for being honest with the Australian people, and I commend him for fronting up to the seriousness of these times, because, as he said today, problems don't solve themselves. And a wasted decade of inaction on the fundamentals of our economy by those on the other side has proven exactly that. Imagine if we were hitting these tough times today with an economy in the shape it should be in as one of the wealthiest countries in this world. Imagine if wages had not been flat for a decade. Imagine if those low wages had not been a deliberate design feature of their economy. Imagine if more people were secure in their jobs. Imagine if we had a stronger and more diversified economy. Imagine if that economy had a big, strong manufacturing sector, making us less reliant on global supply chains. Imagine if the previous government had led a renewables revolution in this country and made us less vulnerable to uh, global shocks and not more vulnerable, less vulnerable to global gas prices, less vulnerable to skyrocketing global petrol prices. Imagine if they'd invested in the skills people need. Uh, and that businesses are crying out for. Imagine if they'd invested in social housing. Imagine if they'd used their budgets to build this country up Order. instead of load it down Order. with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. Just imagine. Imagine. And now it is up to us on the government benches to work hard and work fast to make the changes that should have started a decade ago. And that is exactly what we will do. And it's exactly what we have already started doing. We have already started to get wages moving in this country for our most essential workers. The Prime Minister said in the election campaign that he supported a minimum wage pay rise that kept pace with inflation. So one of his first acts was to write to the Fair Work Commission to support that claim. And the 5.2 per cent boost to the pay packets of our lowest paid workers that resulted, it would just not have happened if Anthony Albanese had not been elected Prime Minister. But now, because Australians have voted for change, we can get to work and start bolstering our economy and repairing the damage that those on the other side have done. We can get to work and start implementing our plan to support the Australian people in better and more secure lives. Our plan to build resilience into our economy by powering that economy with cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy, by supporting workers and businesses to have the right skills for today's jobs, by making more of what we need right here in Australia, to offer more and different job opportunities for the next generation, to strengthen and diversify our economy and to build our own sovereign capacity to provide for ourselves. And we can now get to work to build a more resilient care economy too, recognising, as the former government refused to, that our care economy will be more efficient at caring for our children, our elderly and people with disabilities when the mostly women who perform that work are properly recognised. I spoke of essential workers who hold up our economy, the cleaners, the drivers, the hospo workers, the retail workers and so many more. Our care economy workers don't only hold up the economy, they hold up the sky for the people that they care for. And when we properly value those workers, our society and our economy will be all the more strong for it. And I want to share with you just a few of the stories of essential workers who I bring with me today to this parliament, the people I'm thinking about as we confront the challenges outlined by the Treasurer today. Cherie has worked in aged care for more than 20 years on insecure part-time contracts. She can't convince a real estate agent to give her a lease. 
can't convince a bank to give her a home loan, and sometimes she doesn't earn enough just to meet her own basic needs. She found herself living in temporary accommodation in a caravan park and told me, as a low-income worker, I am not alone here. Where I live, most people are low-income, insecure workers. Mahali is a farm worker from my home state of Victoria, and she shared how she and her fellow workers are paid as little as $10 an hour to pick fruit, lettuce and herbs by contractors in this country. She and her co-workers are terrified of speaking out for fear of being reported to immigration. And just this morning I met with Jenny and her two amazing children. Jenny is an NTU member and an academic at Melbourne University. Despite working at the university for a number of years, Jenny is employed on a casual contract with no security of income. Her daughter suffers from epilepsy, her son autism. She can't afford the medical appointments and education support that her children need. Jenny told me today, and I quote, sometimes I go without food just so my kids can eat. So I ask you again to imagine if we had not wasted a decade addressing the challenges that these people face. To imagine if the previous government had not led an economy based on low wages on insecure jobs and on outright wage theft. As it stands today, we know that people like Cherie, Mahali and Jenny are making tough decisions in their own household budgets. And as a government, we will have to as well. But we won't step back from the commitments we made to the Australian people to build a stronger economy that works for all. So as the Treasurer said, we'll get on with the job building an economy as resilient as the Australian people themselves. We'll get our economy moving and lift people up along with it. We'll invest in the people of this country, we'll invest in their potential, and we'll build a strong, more diverse and more resilient economy that Australians will be proud of. Thank you, Senator. I put the question that the motion moved. Sorry. To make a contribution on the ministerial statement, if I may. You've got one minute 52 left. Thank you Senator very much. Smith. Senator Walsh is right. When Australian families sit down tonight at their kitchen table, they will have to use their imagination because Dr Chalmers, the member for Rankin, the new Labor Treasurer, has not presented them with a plan. As Australian families gather tonight to think about how they plan for rising levels of inflation in this country, guess what they do? They do it in the absence of knowing what the government's plan is. Ten weeks since the election, and we had an economic statement today, which, by Labor's Speaker's own admission in the House of Representatives, was a political statement. It was not a ministerial statement and did not meet the requirements of the House of Representatives' standing orders. We need a plan in this country to deal with rising levels of inflation. We need a plan in this country to deal with productivity reform. We need a plan in this country to deal with cost of living pressures. We need a plan in this country that will address labour shortages. We need a plan in this country that will deal our own domestic supply issues. There was no plan. A few days ago, Dr Chalmers said he wanted to use tonight's occasion, today's occasion, to paint a picture. To paint a picture. Well, this country does not need Dr Chalmers to be Van Gogh. What this country needs is an architect who will build an economic plan. The foundations that were left to Labor were strong. Historically low unemployment rate. Senator Ayres, are you laughing about the low level of unemployment in this country? I thought you were a union man. There is no plan. Australians gather tonight in their homes having no idea Thank you, Senator. what Your comes time has yet. expired. And the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Ciccone be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, or those against declare it carried. I call on the clerk. General business debate. Notice of motion number nine, standing in the name of Senator Rustin, relating to the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Senator O'Sullivan, you have the call. Thank you very much. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, well, what an excellent motion uh, this is from my friend Senator Rustin. Uh, I hope that the Senate supports it, and I stand today in this place firmly on uh, the record of my support 
for it. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm actually impressed that the Australian Labor Party uh, here. I mean, their, their lack of shame on this topic is actually genuinely unmatched. Genuinely unmatched. I thought that uh, I thought that we would see the ABCC, the Australian uh, Building and Construction Commission, the ABCC, stripped slowly of its power. Slowly of its power. But what they're doing is they are approaching this with a full head of steam. Uh, how wrong was I to think that they might do this slowly? Uh, the members and senators of the uh, Albanese government were not even sworn in yet when we saw Tony Burke, uh, the, 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 the minister, uh, Prime, uh, Prime Senator, Minister. Um, I, I, I understand. Be, your... I would remind you to use the correct titles of people from the other place. I understood as I said it. Uh, that's why I mentioned the minister and the prime minister, Mr. Albanese, uh, and the, the rest of the union hacks in the government uh, gave their masters the payoff. Uh, they're already crab walking away from their promises to the Australian public, but their promises to the union movement, to the union movement, the, to the CFMEU in particular, is standing firm. They are very strong on their support of that. They're not crab walking away from their commitments in relation to supporting their mates in the CFMMEU. Is anyone here really surprised? They have no plan, as we just heard from my colleague Senator Smith. They have no plan to deal with inflation. They have no plan, indeed, to deal with the cost of living pressures. Uh, we heard yesterday from Minister Watt that they have no plan in relation to the foot and mouth disease. They have no plan for the Australian people. But what they do have is a plan to enable the lawlessness of the CFMMEU to continue in this country. And we heard Senator Paul Scar before speak about the gross examples of lawlessness and the gross examples of abuse that takes place on many work sites across this country. That has been found to be true, even indeed through the court of law. They have a fully formed plan, however, to hand the CFMEU a free reign on building sites again. An unbelievable and yet somehow totally unsurprising set of priorities from the ALP. When it comes to the union movement, it's, it seems that actually crime really does pay. But don't get me wrong, Madam Deputy President. I'm not saying this to just be flippant. Uh, just yesterday it was reported in the Daily Telegraph that the ABCC is seeking a six-figure fine against the CFMMU for breaking laws in New South Wales during a highway upgrade. A nice little saving for that union if the ABC See, is abolished in time. A nice little saving. Maybe that's part of their economic plan, is to make sure that the unions don't have to incur these sort of costs. Because, as we know, as was found, that they've said that this is just a cost of doing business. This sort of behaviour, it's just a cost, and getting the getting the penalties is just a cost of doing business, of inflicting uh, uh, all sorts of of uh, uh, turmoil in the workplaces, in construction workplaces uh, across across Australia. That they're prepared to pay the penalties so that they can continue with that line of work. On the day after the announcement of the ABCC's abolition, a CFMMU uh, official was called out for the appalling abuse and intimidation of workers, and it becomes clearer and clearer that the ALP don't actually stand up for workers. They don't stand up for workers. They stand up for unions, unions that cover less than one in ten private sector employees. Workers don't want to be physically intimidated while they're at work. They don't want to be abused when they're at work. But the Australian Labor Party is stripping back the very watchdog that is working to prevent this abuse. Shame on them. Some of those opposite seem to put more effort into protecting white-collar workers from mean words than they do from protecting blue-collar workers from actual thuds. You know who is standing up for workers? The ABCC. While the union runs around racking up fines and disrupting workplaces, the ABCC has, since 2016, 
when it was re-established, recovered over $5 million in unpaid wages and entitlements for construction workers. Now, funny, you'd think that that was a union. That's the sort of thing that a union should be doing. But the ABCC has secured over $13.5 million in progress claims for subcontractors, and this is only since 2019. Prime Minister Albanese and Labor talk a big game on wage theft, but voted against our bill in the last government to criminalise wage theft, and now want to abolish the ABCC, who have recovered millions of dollars in wages and entitlements for Australian workers. Now, I don't actually have time today in this contribution to go over all of the egregious examples of the CFMEU's abuse of power and abuse of people. Uh, if I only focused on the last few weeks, I wouldn't even have time. But I do want to quote the head of the AC2U, Sally McManus, famously or infamously, I should say, said in 2017. She said that uh, she doesn't see a problem with breaking the law if the law is unjust. She said this in 2017, at, a time at which time the CFMEU had only faced 118, 118 separate proceedings in courts across Australia. That number, sadly, is far higher today. But Labor are intent on making sure that the unions go unpunished, unpunished for their wrongdoings. The union movement sees legal fees and fines, just as I said, as a cost of doing business, not to mention the thuggery that happens on site. In recent years, over $16 million in fines have been imposed on the CFMMEU. And judges have observed that these penalties are not enough, not enough for a union that treats them like parking tickets. Of the 1,661 contraventions of industrial law brought against the CFMMEU, 91 per cent were upheld. So clearly, this body is not being frivolous, as those opposite like to put, not being frivolous, but they have a genuine role to play. Now, John Secker's construction division of the CFMMEU is so toxic that even other unions are trying to distance themselves from them. Both the mining and energy and manufacturing divisions are trying to leave the union. Now, I don't know why the Labor Party pays such attention to the CFMEU. I mean, frankly, they don't seem to care much about construction, forestry or mining or energy very much. Uh, but for whatever reason, they do still pay attention to that union. Perhaps it's because the CFMMU has, over the last 20 years, provided the Labor Party with more than $16.3 million in donations. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, this, this motion speaks of the importance of the construction industry. It's a very important industry, very important industry, directly employing 1.15 million Australians and supporting hundreds of thousands more. It directly contributes nearly 10 per cent of Australia's economy. And in terms of GDP, it's Australia's fifth largest industry. Fifth largest industry, Madam Deputy President. A recent acting Deputy President. A recent report produced by EY and commissioned by the Master Builders Association finds that the abolition are you listening? Those opposite? That the abolition of the ABCC would mean an increase in labour costs of 8.8 per cent, with reduced worker productivity of 9.3 per cent. On a day when we've had an economic statement from the Treasurer talking about the grey clouds and in fact the, the serious impacts of the, that's happening right now in our country with the economy. I mean, you'd think the last thing you'd want to do is put further handbrakes on it, on, on a section of the economy that's actually very large, that's actually very important, that's important to the productivity of this nation. You wouldn't think that you'd be doing anything to put any handbrake on it. But this is going to result in around $35 billion of output reduction uh, for the industry in 2030, to 2030. The total economic loss from the ABCC's abolition was estimated at $47.5 billion. These aren't our figures. This is EY and others, that, and the Master Builders Association that commissioned the work that have found this. And the cost overruns from the construction industry spills over into other sectors. Of course, all the suppliers, everyone that feeds into it. The lower economic growth and 
market falls in productivity result in 4,000 less jobs being available than otherwise would be. The report finds that there is a major risk of delays and that these delays could occur immediately after the abolition of the ABCC. Working days lost from 24,000 uh, in, in 2011 to 12 to 89,000 in 2012 to 13 when Bill Shorten abolished the ABCC. That's Senator, what happened. I'll just remind you again to use people's titles from the other place. Oh, yes, indeed. indeed. I, I apologise. Uh, when the, the, the former minister, indeed, uh, Bill Shorten, Mr. Shorten, was uh, the minister. The cost of critical infrastructure also rose astronomically with crucial projects such as hospitals and schools costing up to 30 per cent more. Now, we want to see good many new schools and hospitals and these things built around the country, but if you're adding to the cost of the delivery of providing that infrastructure, providing those services, then what sort of impact are you going to have? You're going to increase the cost and you're going to be able to deal fewer of it. And inversely, when the ABCC previously existed under the Howard government, it was found that the economic and the industrial performance of the building construction sector significantly improved. A 2013 report found that this productivity rise was in the order of 16 per cent and represented a $7.5 billion a year saving while also significantly reducing working days lost through industrial action. These productivity gains flatlined again in 2012 after the Gillard government abolished the commission. Now, this correlation is very clear. When the building industry has a dedicated watchdog, productivity increases and the economy and the workers benefit. When that watchdog is abolished, productivity fails. It falls. Industrial action increases. And, it's inevitably, and it is inevitably the workers, the workers who the great Labor Party say that they represent, that the unions represent. Well, they're not standing with them here in this term of this parliament if this is what they're going to do to abolish the ABCC. And not to mention the taxpayers who fund a lot of these projects, the construction projects across the country. The increase in the price and the inflationary impact of that upon the economy is drastic. So strangely, this abolition seems to coincide with the election with the election of, of Labor governments. Every time we see it and the costs go up. Madam Acting Deputy President, the core regulatory functions of the ABCC stem from a total of four royal commissions, one parliamentary inquiry and a parliamentary report. It was found over and over again that a dedicated oversight body for the construction industry was required. And even the 2009 report, 2009 report instigated by the Gillard government found that issues remained in the sector and it opined that extraordinary laws were still required given the extent of lawlessness on building sites in Victoria and Western Australia. But now, without review, without an inquiry, without consultation, except of course with the CFMMU, Labor are going to pare back the ABCC just as far as they can. Manning Act, Acting Deputy President. The building construction industry is too important, too important to hand over wholesale to the union movement. It employs far too many people. It's got too big a, a, a slice of the Australian economy. Too much of our national economy depends on its productivity, depends on its efficiency. And the Labor Party are prepared to just hand it over to the lawlessness that we see in the CFMMEU. And we know that if the ABCC is abolished, we will see cost overruns and delays brought about in large by easily predictable industrial, illegal industrial action that will likely go unpunished. And we on this side of the House don't want to see this. We want to see a well-regulated, efficient building industry that is safe for the workers and sees the unions operating legally. But sadly, what we're seeing in the 10 weeks of this government so far is that they don't stand with the worker. They don't stand with the workers. They don't actually stand, indeed, with the efficiency in the economy. These, those opposite oppose this, but I want to encourage everyone here, if they've got courage, to stand and support this motion.
Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres, you have a very short period of time. Well, it's been an interesting week, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, watching the Liberals and Nationals dealing with uh, the flogging that they got uh, just a few weeks ago. The running with the least popular Prime Minister in Australian history, with the worst government since the government of Billy McMahon. What are they rabbiting on about this week? The ABCC, hyper politicising foot and mouth disease not in the national interest, and, and Lord knows what else, taking us backwards on climate and energy. Like Talleyrand said of the Bourbon regime, these guys have learned nothing and forgotten nothing. They have got a long, long way to go before they will ever grace this side of the parliament again. I look forward to more inane contributions like the one we have just seen. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Your time has expired. Order. Uh, Senator Scar. Senator Scar. Uh, the time has now expired, and I believe we are moving to adjournment debate. And I have Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Um, on the 19th of July, the 2021 State of the Environment report was released. The report was provided to the Minister for the Environment last year, in 2021, which is when it should have been provided, but was not released. It sat on the previous minister's desk for six months. The first page of the report explains that the state and the trend of the environment in Australia are poor and deteriorating. And the further details of the report are deeply, deeply disturbing. Erosion, deforestation, loss of species, poor water quality, mass coral breaching. All of these things writ large in this report. The major findings of the 2021 State of the Environment report paint a troubling picture of inaction and neglect by the former government. In Australia, we now have more foreign plant species than we do have native plant species. Australia has lost more mammal species than any other continent. Ocean and land temperatures are rising, and all of this was not dealt with in any way under the previous government. We are one of the top 15 global emitters. The change in government that we have seen in the last few months brings an opportunity to start to address the alarming findings in this report. We owe it to ourselves, to our community, to the global community and to our future generations to protect the environment. The Albanese government will begin the process of reforming our environmental laws to ensure that they set clear and measurable targets and provide certainty for community and for business. We will establish an environmental protection agency. We will set a goal of protecting 30 per cent of our land and our oceans by 2030. The State of the Environment report painted a particularly concerning picture for those of us in South Australia, specifically the condition of the Murray-Darling Basin, a river system that is the lifeblood of South Australia. In 2019, the Murray-Darling experienced its lowest water level on record due to drought, overuse and climate change. With rainfall at 70 to 80 per cent below normal in 2018 and 2019, we saw a situation where more than one million fish died and many bird populations declined. And to make matters worse, the former government delivered only two gigalitres out of the promised 450 gigalitres of water. These were conditions in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The, government, the previous government spent nine years obfuscating and ignoring this plan. No intention or action to find that important 448 gigalitres of water by 2024. This has a huge impact for Australia, and particularly South Australia, because we sit at the bottom of that river system. Environmentalists, farmers and communities are all reliant on the river, and they can coexist. The binary debate that is frequently peddled about the choice between the environment and the agricultural sector is false. If the river's health fails, then the farms fail and the communities crumble. 
This is not about agriculture versus environmental issues. It is about all of us coming together to find the solution to ensure the health of that river. Thankfully, an Albanese Labor government is wholly committed to delivering the 450 gigalitres of water. We know that this is going to be difficult, but we will deliver this flow. Our plan to safeguard the Murray-Darling will hold the plan and lay the groundwork for the basin's future. We will increase compliance and improve monitoring of the Murray-Darling Basin. We will not accept river water theft as a given. We will restore transparency, integrity, confidence in water markets and in the management of those markets. We will increase First Nations ownership and we will update the science that informed the Basin Plan at the time it was created. We have a plan for Australia. We have a plan for South Australia. And under an Albanese government, under the watchful Thank you, eye of Senator Minister Grogan, Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Australia's native forests are unique and beautiful. They are the home of so many of our iconic and our threatened species, like the koala and the wallert, the leadbeater's possum. They are country for traditional owners and are a source of inspiration and solace for a multitude of people. And protecting our native forests is also one of the most effective ways to tackle the climate crisis. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Nature last year that found that old-growth forests, amongst other ecosystems, are absolutely critical stores of carbon, and that if we disturb them, if we log them, if we clear them, it could jeopardise any effort to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there were Australian forests front and centre in that study that this study showed needed to be protected. And there was a recent study in Tasmania by the Trees Project that revealed that pre protecting native forests could provide $2.6 billion worth of carbon sequestration by 2050. Just by not logging our native forests, we can make a massive inroads into sequestering the carbon and helping tackle the climate crisis. And this study also showed up the, the problems with our cu current carbon accounting and how it's failing us. That basically our carbon measurements with regards to native forests are failing. We don't provide public data that shows how much carbon our forests are act actually soaking up. The data only gives net values, so it's subtracting off the amount of data that the amount of carbon that is lost by logging and deforestation. I have written to Ministers Plibersek and Watt calling on them to, publish, to, to measure and to publish the data that really shows how much protecting our native forests from logging would contribute to tackling the climate crisis. But the evidence is clear. We must protect our native forests or we are contributing to, con to, con we are contributing to a climate catastrophe. And yet native forest logging continues to recklessly destroy these wonderful carbon sinks, which are also wildlife homes, water supplies and places of amazing inspiration and beauty. And it's not as if this destruction is occurring by some dodgy underhand practice undertaken by shady outfits. No, it's completely planned, managed, or should I say mismanaged and subsidised by state and federal governments. Native forest logging will never be sustainable. It destroys First Nations country and totem species. It wrecks habitat and it robs future generations of their right to enjoy the beauty of our incredible old forests. And under our logging laws, the regional forest agreements, which are agreements between the state and federal governments, logging operations are given a special exemption from Australia's National Environment Protection Law, a law that's supposed to protect threatened species and the places we love. And what that means is that the regulation and the protection of our forests is left to state governments, and that even if they break the law and destroy the forest habitats of threatened species, recent court cases have sadly revealed that logging is permitted to continue. And our totally inadequate logging laws mean the law has shown that this logging is still legal, even if we are destroying absolutely threatened species like Leadbeater's possum and greater gliders, which have recently been uplisted to being endangered. And concerned citizens, scientists and community groups have shown that in Victoria, Vic Forest, the Victorian government-owned logging company, 
has been responsible for widespread illegal harvesting, destruction of habitats and alleged spying on conservationists, and that companies currently involved in almost a dozen legal proceedings regarding its activities. The system is broken and our native forests are being left unprotected. Yet the Victorian government is attempting to pass legislation that infringes upon forest defenders, traditional owners and the community to protest their ability to access and defend our forests. And if passed, this bill would mean that people defending Victoria's forests from this destruction could be imprisoned for up to a year or receive up to $21,000 in fines. And similar anti-protest laws have been introduced in Tasmania and New South Wales parliaments. These laws will prevent traditional owners from protecting their country and their totems, which rely on the forest to survive. And they'll restrict the work of wildlife carers and citizen scientists who are critical to understanding and caring for our native flora and fauna. And the penalties imposed by these anti-protest laws are extraordinarily harsh for the peaceful and non-violent protesters who just want to be protecting our forests. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Polly. In the lead-up to the 2019 election, before even economic devastation from the COVID-19 pandemic. Former Labor leader Bill Shorten stated, and I quote, everything is going up except your wages. After three further years of inaction by the Morrison Liberal government, Labor leader Anthony Albanese echoed the exact same concerns in the lead up to the 2022 election, stating, and I quote, Workers deserve more than our thanks. They deserve a pay rise. On June 3, 2022, 11 days after being sworn in, Prime Minister Albanese submitted for a minimum pay rise of at least 5.1 per cent to the Fair Work Commission for the Australian Workers. On 15 June, it was announced that an increase to the minimum wage of 5.2 per cent, that's $1.05, cents per hour would come into effect on 1 July to be slightly above the rate of inflation. For those workers on award minimum wage, a 4.6 per cent increase for those earning above $869.60 per week came into place and a minimum of $40 per week for those earning $869.60 or below per week. This is now law a proud reform because Labor will always stand up for working Australians. While some business groups and the Australian Chamber of Commerce has expressed concern about further stresses being put on businesses due to the increase, the Prime Minister, Ian Ross of the Fair Work Commission and Sally McManus of the Australian Council of Trade Unions have all assured Australian people that the minimum wage increase will not adversely affect the economy. This is good policy. During the Liberals' nine-year reign in Australia, the government had ample opportunities to increase the national minimum wage to be in accordance with inflation, but they did nothing. Like so many issues that they just left abeyant, it is no secret that the cost of living in Australia is spiralling out of control. While the inflation rate should sit between 2 and 3 per cent, it is currently at 5.1 per cent, and the Reserve Bank of Australia estimates that it will hit 7 per cent by Christmas. So, as the Prime Minister has said, this minimum wage increase is just the beginning of our Labor government's plan for financially securing all Australians in these uh, turbulent economic circumstances. There are so many issues contributing to inflation, but wage growth is not one of them. What our newly elected Albanese Labor government understands better than any Liberal government of the past nine years is that wages must rise in accordance with inflation for Australians to be able to afford the cost of living. The prices of groceries, fuel, rent and housing prices move a lot faster than the rate of real wage increases. And one of the biggest culprits of inflated cost of living is electricity. Labor is addressing the cost of living pressure, and under Labor's rewiring the nation plan, $20 billion will be invested in the partial rebuilding and modernisation of the electrical uh, grid. This investment will help to ease the cost of electricity bills, as well as helping to further future-proof the grid for the use of 
electric vehicles, boosting the economy by upwards of $40 billion and creating thousands of jobs in construction. This latest increase in the national minimum wage of $1.05 per hour proves that, as the Prime Minister said during the election campaign, Labor cares. Labor cares about workers. Labor cares about the cost of living. Labor cares about people. In just 10 weeks, Labor has cared enough to make meaningful changes to improve people's lives. Isn't that, after all, why we are gathered in this place? to improve the lives of all Australians. Unlike those opposite now in opposition, they had almost a decade to support Australian workers and to tackle the uh, in fact, decrease in wages of Australian workers. But they did nothing because they had no plan, they had no vision. And now you can tell from this very short week we've had in this place how they are trying to rewrite history, and I have no doubt the next contribution that will be made in this chamber by a senator from the opposition will continue to try and rewrite history. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. And I do reject the assertion just made by the senator opposite. Uh, I'm interested in the facts, and what I'm interested in is the fact that the new Labor Minister for Communications has already had a very poor start in standing up for Australians who need mobile connectivity, particularly in rural and regional Australia. And as I spoke about in the chamber earlier today, uh, the minister was forced to reverse the Albanese Labor government's opposition to round one of the Perry Urban Mobile Program, the pump program, to which the coalition government delivered $28.2 million for 66 new and upgraded mobile base stations in the outer suburbs of major cities across the country. So I say to Senator Polly, there's no rewriting of history. We're interested in delivering. And when it was clear that the minister and the Labor opposition, as it was then, failed to commit to this program, I was very, very proud to join the member for Casey, the hard-working, newly elected Liberal member, to talk about the importance of mobile connectivity in his electorate. Of course, there were two pump projects delivered in Sylvan and Menzies Creek. And less than 24 hours after we made that visit, surprise, surprise, the minister suddenly reverses the Labor's position and announces that Labor will deliver the 66 pump projects for the, around the country. Um, what a coincidence uh, that might have been. And I also commend in particular the Liberal member for Longman who wrote to the minister asking for an update on the pump projects in his electorate. And I do think it reflects very poorly on Labor that Labor did not recognise the importance of standing up for mobile connectivity and communities in peri-urban areas of Australia's major cities, which of course is so critical for growing jobs, for businesses, for families, as well as providing vital connectivity during bushfires and other emergency situations. So now we need to know the timeline. When will these pump projects be delivered? When will these upgrades be switched on? After the success of round one, the coalition committed a very significant $78.5 million to round two of pump to fix black spots and deliver vital communications upgrades to the peri-urban areas of regional cities, including Geelong, Wollongong, Gosford, Newcastle, Sunshine, Gold Coast, Townsville, Cairns, Darwin and Canberra. This investment is just as critical, but where is the minister? Where is the minister on this $78.5 million? Where is Labor? Not one word from the, minister, from the Labor members for Corangamite, Corio, Cunningham, Newcastle and the member for Solomon. Shame on Labor for not recognising that peri-urban areas in major regional cities deserve this investment also. I condemn the Labor and and I take the interjection, I'm being ridiculous. 
I'm being ridiculous for standing Senator, up Senator for standing Pratt. up for regional Senator cities Pratt. which have been which have been totally ignored. Senator and Pratt. Senator Pratt, I will take the interjection because when you were last in government, zero funding was delivered to mobile towers, not one dollar. So Labor has absolutely no credibility. And to make things worse. The new Minister for Communications, the member for Greenway, who of course has her electorate in Western Sydney, can't even stand up for the people of Western Sydney, axing a funding program for job-creating 5G technology projects. Labor's decision to discontinue the successful Australian 5G innovation initiative is an absolute kick in the guts for tech jobs and for our digital economy. And I join with my good friend Senator Payne, a warrior for Western Sydney, in condemning this decision, which is, as I say, a callous attack on jobs and the digital economy. I call on the Minister of Communications to reverse this decision, $20 million just stripped out by Labor's razor gang. She's shown no ticker in standing up to Labor's Razor Gang. This is a vital project, a vital program for tech jobs, for innovation and for small businesses. And I call on the minister to reverse this terrible decision and reinstate this program. Thank you, Senator Henderson. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, 1 August at 10 a.m. Thank you, Senators.